Southern Magic Christmas, Sweet Tea Witch Mysteries, Book 8. Written by Amy Boyles. Narrated by Hollis McCarthy. 1. My grandmother Betty cocked an eye skyward. What's wrong with that snowman? He looks like the hunchback of Magnolia Cove. I nearly burst out laughing. Betty had tagged that exactly right. For as short as my grandmother was, she had pegged the snow giant perfectly. A ten-foot-tall man stood squarely in the public park that was sandwiched between busy, bubbling Cauldron Road and a much slower, more residential, pointed hat lane. His snowy head was indeed melting, sloshing its way slowly backward, making the thing look more like a Halloween snowman than a Christmas one. My cousin Amelia huffed. I told y'all, it's not cold enough out here. I can build a snowman and throw ice up its rear end, but unless somebody fixes the clouds, or better yet, she glared at Betty, casts a spell to keep the snowman frozen, then there's nothing I can do. Betty was a squat woman with a twinkle in her eye and a corncob pipe in her hand. She was almost like a female Santa Claus. That was, if Santa Claus wore 70s-style leisure wear and snorted magic from his nose, then he'd be exactly like Betty, because I'm pretty sure my grandmother kept a very long list of everyone who'd ever been naughty to her. Not that I was going to ask and make sure. That was a guaranteed way to get pinned onto the bad list, no doubt about that. Amelia stared at Betty. Instead of complaining, are you going to do something? Betty shot a flame from her finger and lit her pipe. I'll freeze the snowman. Thank you. Betty placed one finger over a nostril and exhaled. Tendrils of magic swirled in the air, wrapping around the creation. A second later, the head was righted and the snow giant was ready to be dressed. He looks scary enough to frighten children, Betty muttered. Ah, yes, the magic of Christmas was in full swing in Magnolia Cove, Alabama. Amelia ignored her and handed me a scarf. She smiled brightly. You ready to decorate? Sure. Great. All you have to do is use your magic. She leaned over. We used to have ladders, but once our mothers set them on fire, I grimaced. Mint and Licky did that with magic? Amelia nodded. Yep. Worse, Betty was standing on it. I bit back a laugh. You think they did it on purpose? Hard to tell. She pointed at the snowman. The carrot in her hand zipped up to its face and rooted into the soft powder. Perfect. Amelia grinned widely. You think you can do it? Sure. I'd been practicing my power like crazy the past few days. I was totally ready to blast out some Christmas magic and make this year unforgettable. Let me clarify. I was ready to blast magic in a good way, not in the sort of way where I set someone's pants on fire. Oh, Lord, please don't let me set anyone's undies burning. That would be horrible. Amelia shot me a big, sweet smile. Go for it. You can do it. Work that magic, cuz. Okay. So in case I'd forgotten to tell you, my name's Pepper Dunn, and I'm a witch. I haven't always been a witch. Wait, I'll rephrase that. My powers didn't surface until a few months ago, when I was whisked away to a magical land called Magnolia Cove. You thought I was going to say Oz, didn't you? You were wrong. Anyway, I'd spent the past few months getting acquainted with a family I never knew I had, meeting new people and, of course, working my magic. Not that I was great at it, but I could hold my own against a monkey wielding a stick. I lifted the scarf and nodded. The long black fabric rose into the wind. It floated on an air current that took it higher and higher until finally it was horizontal with the snowman's neck joint. I twirled a finger and the scarf wrapped around the structure. Amelia slapped me a high five. Great job. Thanks. Hey. A shiver rolled down my spine. 
I turn to see Axel Rain, Magnolia Cove's private investigator and my boyfriend. He held two steaming cups. A chocolate for you. He handed one to Amelia. Thank you. What a great surprise. Doing all this Christmas stuff makes me want to drink beverages loaded with calories. Same goes for food. I giggled. Axel caught my gaze. His blue eyes sharpened on me before he laid a warm cardboard cup in my hands. White chocolate mocha for you. I slipped my gloved hands over his and took the cup. Even through the cotton, I could feel the sizzle coming off his skin. His gaze snagged mine and he smiled. My heart swelled and I grinned like an idiot. How do you know we needed drinks? I inhaled deeply. The rich aroma of chocolate and coffee wafted up my nose. It was nothing short of the pearly gates of heaven. His gaze darted to the snowman. I figured all this work was making you thirsty. And where's my drink? Betty bobbed up beside us. Axel blanched. Without missing a beat, I handed her my cup. This is yours. Her lower lip stiffened. Never mind. I don't like sweet things. I like my drinks like I like my men. Bitter and short, Amelia said. I barked a laugh. I swear a laser zipped from Betty's eyes. Very funny, kid. It's none of your business how I like my men. Then how will we know what drinks to make you? Amelia said. You know, in case you're incapacitated and lying in bed for some unknown reason, not because anyone ever exacted revenge on you. Listen, kid, it's taking all I've got to spread Christmas cheer. Is that what you call it? I couldn't resist. Betty whirled on me. Of course it's what I call it. Now, we're almost ready. Pepper, since this is your first Christmas in Magnolia Cove, what do you think? I took a step back. It was a scene out of a competitive Christmas light TV show. Snow covered the lawn and slowly drifted onto the buildings. All across Magnolia Cove, there were figurines made of snow. Men, of course. But there were also deer, rabbits, sleighs, birds, anything you could think of that reminded you of Christmas. Lights sprinkled the lampposts and buildings. They twinkled green and red. I mean, y'all, the lights practically spread their own Christmas cheer. The whole thing was awesome and magical. I loved it. Axel nudged me. Now you have to make a Christmas wish. I closed my eyes and tried to think of something to wish for. A hand squeezed my shoulder. That's not what I mean. I blinked. Oh, what are you talking about? He nodded toward the tallest snowman. My other cousin Cordelia was decorating him. She turned and shouted to Amelia. Where's the wishing hat? Amelia's cheeks flushed. Oh no, I almost forgot. She spun, glancing at the snow-covered ground. Where did I put it? Betty rolled her eyes and pulled an enlarged black top hat from a burlap sack. Here it is. Amelia rested a hand over her heart. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for finding it. I swear I would lose my head if it wasn't attached. Among other things, Betty muttered. Time to inject some Christmas cheer before folks started ripping each other's heads off. Figuratively, of course. What's the wishing hat? As Amelia delivered it to Cordelia, Axel leaned over. The wonderful scents of pine from his aftershave and coffee from his lips trickled up my nose. I wanted to bury my nose, heck, my whole face in his throat, and inhale. Would it be weird if I did that? In public, it would. He wrapped an arm around me. The hat about to top that snowman is the wishing hat. Every year, folks write a Christmas wish on paper and then magically deliver it inside. Some wishes come true, some don't. But the hat decides which Christmas wishes it grants. It does so on Christmas Day. I shot him a skeptical look. The amusement in his blue eyes made my heart flutter in my throat. Are you serious? So serious. My gaze darted to Betty. Is that true? She sucked on her pipe and blew a line of smoke from her mouth. Very true, kid. As true as it gets. 
Of course, you can't wish harm on someone else. That won't be granted. But most of the town scribbles a wish and plants it in the hat. Every year. Hmm. I'll have to think of something. A short dumpling of a woman wearing a fur coat charged toward us. I was tempted to stop her and say, A lady, what's wrong? Look at all this Christmas cheer. You can't possibly be upset when it's a winter wonderland in Alabama. I mean, the snow on the roads was slip-proof, so we didn't have to worry about people freaking out. If y'all don't know, folks in the South lose their minds if there's even a hint of snowfall. I'm not kidding. Within hours, all the bread, milk, and eggs are snatched up from the grocery store because people are obviously going to make loads and loads of French toast when they get snowed in. But seriously, folks can't drive in powder. No one knows how to handle it, so they stay cooped up in their homes and pretend it's the end of the world. Rifles in hand and generators chugging. That's how snow is greeted in Alabama. But not in Magnolia Cove. There'd never been a snow-related accident. At least, not according to Betty. Plus, gorgeous was a shallow word to describe the wintry scene. Snow glinted like it had been dusted with glitter. It was so magical, I wanted to throw myself atop it and roll from side to side. Don't tell anyone, but I might sneak out later tonight and do just that. But my daydreams about lollipops and snow diving were sliced in half when the plump woman stopped right in front of us. She threw her arms wide. Betty, just what do y'all think you're doing, putting that hideous creature right there? What creature? Amelia said. She pointed to the magic wishing snowman. That there creature. We stared at the snowman. No one said anything. Oh, y'all dense she screeched. That snowman is covering up the houses for the Christmas walk. This is not how it's done in Magnolia Cove. Y'all have placed the wishing snowman in front of everything. As if on cue, the four of us leaned right. Once you got past the mound of snow and situated across the street, on the pointed hat lane side, there was a two-story plantation-style building wrapped in lights. You could still see the other homes, but the snowman was gigantic. Betty, this is unacceptable. As head of the Magnolia Cove Housing Association, I demand you move it. Betty shook her head. Now listen here, Cookie. We can't just move it. We had to rearrange this year because the town Christmas tree is bigger than usual. Cookie's eyes narrowed. My house can't be blocked. I am a mobly. Betty thrust her boobs out. And I am a craple. I am head of the Christmas decorating committee. I do not need you bossing me around. Everyone can see your ugly old house from here. Cookie's face crimsoned. My home is on the Christmas tour, as it is every year. She took an intimidating step forward. I didn't see your home on the list, Betty. Betty pulled the corncob pipe from her mouth. We'll see about that. Cookie's eyes widened with horror. You can't get at it now. It's too late. My beautiful home can't be on the same tour as yours. Try me, Cookie. Cookie's hand flew to her throat where she was wearing a chunky necklace filled with rubies. Cordelia flipped her long hair over one shoulder. It wouldn't hurt to shift the snowman a little to the left. It's no big deal. Yes. Cookie stopped toward Cordelia. I need it moved. I need my house to shine. One snowman can't cast a shadow over the Christmas tour of houses. Amelia clicked her tongue. Correction. A wishing snowman? She clapped her hands. Maybe you should wish for the snowman to move. That's a great idea. Cookie stared at Amelia as if she wanted to cuss her out. No, ma'am, I am not going to do that. Y'all either move Giant Frosty, or I'll get in touch with the beautification board and have them move it for you. A car horn caught my attention, appeared around Axel. 
an RV the size of a school bus rumbled and jerked down bubbling cauldron. The horn blared rapidly while a woman stood in the front window, waving fiercely. Are we okay? Should we move? I was trapped between sprinting and staying cemented in place. My question was answered when the RV skidded onto two side wheels. It looked like it was going to fall over. Axel grabbed my arms and shoved me out of the way. I twisted and looked back in time to see my family scatter like cockroaches. I landed in a puddle of soft snow beside Axel. Betty, Amelia, and Cordelia were also sprawled atop the powder. Cookie waved her arms as if she couldn't figure out what to do. Betty pointed a finger, and the enraged homeowner flew into one of the snowmen. She pressed in so deep I could see the outline of her body perfectly in the snow. My attention whipped back to the RV. It skidded across the road, jumped the curb, and plunged straight into the wishing snowman. The head wobbled back and forth as if deciding which way it wanted to go. Cookie stepped out of the snowman, shaking powder from her hair and coat. Right at that moment, the snow head decided to plop to the left and down, plummeting right on top of Cookie. She screamed, which I figured meant she was okay. I'm going to kill someone. Yep, she was fine. The door to the RV opened and out stepped a woman wearing a long beaded necklace and a cape that looked sort of like a quilt. Hair streaked with gray was piled high on her head. She inhaled a cleansing breath, took one look at Axel and yelled, My baby wolf! Axel shot me an embarrassed smile. Pepper, meet my mom. Two. Cookie wailed from under the snowman's head. Will somebody get me out of here? The confusion that lit Axel's mom's face made my heart open. She looked genuinely worried for a woman I was considering nicknaming the Wicked Witch of Magnolia Cove. Before the rest of us could reach Cookie, Axel's mom raced over and started clawing through the snow. I see a hand. The driver's door opened, and a man in a plaid shirt, square glasses, and blue jeans emerged. He stretched and patted his chest. His gaze settled on Axel. Son, we've got a problem with the RV brakes. Your mom tried to fix them, but she couldn't get us stopped in time. But, boy, is it great to see you. Not now, Dad. We've got to save a woman encased in snow. Axel's dad blinked as if confused. How's that? I'll explain later. Stand back, he said to me. I gave him room. Axel spread his arms wide and then clapped them together. The giant head of snow lifted from the ground, revealing a sopping cookie mobbly. Axel waved a hand and the mound righted itself on the headless snowman. Cookie mobbly took one look at her drenched fur and screamed, What? Have you all done to me? Axel's mom reached for her. I'm so sorry. Cookie swatted her away. She pointed at the RV. Accusations filled her eyes. You, you brought that monstrosity into my town. You could have killed me. I, I didn't mean to. Axel's mother was clearly distraught. I mean, the woman had arrived for Christmas and been greeted by Scrooge Ed herself. Roger, get a blanket, she yelled at Axel's dad. Cookie warded them away with wet, flailing arms. No, I don't want a blanket. From the looks of the raccoon eyes her mascara had created, Cookie actually needed more than a blanket, y'all. She needed a full-on wardrobe change after a bath. Please, let me help. Axel's mom stepped forward. Cookie edged back. She slipped and landed on her spine. Ah! Oh, my God! I can't move. I've thrown out my back. Cookie Mobley raised her arms in a pose that reminded me more of a hallelujah choir than a woman in a life alert commercial screaming, Help, I've fallen and I can't get up. I had to stop myself from laughing. Axel strode forward. Let me help you. 
Cookie made the sign of the cross as if she was warding off a vampire. I know what you are. Stay away from me. Haven't y'all caused enough trouble? I'll have to see a witch chiropractor now, and there's only a few days before Christmas. First of all, Axel said coolly, I'm a werewolf, not a vampire. Secondly, I can cure your back. You'll probably make it worse. This was when Betty strode up looking all Betty Crapelish. Anyone who was anyone knew you didn't mess with my grandmother. She ran this town. Cookie, you know good and well that this entire thing was an accident. If you hadn't been making a fuss about the wishing snowman, none of this would have happened. Cookie lay on the ground like a slug. Axel's mother reached for her again. Cookie swatted her away. Stop trying to touch me. I'm going to sue you. You've ruined my coat. I can't move, and my Christmas is ruined. I need Alice. Where's my husband? I'll get your husband for you, all right, Betty said dryly. She thumbed her nose, and the next thing I knew, a man far on the other side of 40 stood in the middle of the street wearing nothing more than a towel around his waist, gripping a loofah sponge in his hand. Here he is. Betty's eyes sparkled with laughter. I pressed the back of my hand to my mouth to stop myself from cackling. Alice, Cookie screamed. She glared at Betty. How dare you bring him here? Betty shrugged. Make up your mind on what you want, Cookie. Do you want your husband to help you or not? Cookie flailed her arms. She looked like a beetle that couldn't ride itself. Alice, help me. I've been attacked by a giant redneck vehicle. It was a monster. I almost died. Ellis, for what it was worth, took the entire situation in stride. He reached for Cookie, grabbed her hand, and tried to lift her. But Cookie wasn't going anywhere. All she succeeded in doing was yanking Ellis onto the ground to top her. Ellis, get up. You're crushing me. Betty dusted her hands. Looks like this is under control. Axel crossed to his traumatized-looking mother and pried her from the scene of almost carnage. Mom, I want you to meet someone. She blinked, looking like she was trying to remember where she was. Axel gently steered her toward me. I'm not going to lie, y'all. Butterflies the size of zombies collided in my stomach. I was so nervous my teeth clacked. I mean, this was Axel's mom, his mother. Axel and I had endured our share of strife in our short relationship, but he was the only man I wanted to be with, and I was the only woman he wanted, so at least we were on the same page about that. But the fact that I was about to meet his parents made me feel one short stop away from vomiting on my feet. But I could get through it. Mom, this is Pepper. Pepper. This is my mom, Karen, and my father, Roger. Roger pumped my hand. Karen pulled me into a bear hug. It was the sort of hug you fall into, and then the person rocks you back and forth. Back and forth. Pepper, it is simply wonderful to finally get to meet you, Karen said into my hair. Axel has told us all about you. Now let me get a good look at you. She held me at arm's length and shot a secretive smile to Axel. Simply gorgeous. Axel put an arm around me and tugged me away. I like to think so. Karen let her back fall onto Roger's chest. She's so beautiful. What a handsome couple they make. Did you have a good trip? I said. Oh, yes, it was wonderful. Karen beamed. Just the best ever. Ran into snow north of here, but that's to be expected. She glanced around the town, her eyes filling with wonder. It's been years since we've been to Magnolia Cove. It's just as breathtaking now as it was then. I like it here, Axel said. Oh, Alice, don't grab me there. Hurry up. Let's get inside before my fur freezes. Alice slipped and stumbled as he dragged Cookie to their house. The angry woman managed to shoot Betty a nasty look. 
The Homeowners Association will hear about this, Betty Crapel. They will hear about it. I look forward to it, Betty shouted back. She crossed to Karen and introduced herself. For a moment, I was hoping you were going to run over Cookie Mobley. It would serve her right. All she does is complain and moan every chance she gets. Oh, no, Karen said. We feel so bad about what happened. I think I'll do something nice for her. Perhaps a pie? Betty shook her head. Don't bother with her. Any nice thing you do will come back to haunt you. Trust me, she's a nasty peach, that one. It's a wonder no one's killed her before now. Don't say things like that. I watched as Cookie and Alice slid across the snow. Seems like we've had more murders in Magnolia Cove lately than we know what to do with. Oh, really? Karen shot Roger a frightened look. Amelia swooped in. She smacked a pen against a clipboard and lifted a sheet of paper pinned to it. What Pepper means to say is, we've been playing Murder Mystery Night too much lately. She laughed awkwardly. It sounded like a bird had swooped into her throat and gotten stuck. All that murder mystery stuff seems a bit too real at times. Like when we get out the rubber knives and pretend we're going to knife each other in the back. Very realistic. As Amelia spoke, the color drained from Karen's face while her eyes widened until they covered most of her head. Okay. Cordelia swooped in to rescue the situation. She hooked her arm around Amelia's elbow. Wow, are you feeling tired? I think all the work today has damaged your brain. What? I feel fine. Cordelia tugged Amelia away. All right, well, that's great. Glad you're feeling well, but we're just going to go over here for a bit. Amelia tapped the clipboard. Don't forget, Pepper, we're all on tomorrow for the house tours. You, me, and Cordelia are giving the first one at 6 p.m. What? Cordelia and I said. Amelia shrank. Sorry, I forgot to tell y'all. Surprise! We're giving the Christmas house tours. With Axel's parents staring at me, I couldn't exactly throw a hissy fit, now could I? So I smiled and spoke through some minted teeth. That's great. I'm looking forward to it. I suppose we're doing Cookie's house? Yep, she's on the list. I turned back to Roger and Karen. Karen linked her arm in mine and smiled. Pepper, I'm just so happy to get to know you. Axel has talked so much about you. She shook out her bun. Long hair cascaded down her back. Now, I've got couples massages planned for us at the witch spa. It's the perfect way to warm up, don't you think? I grinned at Roger. That sounds like fun. You'll enjoy that after your long trip. Karen swatted her husband playfully. Pepper, the massages aren't for Roger and me. They're for the two of us so we can get to know one another. I swear, y'all, I know the look of absolute fright couldn't have been hidden from my face. Couples massages with my boyfriend's mother? Did Karen know how those massages worked? It was for couples, not friends. I glanced at Axel. He gave me a sheepish grin. I could see I wasn't going to get any help from him. They're in 15 minutes, Karen prodded. But, you know, whatever. I was going to roll with it. That sounds great. Do you need anything or do you want to head over to the spa? She flipped her long, wavy hair over one shoulder. I don't need anything but you. Don't bring your purse. This is on me. Karen linked her arm in mine and tugged me toward the row of shops lining Bubbly Cauldron. Come on, Pepper. This is going to be so much fun. Y'all, I didn't want to argue. It might not be fun, but it was definitely going to be something. Three. So, Axel really cares about you, Pepper. I just think it's wonderful. I was face deep in a headrest. The masseuse's fingers were working a particularly stubborn knot in my shoulder. The whole place smelled of lavender and goodness. Could you bottle that, goodness? Well, if you could, these witches had done it. 
the room was dark, quiet, and Karen wanted to discuss my relationship with her son while I was having the best massage of my life. Oh, um, was all I managed. I know he flaked out on you a little while ago. She knew about that? Truth was, Axel had come half an inch from ending my life. Not on purpose. Not on purpose, so that we're clear. He didn't wake up an axe murderer or anything. He simply went full-on werewolf. It wasn't his fault. The whole werewolf thing is his nature. He couldn't help it. Anyway, so, yes, Axel almost killed me. Right after that, he freaked out and left town. He didn't call me for weeks, but I held out hope he would return. He did. His hair was a little longer, his body was a little leaner, and he'd sold both his vehicles and purchased an old Land Rover. But other than that, he was the same Axel. We hadn't talked about where he'd gone during that time. He came to us. Karen filled in that blank like an expert. Among other places, she added cryptically. I raised my head. He saw you. Relax, the masseuse said. I wanted to tell her she could go relax, but I dropped my head into the rest. He searched us out, told Roger and I what happened. You know, sometimes you just need your mother and father. Too bad I didn't have either one. But I had Betty and my cousins. I was loving my new family. Axel explained he'd almost hurt you. You could say that. I exhaled as the masseuse trailed her hands down both sides of my spine. The werewolf side of Axel haunts him. It haunts his father, too. But we've always managed it. Wherever we are when the full moon hits, he gets chained, and then I work a sleeping spell on him. Usually it settles Roger enough that he remains calm most of the night. He doesn't necessarily sleep, but he's not as difficult to deal with. A sleeping spell? Yes, I mix herbs and sing a song, and it helps sedate him. I wondered if the song would work on Axel. Have you tried it on your son? Axel always said he didn't want to be put under like that. What if he was needed as a werewolf? But he can't be controlled. I've tried several times to reach him and talk to him when he's the wolf. It always starts out fine, but then dies a slow, painful death. Surprise filled Karen's voice. You've talked to him when he's the wolf? Time to roll over, the masseuse said. I shifted myself as she raised the blanket for me. I met Karen's gaze. Her hair was in a sexy tangle. I wondered if mine looked the same. You can talk to Axel, she said again. The way she was prodding made me uncomfortable. Now I wasn't so sure I should tell her. Um, yes. Well, I have before. It never lasts long. But if you can reach him once... Maybe you can hold it again. I'm able to reach Roger. We stay connected all night. Well, that was cool, and I was incredibly jealous. So, the calming helps connect the two of you? Hmm. That and other things. The way she said other things made me think it wasn't the time to ask what those other things were. Axel doesn't want me to try to reach him. It never works, so he doesn't see the point. Maybe one day it will work out. I doubted it, but there was no point focusing on something I couldn't do anything about at the moment anyway. I sighed as the masseuse dug her knuckles into the ball of my foot. Letting Karen treat me to a massage was the best idea ever. I'd never had one before, but I thought I might want to have one every day for the rest of my life. Not kidding. We finished up and I headed back to the house while Karen started toward the RV, which was still parked by Bubbling Cauldron. In fact, it was sort of stationed right in front of the snowmen and hadn't moved. I had a feeling this was going to be a problem. If Cookie Mobley realized the motorhome hadn't moved, she'd have a fit. Karen just smiled and waved as she headed inside. What's this? I veered toward her to get a better look. 
A large red envelope had been tacked to the side of the vehicle. Even though my heart sank, I plastered on a huge grin. Maybe it's a welcome note, but I doubted it. Karen ripped the envelope. What? It was a ticket, in fact. The signage couldn't be misunderstood. This vehicle breaks code number 110 of Magnolia Cove. No large vehicles are allowed to park on the grass by Bubbling Cauldron Road. You will be subject to having the vehicle impounded. Signed, the Magnolia Cove Housing Association. Karen's face crimsoned. Roger? Axel's father stumbled from the RV. Yes, my love? She thrust the paper toward him. Did you see who left this? He fixed his glasses in a rather studious manner and climbed down the steps. What are you talking about? This. No, I didn't see who left it. Karen's eyes narrowed. I have an idea who it was. I knew exactly who had done it, but I was staying out of the whole knot. Axel stepped out from the RV. He and his dad must have been visiting. It was Christmas, after all. He raked his fingers through his hair. What's going on? Before anyone could answer, a tow truck rumbled down the road. The thing was as large as a semi-truck. It was painted black and reminded me more of a monster truck than one that towed. Gold letters painted on the side read, Witchaway Towing, Inc. The driver hopped out of the truck. Got a call about an RV parked illegally? Okay, looked like I would have to step in. Karen and Roger had just arrived in Magnolia Cove. They didn't need their first impression of my town to be tainted by one Cookie Mobley and her anger parade. Someone needed to cram some Christmas spirit up a certain orifice in Cookie's body, if I did say so myself. I placed myself between the truck and the RV. I know you've been called, but we don't need your services. This RV is parked just fine. Mr. Truck Driver, whose name tag read Bubba, tapped a clipboard. Says here, I've got to tow it. I can't ignore orders. That's what I'm paid to do. I flared my arms. You'll be towing this RV over my dead body. Then he'll be doing it over your dead body. Freak. King Cookie Mobley strode across the beautiful Christmas scene filled with snowman and reindeer. She wore a neck brace and was followed by a beagle who yipped at everyone's legs. Yip, 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 yip. The beagle ran up to Roger. Yip, yip. It jumped into Karen's personal space. Yip, yip. It hiked its leg like it might relieve itself on Axel. Yip, yip. Then it beelined toward me. I've never kicked a dog, but this might be my first. Yip! I snapped my fingers. Dog, you yip at me one more time and you'll regret it. The beagle tucked tail and ran to Cookie. She scooped the creature into her arms and dug her nose into its white fur. Anger flamed in her eyes. How dare you threaten Arsenal? Is that the dog's name, Arsenal? I shot a look to Axel. He covered his mouth with his hand. Cookie lifted her nose. Of course that's his name. Killer was too pedestrian, so we named him Arsenal. The truck driver tapped the clipboard. As warm and fuzzy as all this Christmas cheer is, I've got a job to do. i got to get this here RV towed. Now, are y'all going to stand back and allow me to do that? I marched to Cookie. Call it off. She sniffed. I will not. That vehicle almost killed me. It's a menace to Magnolia Cove. It must be towed away. Besides, it ruins the Christmas view. I gritted my teeth. Call it off. Her eyes narrowed to slitty wedges of death. I will not. Axel sidled up. He put on his most handsome grin. Cookie. I know you didn't get off on the right foot with my folks, but all of this is a misunderstanding. Whatever damages we owe you, we'll pay. They'll move the RV to my place. She scoffed and pulled Arsenal closer to her chest. If they were going to move it, why haven't they done so already? 
He placed a hand over his heart. It's my fault. The smile on his face was delicious. The man oozed charm. I was in there talking to my dad, and time got the best of us. Please, just let us move the RV, and we'll make this situation right however we can. I'm not going to lie. If a man as hot as Axel had promised to write a situation, I'm pretty sure no pure thoughts would have entered my mind. Unfortunately, I had a feeling that Cookie's mind lived on the same warp track mine did. I really didn't want to get into a fistfight with her over Axel. Let's hope it didn't come to that. Cookie's gaze floated up and down Axel before finally settling on his... eyes. Yes, it took some time, but they eventually landed there. Well, Cookie sniffed as if she were royalty. I suppose it will be fine. The RV doesn't have to be towed. Relief flooded me. Great. What in the cotton-picking blazes is going on here? Oh, no. I whipped around to see Betty marching down the sidewalk in full Betty Crapel mode. She wore a puffy jacket and pants and looked more like she was about to skydive than amble about town. Betty eyed the tow truck and locked the pieces together. Cookie Mobley, you and your messes. You are the worst person in this entire town. Once we got rid of Melbourne Mays, I wasn't sure who would take her place as the biggest witch in Magnolia Cove. But this beats all. Running around and causing evil at Christmas. What is wrong with you? These nice people are here to visit their son, and all you want to do is moan and groan about everything. I rushed up to Betty. No, it's not what you think. I grabbed her elbow. She shook me off like I was a cobweb. Not now, Pepper. This woman needs to hear it, and she needs to hear it from me. For years we've put up with her snobbiness, but no more. You can't always get what you want, Cookie Mobley, not without having to give in return. Cookie's lower lip trembled. The deal was off. Every inch, every line of her face proved it. She pointed at the RV and then at the driver. Take it away. Get that thing out of here. The driver snapped his fingers and cables and pulleys unwound from his truck and snaked around the RV. Bubba hopped in the truck, fired the engine, and the RV groaned and jerked as it lumbered up the truck bed. Cookie Mobley, one day you'll get what's coming to you, Betty yelled. You are piss and vinegar in a town full of sunshine and cinnamon. Cookie crossed to Betty. Is that a threat, Betty Crapel? Because if it is, I'll be happy to tell Sheriff Young what you just said. She waved a hand. I've got witnesses. As the tow truck pulled the RV down the road, Betty glared at Cookie. It's not a threat. It's a promise. Cookie whirled around. The only sound as she walked off was Arsenal yipping away. Four. It took a couple of hours, but Karen and Roger retrieved the RV from the witch towing company. Karen, who seemed like a genuine hippie spirit, was livid. It was one thing to make a hot-headed person mad, quite another to see a calm person lose their cool. It wasn't pretty. I'm going to spell her so that she speaks backward, Karen announced at dinner. Amelia, of course, had to say, Is that possible? Karen assured her it was, while I mumbled that Amelia might not want to find out. Anyway, Karen and Roger left Betty's house after dinner and drove back to Axel's. Axel, meanwhile, stayed around to talk to me. Ever since he'd returned to Magnolia Cove almost four weeks ago, he'd been super busy. His phone had been ringing off the hook for him to investigate out-of-town cases. We'd been trying to get together but just hadn't managed to until now. In order to escape both our families, we took a walk through town. Christmas carols floated in the air. Not folks caroling. It sounded more like your local light radio station drifting through the streets. 
Apparently the town rigged it so that Christmas music could be heard whenever you were outside. I didn't notice the music this morning. Axel threaded his warm fingers through mine. That's because our families were too busy trying to kill Cookie Mobley. Kind of killed the Christmas cheer, wouldn't you say? No. What's a little threatening between townsfolk at Christmas? I joked. In Magnolia Cove? Sounds like you'd be cruising for a bruising. I stopped. Whoa, did you just say cruising for a bruising? Am I carbon dating myself? <laughs> Definitely. We laughed comfortably. After a few moments, silence blanketed the space between us. I missed you so much, Pepper. I never should have left. We haven't talked about it. Not really. We stopped in front of the wishing snowman. Ah, yes. The dreaded conversation. How am I going to make sure I keep you safe from me? How do I do that when I can't even keep myself safe from myself? I wasn't asking so that you'd turn bitter. He shook his head. I'm not. I'm only stating facts. Fact one, I turn into a werewolf. Fact two, I kill people whenever possible. Fact three, I almost killed you. I stared at the snowman. It was the easiest face to look at. So many facts. But. Axel pivoted to me. I have a plan. I'm building something that is so strong, I can't break through it. Once I'm in for the night, I'm in for good. He took both my hands. When his blue eyes met mine, my breath hitched. The absolute intensity in his gaze stole every ounce of oxygen I owned. Every bit of me was put on hold while I stared at Axel. The energy around us was thick, heady. I could drown in it, or maybe just swim in it. I could smell him, sense him, feel every inch of him as if Axel were made purely of energy. He dipped his head and grazed his lips over my cheek. A pulse flashed in my core. I don't ever want to hurt you. Mm hmm? Words slipped away as his lips traced my jaw. When I build this structure, I can't get leave until the next day. What if you need to? Oh, look, I had words. They were just hiding. When has it ever happened that I needed to be free? When Rufus attacked me. I shot your chain and you ran after him. You saved me then. Oh, that feels good. His mouth grazed my throat. That was one time. Pepper, I'm trying to keep you safe. If I don't do this... His demeanor shifted. It threw me from enjoying his lips as they danced over my skin. I reared back. If you don't do this, what? He shifted his focus to the snowman. Does that one look particularly happy to you? Axel, I groaned. Don't change the subject. What will happen? He punched his hands in his coat pockets. If I don't do this, the town will ask me to leave. Garrick will ask me to leave. What? He told me that after the last time, when I got out, there were complaints. Impossible. You didn't harm anyone. He dipped his head in an exaggerated nod. Nevertheless, there were those in the community who were worried for their lives. And rightly so, Pepper. I mean, if you didn't care about me the way you do, and you knew I was out there running wild, wouldn't you want me gone? Never. Not in a hundred million years. He shot me a pointed look. You're only saying that because you know me. No, I'm saying that because I love you. I grimaced. Crap. I hate saying that first. He wrapped his arms around me. I would have said it eventually. I mean, in this conversation. Just because you said it first doesn't make it any less so. I tipped my head back. His blue eyes snagged on mine. I love you, Pepper Dunn. Thank you. He laughed. Oh, so, because you said it first, you won't say it again, is that it? Yes, I said. No, I'm kidding. Listen, we were talking about something important. Who told Garrick that if you were allowed to get out and wreak havoc, they'd cause trouble? 
does it matter? To me, it does. It's in the past. Axel grazed his lips over my jaw. No, it isn't. I shimmied from his grasp. It's here and now. We've got to make sure you stay locked up good and tight, or else you'll be on your rear end, kicked out of town, running around homeless. Just the thought makes me sad. What I'm considering will work. I'll be bricked, locked, during the night. The house, along with the chains, should hold me. What if it doesn't? What if something happens to it? He shook his head. I spoke to your mother today. He groaned. I elbowed his ribs. You're the one who invited them for Christmas. His gaze speared my heart to my spine. Because they wanted to meet you. We've got to meet Pepper. You've told us so much about her. I swear my mom's voice rose five octaves just fantasizing about it. How was the couple's massage, by the way? I stared at him. A slow, creeping sensation rippled up my chest to my neck. You! You gave her the idea! Oh my gosh! And this whole time I thought it was your mom's kooky plan to do a couple's massage. I lightly punched his arm. Oh, for that, mister, you are going to have to suffer through something. What's that? Your mom thinks we can link our minds when you're a werewolf. No. His face immediately darkened. Pleading was worth a shot, right? Axel. No, listen to me. Every time we've tried, it doesn't work. The last time you did it, you almost died. His jaw clenched. He looked away. Were tears misting in his big bad werewolf eyes? But, Axel, don't you think it's worth a shot? Pepper, he said hoarsely. I would go to the moon for you. I would wrestle the devil himself, but I will not subject you to the inner beast that lives in me. I won't do it. You can connect with animals, communicate with them. You can reach me, but you can't hold me. There's too much inside, too much turmoil. Beasts aren't meant to be caged. I touched his cheek. He hadn't shaved that morning. Stubble pricked my fingertips. It was like the inside of Axel. He was hard-edged, like a prickly pear. But the warmth that seeped from him reached all the way to my heart, heating me from the inside. You aren't meant to be caged, I agree. But you also aren't a beast at heart. He shook his head. You're not, Axel. I don't care what you think. I poked his ribcage over his heart. The beast doesn't control you. I closed my eyes in frustration. Why is it we have the same conversation? Over and over, this is what we argue about. You are more than the beast. I am, but it controls my life. Before I go anywhere, I have to know what moon is setting that night. It controls where I go and when. That's my life. It won't change, Pepper. It will never change. Those are facts. I sighed and sank my head to his chest. He wrapped his powerful arms around me and hugged me tight. We will get through this. He stroked my hair. My parents did. I perked up. Of course they did. How do they manage? He shrugged. Easy. My mother magically restrains my father every full moon. Those two have it down to a science. I nudged him. So, they've got all the answers, huh? Every single one. You want to know why cats meow instead of bark? They can tell you. I laughed. It felt good to be in his arms. Right. More than right. Perfect. That's how I felt in this moment. Like we were the only two people in the world, and I was forever grateful to the heavens that allowed Axel and me to collide. Maybe I did need to talk to his mother about this. She could help. At least give me pearls about how to deal with the beast, what it was like living with his father and dealing with it. Perhaps I should have used our couple's massage time together more wisely. Oh, well, I had all week. They weren't leaving until after Christmas. There was still time.
Axel peeled me off him and pivoted me toward the trio of snowmen. So, have you decided what you're going to wish for? I shot him a teasing smile. Are you going to wish for something? Of course, I do it every year. That, Axel Rain, surprises me. Why? I pressed my shoulder into him. I don't know. Maybe because you're such a powerful wizard, I figure you can have just about whatever you want. You don't need a wishing snowman for that. He barked a laugh. I might be a powerful wizard, but there are still plenty of things to wish for. I hitched a brow. He was teasing me, I was sure. Like what? Oh, I don't know. A perfect can of beanie weenies? Maybe a handful of Vienna sausages when I'm hungry and on a stakeout? You are so full of crap. He may have chuckled lightly, but the flare of intensity in his eyes said he was anything but joking. Maybe I'm kidding about that, but I'm completely serious when it comes to us. There is no one else I want to be with. His tone caught me by surprise. Me either, I whispered. He was looking at me and it was all intense and my palms were sweating and my heart was racing and my head was feeling light and I needed to look away. So I did. I pointed to the snowman. I'm going to make a wish. He dragged his gaze from me to the hat atop the statue's head. Let's get you some paper and a pen. He clapped his hands, and a notepad and feathered pen appeared. What did I ever do before magic entered my life? He handed them to me. A question not worth asking. I tapped the end of the pen to my mouth and pretended to think about my wish, but I'd had it in my head all along. I jotted it down and folded the paper. I aimed it for the hat and threw. Axel blew softly his breath expelling in a tangle of magical wisps. They acted like air currents and sailed the slip up and into the top of the hat. I clapped. When will I know if it's been granted? On Christmas, you'll find out. How? The snowman reveals it. He shrugged. None of my wishes have ever been granted. I scoffed. Time to put an end to that. I pressed the pad into his palms. Make a wish. As Axel bent down to kiss me, he whispered, Mine's already come true. I was kidding. I had no intention of making a wish. We left the snowman a few minutes later. Axel held my hand tightly, and I knew in my heart he would never let go. Five. The next day began the Christmas home showing. We try not to call it Christmas. You know, some folks get offended. Amelia sucked a spoonful of honey. It was breakfast, and she drizzled about half a bear of honey on a brisket. Even though there are Christmas trees everywhere? That seemed strange. Christmas music is playing outside. I know, she rolled her eyes. We just try to be PC. I sipped my coffee. Then what do we call it? Holiday home tours? You are so good, Cordelia said. You should win an award for most intuitive. It came out with a glint of humor, but my cousin was no virgin to sarcasm, so I could have easily misunderstood what she meant. Do you think I could win an award for being intuitive, too? Amelia fluffed the ends of her hair. Are you growing out the pixie cut? I said. Amelia shrugged. Maybe. Men like women with long hair, Betty chirped. She stirred a pot at the hearth. What's that? Smells like peppermint. Cordelia grabbed my hand. Don't ask. I'm so glad my newest granddaughter has taken an interest in what I do. Amelia groaned. I glanced at my cousin's faces. They were a mix of horror and regret. Sort of the expression I'd seen on lots of folks after a hard night drinking. It's our Christmas candy, Cordelia said. I love all things Christmas, so I love candy, I said. For goodness sake. I didn't even know I had this family until a few months ago. If Betty made Christmas candy, I wanted to be the person to help her. I was making memories here, 
memories that would last a lifetime. Yeah, well, that candy will last you a lifetime, too, Cordelia said. Did I think that out loud? Amelia sucked her spoon balled and patted my shoulder. You did. It's okay. We're all a little crazy around here. I shot her a dark look and rose. I was not going to let a little prejudice keep me from experiencing Christmas the Magnolia Cove way. After all, I'd even made a wish in the snowman's hat. I want to help. Betty lifted the spoon. A syrupy strip, thick as my forearm, broke off and slopped back into the pot. It'll be ready tonight or tomorrow. Hard to say. It's done when it's done. Then we can start decorating. Okay. With the candy? So strange. I tip my head like a dog trying to figure out what his master is saying. She decorates the house in the stuff. Cordelia kicked out her chair. By the time she's finished, the candy will look like peppermint canes. She uses it for garland. Candy? We tried to warn you. Amelia headed for the door. She decorates the whole place in candy and it gets stuck in your hair. Cordelia patted my arm. But now we get to suffer through it again, this time with a new victim. Ha ha, very funny. I hesitated. I didn't want to tick Betty off, but I did want to know the truth about the candy situation. It won't get in my hair, will it? It'll probably go down your bra, too. Betty stirred the concoction. Cordelia leaned in. The best thing to do is destroy it. I heard that, Betty snapped. No one is destroying my candy. It's a crapal tradition. She tapped the spoon and hung it above the hearth. Now y'all go on. Have a great day. Have fun at the house tours. Amelia smiled. Don't forget, we've got to be on our best behavior. Cookie Mobley's house is on the roster. I groaned. How could I forget? Great. The woman who wished death on Axel's family is going to open her house and spread good cheer. I can't wait. Cordelia grinned widely. Maybe she'll be sick in bed and we won't have to see her. Amelia opened the door. A burst of cold air flew into the cottage. Fingers crossed. We can only hope, I mumbled. Turned out, neither hoping nor crossing fingers did anything to dampen Cookie Mopley. At least not when it came to showing off her Magnolia Cove mansion at Christmas. I mean, the holidays. My cousins and I had steered a cluster of townsfolk down Witching Way and Eye of Newt Avenue, before landing on Pointed Hat Lane, the street in front of the Mobleys, who, from what I gathered, considered themselves the Mayflowers of Magnolia Cove, meaning their family had been among the first to establish the town. All the other houses we'd visited had been beautiful, Real garland, lots of fresh mistletoe, even live magnolia blossoms as bows above doorways. The interiors were filled with Christmas trees and every theme imaginable. Christmas witches to Halloween Christmas, don't ask, it's pretty weird, to traditional Christmas to witch country Christmas. Again, its own original sort of theme with lots of gingham and flannel. But mostly, the whole touring thing had been fun, then we arrived at the Mobleys. I could hear Arsenal yipping from behind the front door. Suddenly, it swept open. Cookie Mobley popped into view. She was dressed like Santa's little helper from 30 years ago, in a red mini dress with white fur trim, black boots, and dark stockings. Where's her neck brace? Amelia whispered. Cordelia sniggered. She must have left it with an elf. I said. Cordelia and Amelia burst into laughter. Cookie's gaze narrowed on us. For the briefest of seconds, I figured Cookie was trying to decide if she could get away with murder in front of a crowd. Ellis charged outside wearing a Santa outfit. Where he'd been skinny the day before, now he'd been spelled to look jovial. He even sounded jovial. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Come in and see what Mrs. Claus and I have in store for you. Were we in kindergarten? Yes, come in. 
Cookie said. The crowd trickled past her, leaving me and my cousins last. We moved to go inside. Cookie clamped a hand on my jacket. Not so fast there. Just what do the three of y'all think you're doing here? Giving the tours, Amelia said. We're on the committee. She pointed to our name tags. See, it says so. Cookie's gaze narrowed. I don't believe you. I think you're here to sabotage my house tour. Arsenal yipped at Cookie's feet. Now, I can hear animals in my head. I can communicate with them when I want to. I'll be honest. The last thing I wanted to do was talk to Cookie's yippy dog. Cookie wasn't finished slugging accusations. Y'all have shown up to ruin this for me. I know you have. Ever since I had that monstrous RV towed, the three of you have been plotting how you'll destroy me. Oh, don't think I don't know. That you're delusional? I mean, who thinks that folks sit and obsess about them? Cookie Mobley, obviously. Mrs. Mobley, I can assure you that we're only here to do our job, see the house, and that's it. I smiled kindly. Cookie snarled. Mrs. Claus, I need you in here. Cookie's head whipped in the direction of Ellis's voice. I'll be inside in a second. She gave the three of us a once-over. Fine, come on in. But don't touch anything. And if one of you makes even a tiny peep, I'm throwing the three of you out. Sounds like a promise, Amelia said. I started to laugh. Cordelia elbowed me. My laugh became a cough. We'll be on our best behavior. We scooted inside, and Cookie strode off in those high-heeled boots. Arsenal followed. Talk about paranoid, Cordelia said. My gaze drifted around the room. Yeah, if you're going to think everyone is out to get you, maybe you shouldn't do things to tick them off. That's right, Amelia's eyes flared. Wow, this place is amazing. It was. A chandelier glowed in the foyer, while a twenty-foot tree sat in one corner. Bulbs blinked and garland shimmered. Each window had been trimmed with red bows and finished with an emerald-colored wreath. I whistled. Cookie sure does know how to decorate. Too bad she's horrible. Alice clapped his hands. Now, everyone, if you look around, you'll see little wreaths marking the hallways. You've got five minutes, and you're welcome to explore the parts of the house that are indicated, but only those with the wreaths. Santa has left lots of little surprises for you, so have fun. Remember to return when we call. The crowd dispersed. I guess we're not allowed to go. Amelia's bottom lip pouted out. Do you really want to find something Cookie left for you? Cordelia said. You'd probably walk right into a lawsuit. I laughed. That sounds about right. Folks milled about. After a couple of minutes, I decided to heck with it. I didn't see Cookie or Arsenal around. If the old bat wanted to sue me for nosing around her house when everyone else had been invited to do so, well, she could. I pushed off the wall. I'm exploring. I'll be back in a sec. You're braver than I am, Amelia said. Or stupider. I winked at Cordelia. Beat you to it. There's hope for you yet, my cousin said, laughing. I ambled down the first path I saw, figuring I'd only go a few steps in and come back. After all, I might have talked a big talk, but I didn't want Cookie Mobley as an enemy. There was no telling what that woman was capable of. I mean, to tow an RV at Christmas? It took a certain kind of person to do that. The bad kind. The hallway led to the kitchen. Lying on a desk sat a plate of cookies. Mmm. I picked it up and started munching. It was surprisingly good. I prayed it wasn't poisoned. Something crashed nearby. Hello? A light glowed in what looked like a pantry. I peered around the sliding door and gasped. Lying on the floor was Cookie Mobley's lifeless body. Blood pooled beneath her. I... 
I just got here. My gaze flickered right. Standing beside Cookie was Karen, Axel's mother. She was holding a knife. I sucked air and slowly backed away. I can't explain, Karen said. I came upon her. I picked up the knife. The look of absolute panic on her face made my heart lurch. Save it for the cops. I turned to find Ellis standing behind us. He held a cell phone. I'm calling them right now. Six. Garrick Young arrived and took Karen's statement. This looked bad, y'all. So bad. She was holding the knife. I gripped Axel's arms. Your mother was holding it and standing over Cookie's body. Axel's face darkened. I need to see her. I pointed toward the house. Your mom's inside. Axel stormed toward the house while my cousins and I stood outside in the chilly air. This is horrible, Amelia said. I can't believe it. Cordelia rubbed her hands together. I inhaled sharply. Cold air assaulted my nostrils. Is it just me or has it gotten chillier? It's gotten colder, Amelia said. She glanced at the sky. Must be a front moving in. I tucked my chin in my scarf. What I wouldn't give her a cup of hot chocolate filled with jelly beans. That sounded delightful. Yip, yip. I glanced down at Arsenal. Yip, yip. Can't you talk, dog? I said. Yip. Can he? Amelia opened her palm for him to sniff. I stopped and waited, listening to the silence that was the beagle's mind. Hello. I didn't know why I was talking to the dog. For all I knew, he was the mobbly secret spy and would tell Ellis things we'd done. Cookie. I hadn't liked her, but she hadn't deserved to be murdered in her own house right before Christmas. No one deserved that. Arsenal tilted his head. One floppy ear perked, but the dog said nothing. I don't think he talks, or if he does, not to me. Amelia scratched his back. Poor little guy. Maybe I should see if Ellis misses him. Good idea. Amelia strode back to the house. Axel walked toward us with Karen's elbow pinched in his hand. He scowled while Karen looked simply shocked to the point the blood had drained from her face. I nodded to Cordelia. Here they come. I rushed over. Are you okay? Karen shook her head numbly. Garrick's letting her go, for now. Spite filled Axel's voice. He's questioning everyone in the house. It'll take a while. He draped a hand over his mother's shoulder. Come on, let's get you home. I'll come with you, I said. Cordelia tipped her head toward the house. I'll wait for Amelia. See you back here. I gave her a quick hug. Let's face it, our first foray into giving the holiday house tours had turned deadly. Put a pretty nasty taste in my mouth for giving any more. Axel reached for me and a flood of comfort washed over my skin as I slid my hand over his. We headed into his truck. Within minutes, we were at his house. The RV was parked in the driveway. All the lights were on and I could see Roger's shadow as he paced. Go inside, Axel said. I'll get Dad. I held Karen as we climbed the steps. Axel headed into the RV. Roger has a beast of a temper, Karen murmured. If he'd gone to the house tonight, he would have ripped the place apart in his human form. He must be some werewolf. Karen locked her eyes with mine in a gaze that sent a bolt of ice straight to my heart. You have no idea. We stepped inside and Karen peeled off her coat. I did the same with my jacket and pegged both of them by the door. Is it cold in here? Karen said. I found the thermostat and cranked it up a couple ticks. That should help. We stood in the uncomfortable silence. I'll make coffee. Good. Now I had something to do. While I ferreted for the grounds and filter, the door opened. Roger rushed inside and swept Karen into his arms. The amount of love in that gesture made my heart balloon. My gaze slashed to Axel, who met mine. Heat flooded my face. 
It was like his expression said, I feel that way about you too. And the emotion filled me to bursting. But to distract myself, I dropped the filter in the holder, spooned grounds on top, and filled the carafe with water. Karen, what happened? They sat on the couch. Axel drifted to my side. Thank you. I thought coffee was appropriate. Not that, for being here. Our eyes locked. Grief hid behind the lines of worry. He was reliving something. His brother's run-ins with the law? Some other family crisis? I didn't know. It didn't matter. I snaked my arm around Axel's waist and leaned into him far enough to smell the musky pine of his cologne. Karen's hands trembled. I went inside to leave Cookie some fudge. I didn't want to make a big deal about it. I knew the tours were going on. I timed it wrong. I thought theirs would be over by the time I arrived, but it wasn't. So I decided to sneak in and leave the fudge with a note. Cookie could call me later and discuss it. I wanted to apologize, to put all the nastiness behind us. Her face crumpled. Roger handed her a tissue. Karen dabbed her eyes, gulped down a few inhales, and gave him a shaky smile. It's Christmas, you know? We shouldn't hold grudges or be angry with people. Life is too short. So I thought... I'll make her some fudge as a peace offering. That's what I was doing. I, I was delivering it. She took a staggered breath. I dropped the fudge on the counter and heard something. Karen wiggled her fingers in front of her throat. It sounded like someone was drowning or gargling. That's when I noticed the pantry light. I peeked inside and there... There she was, on the floor... Karen looked like she wanted to fall to the floor and weep. Roger laced his arms around her shoulders. She took a moment and nodded at him as if to say she was fine. I was so shocked to see her that I didn't know what I was doing. There was the blood and the knife. I just picked it up. Her gaze lit on my face. That's when you found me. Tears welled in her eyes. It looks so bad. Like I did it. Then Ellis walked in and he called the police as if I was already guilty. I didn't do it. I didn't touch her. Karen dropped her face into her hands and cried. Roger hugged her tight. Tears pricked my own eyes. I couldn't watch someone cry without crying myself. It was this weird thing with me. I looked away and pushed any and all thoughts of weeping aside. Axel squeezed my shoulder. It'll be all right. Those were the same words Roger murmured to Karen. I promise, you didn't do this, my love. They'll discover who the guilty party is. Roger shot a pointed look to Axel, one that I took to mean that Axel would be doing everything he could to discover the real killer. Out of the corner of my vision, Axel nodded. He would do anything he could, obviously. This was his mother we were talking about. Roger rocked Karen back and forth. He whispered words I couldn't hear. After a minute, Axel crossed to them. He placed a hand on a crown. Rest now. Get some rest. Karen blinked and yawned. She wiggled from Roger's grasp. I'm so tired. Roger helped her stand. She leaned against him as he wrapped his arms around Karen's shoulders. I'll help you to bed. Karen locked gazes with me. She reached out. I crossed and took her hands. I didn't do it. I smiled gently. I know you didn't. I know you didn't hurt her. Axel's jaw tensed. We'll find out who did, Mom. She nodded absently and then let Roger guide her from the house and into the RV. I peeked through the window. Karen rested on Roger as if he were the only thing holding her up in life. What'd you do? Axel had poured himself a cup of coffee. He wiped down the counter where a puddle had sloshed from the carafe. I put a resting spell on her. She needed to sleep. I crossed my arms. Reliving it over and over won't help. Not unless she saw someone. Axel, there were twenty people in that house. It could have been any of them. He raised a finger, but only one who committed murder. He poured another cup and opened a jar. 
a trove of jelly beans glinted in the porcelain container. A smile coiled on my lips as he slid a full cup and the beans to me. I don't want to presume I know which flavors you like in your coffee. I couldn't help but laugh. It doesn't matter. They all taste good. I dropped some brown and white ones in, stirred, and waited a few seconds before sipping. Yum. Vanilla and chocolate. And I thought you'd be happy with cherry and lime. Okay, so it does matter a little when it comes to coffee. Tea, not so much. Our gaze is locked. Emotion swirled around us. The air thickened. Axel took a step toward me. Thanks for coming over. I dragged my gaze to the coffee. Boy, suddenly this cup of joe was so interesting. Like the most fascinating thing I'd ever seen. My gaze flickered back to Axel. He still stared at me. Are you using magic to make sure I look at you? He laughed. It broke the tension volleying between us. No, I wasn't. I was simply hoping that my pure sexiness would keep you looking. It was my turn to laugh. He slid his fingers lightly up my arm. The hair stiffened. Goosebumps flooded my skin, like the worst rash imaginable. Axel brought his hand to my neck and rubbed his thumb over my lips. I missed those lips. I laughed nervously. Luckily, they haven't gone anywhere, cause, boy, I sure would miss them too if they disappeared. Am I making you nervous? I closed my eyes and exhaled a shot of air. This whole thing makes me nervous. You're back. You're not leaving again. I opened one eye and shot him a scathing look. You say you aren't, and I believe you. I'm here, living my life, owning my own business, and getting better at it every day. I just want to take things slowly. A flash of pain flared in his eyes. I know you do. We need to. All I've wanted ever since I returned was to spend time with you. Then you got called on business. He lowered his head. Then I did. I shifted my back to the counter and tapped a fist against it. There's stuff there. He quirked a brow. Stuff? I hitched a shoulder. You know, things between us? You could say that again. I poked his chest. I'm being serious. Who said I wasn't? He eased himself forward and flattened a palm on either side of me, boxing me in. What are you doing? Smelling you. He pressed his nose to my hair. It's like inhaling heaven. I laughed and started to push him away, but my emotions warred. All I'd wanted, to be near Axel, touch him, taste him, collided in my gut. I pushed him back, then I tugged him toward me. I didn't come up for air for hours. Now a nice girl doesn't kiss and tell, so I'm not going to tell. All I'll say is that when Axel dropped me off at my house, I was beaming. Until I stepped inside and came nose first with the tip of Betty's shotgun. Thank goodness it's only you, Pepper. She dropped the butt of the weapon to the floor. I thought the Magnolia Cove murderer had come for me. I froze. You're not mad at me? For what? The look of confusion on Betty's face was priceless. For... What? Was I going to reveal all the intimate details of my life to Betty Crapel? No, I was not going to do that, thank you very much. You're not mad at me for staying out so late after what happened to Cookie? I thought it was a brilliant recovery. Nah, I knew you were with Axel. He'd protect you from whoever got her, even if it was his own mother. I dropped my purse on the floor. Karen didn't kill Cookie. Betty pulled her corncob pipe from a pocket and slid it between her teeth. She pressed a nostril shut with one finger. Magic unfurled from the open one. It zipped into the bowl of the pipe, the tobacco ignited, and Betty settled back, inhaling a deep lungful of smoke. Now, how do you know Karen didn't kill Cookie? Betty said. I opened my mouth and shut it again. Well, I guess I don't. But I mean, this is Axel's mom we're talking about. 
She's a hippie. We did a couple's massage together, she and I. I think I'm a pretty good judge of character. I scoffed. I wasn't a good judge of character. I was great at it. I could peg a person from a mile away. Karen was one heck of a lady. In fact, she was someone I wanted to get to know better, a lot better. I wanted to know her best, you might say. So the fact that Betty was questioning Karen made me want to laugh at my grandmother in her face. Of course, if I did that, Betty would probably kill me. So I decided it would be best not to do anything even remotely close. In fact, Miss Pepper, you might be a great judge of folks at other times, but you're not so hot about Karen. What are you talking about? We bonded, she and I. I know her. Betty blew a smoke ring shaped like a wreath. It floated to the ceiling before dispersing. If you know Karen so well, then you'll know this isn't the first time she's been suspected of murder. My chest tightened. I gulped. It's not, I whispered. Betty shook her head. No, ma'am, it is not. You might want to ask your best friend Karen about it. She sneered. Since you're such a good judge of character and all. Ugh. I was eating those words, and boy, did they taste terrible. Seven. What are you talking about? Karen was accused of murder before? Just what I said. Listen, kid, you don't know everything. Betty and I stared at each other. It became a contest. At least it was on my side. I wanted her to blink first. I had opened my lids so wide they were drying out. You know you want to blink, she said. What about Karen? Don't try to change the subject. I rolled my eyes. I'm not, she pointed at me and laughed. I'm not. Ha ha, you blinked first. Way to be mature. Betty rocked back in her chair. From what I understand, Karen once went for a walk with another witch. That witch lost her footing and fell off a cliff. Karen tried to save her, but her powers weren't as strong. Both women were young. Is that it? Betty nodded. Shh! You made me think Axel's mom went around stabbing people. All they did was go for a walk and one witch fell and died? I mean, that's horrible, but it could have been worse. Betty glared at me. She leaned forward. They were witches. One should have been able to save the other. Bad things happen, just like with Cookie. Something bad happened. I yawned. Listen, I'm going to bed. Are there any other rumors you'd like to fill my head with before I rest? No, and you can thank me tomorrow. She smiled smugly. Thank you for what? Was I the only person confused? For telling you. It's always good to know who's a murderer and who isn't. That's how I've stayed alive so long. Okay, so it's not the witchcraft and healing potions that have kept you alive? Betty tapped her temple. Nope, it's what's in the old brain. I'm smarter than most. She pivoted her face to the fire. Smarter than the average bear, huh? She glanced over. What? Never mind. Good night. Good night. I climbed the stairs and fell face first onto my bed. It was so late I didn't bother peeling off my clothes. I could do that in the morning when I was rested. Yes, that sounded perfect. Change my clothes when I had the energy for it. When I awoke, the sun was winking through the blinds. I was still on my stomach, in the exact same position I'd fallen asleep in. At first, I thought, the rays of light were what had awoken me. But then I heard a jingling in my room, like small bits of metal were clanking together. Then I heard a low growl. I flipped over and faced the wall. Hugo, my pet dragon that was no longer anywhere near baby-sized, pounced on a blur of white and brown fur. Arsenal. I bolted up. Hugo, don't hurt him. 
I must have really screamed it because Hugo flared his wings and rose to the ceiling. I sighed. Sorry, Hugo. The dragon shot me a remorseful look. Sorry, Mama. Puppy play. Hugo could communicate with me, but not anyone else. Actually, I'm not 100% sure that's totally true. He could probably speak with another witch with the same ability to talk to animals as me. It's just there wasn't anyone else in Magnolia Cove like that. I was the only one. Arsenal yipped and bounced. The dog looked like he wanted to pull Hugo back to earth. The beagle noticed me, stopped barking, and bounded over. He rested two paws on my bed and licked my nose. Ew, gross. I palmed the saliva from my face and sat up. What's going on in here? Hugo floated to the ground and Arsenal growled playfully. The dragon growled back, and within seconds the two were wrestling. Arsenal tugged at Hugo's ears. Hugo gnawed on the dog's shoulder. It looked like good old-fashioned fun. Amelia entered. So that's where you got off to. Come on, Arsenal. You need to go out. Why didn't you give him to Ellis Mobley? Oh, I took Arsenal inside, but when I turned to leave, the dog had followed me. So I walked him back in, told him to stay, but he still came after me. What about Ellis? I yawned. Did you sleep in those clothes? I rubbed my face in embarrassment. I picked at a clump of mascara under my lashes. Ugh, I'd left on my makeup. My skin felt like an oil slick. Yes, I slept in them. I can tell. I cocked a brow. You're not answering the question about Ellis. I'm getting to that. Anyway, I couldn't find Ellis. The police had him off in another room for questioning. It's not like I could just barge in. I rose and stretched my stiff joints. You could have given him to one of the officers. She shrugged. Arsenal followed me around so much I didn't want to. Anyway, before you shoot me any more dirty looks, I'm returning the dog today, okay? I nodded. Okay. We have enough animals in this house as it is. None of them are mine. Amelia chimed with superiority. Come on, Arsenal. Out for your walk. Can you take Hugo, too? Amelia patted the dragon's head. Come on, you two. Let's get some exercise. Once Amelia left, I showered and dressed. Then I had breakfast with my grandmother and cousins. Maddie the cat had slept downstairs. She blinked open one eye and greeted me. Morning, sugar bear. I scratched behind her ears and clipped Hugo's leash to him. Come on, let's go to work. Hugo followed me down the street toward familiar place. The morning air chilled me. I tucked my chin into my scarf and rubbed my arms. Hugo, bless his heart, didn't seem to notice. Or if he did, didn't care. The dragon whipped skyward, gliding as we made our way down the street. Your wings are getting strong. I watched with pride as the dragon drifted on the currents. Once we reached the store, he settled to the ground. The kittens and puppies yawned to life after I flicked on the lights. I freshened their water, gave them new food, and changed their bedding. Within minutes, familiar place was open and ready for business. Amelia was my first customer. Burr, I think it's going to snow. That would be a Christmas miracle. I pointed to a chair. What are you doing here? She pulled Arsenal behind her. I called Ellis, but he didn't answer. Can you keep Arsenal for a while? I'll pick him up after work. Amelia worked at the vault, which was a place that was actually a vault. It was filled with rare and dangerous magical objects. In order to work there, Amelia had a certain amount of security clearance. It basically meant that my cousin was pretty cool. Sure, I'll keep Arsenal. I mean, why not? I'm already overloaded with animals. Amelia grinned. Thanks. I'll call you at lunch. With the holiday season's arrival in Magnolia Cove, all the shops were busy. Familiar Place was no exception. School was out, and parents were bringing their kids in by the handfuls to pick familiars. And where do you go to school? I asked a particularly bright-eyed girl that morning. Her dark, curly hair had been pulled into two unruly pigtails. She was an absolute darling. 
Her face beamed with pride. To the Southern School of Magic. Her mother, a tall woman with dark cocoa-colored skin, smiled widely. She's the best witch in her class. They're learning basic spell casting, and we told her that if she got straight marks, Tiffany could have her first familiar. I leaned over and smiled at Tiffany. That's wonderful. Well, let's help you find the best familiar, shall we? We shall, she said enthusiastically. As I helped Tiffany and her mother, several people walked in. Normally, I handled stress well, but for the first time since I'd arrived in Magnolia Cove, I felt like I was drowning in weeds. Right then, the door opened and Axel strode in. I shot him a look that hopefully said, help me. It worked. He immediately started talking to people, guiding them toward animals, helping them and keeping folks busy until I could give each and every one the individual attention they needed. Matching familiars with their witches wasn't like popping cookies from a cutter. Every witch was an individual, so each animal was matched one-on-one. -on -one. After about an hour, I got everyone paired. Tiffany left with a small hamster, perfect for her first familiar. When it was over, I sank into a chair. Phew, that was some rush. I don't know what I would have done without you. Axel sauntered over. I'm sure you would have been just fine. He extended his hands. I took them. I'm lucky Uncle Donovan trained you so well. He barked a laugh. You sure are. What would you do if I couldn't point to the goldfish and puppies? You'd be so lost. It was my turn to laugh. I would be. Silence drifted down as we locked gazes. I cleared my throat. I did not need things to get too heavy between us, not in the middle of the day. How's your mom? He released my hands and backed up. As okay as she can be. Thinks she's going to be blamed for a murder, so she's a wreck. I'm sure she'd love a visit from you, though. I'll come by. His face darkened. What is it? He shrugged. Nothing. No secrets. You kept enough in your life, don't you think? He smirked. You could say that. Axel raked his fingers through his dark hair. I don't want to get you involved. I hope you're joking. I'm already involved. I found your mom standing over Cookie Mobley with a knife in her hand. He opened his mouth to talk. I shut it down. Don't get defensive. I wasn't about to, even though if I had said that to you, you would have gotten defensive. I crossed my arms defensively. I would not. Case and point. I sighed. Look, I'm not saying she's guilty. I like your mom. I want to help her. Tell me how. Axel looked at the ceiling in defeat. Garrick won't give me a list of names as to who was there last night. Oh, I can give you that. Amelia had a list. She would have given it to Garrick, but I'm sure between the three of us cousins we can piece it together for you. That would be awesome. It's not that I don't believe Garrick will do a great job. It's just, it's your mom. I get it. I folded my arms around his waist and inhaled. Axel held me as tight as wrapping paper covering a present. Well, if you were good at wrapping, that was. Some folks, and I'll raise my hand to Jesus on this one, are not so hot when it comes to taping and wrangling paper to cover a gift. That would be me. Not so hot. Luckily, I now owned magic that would do the trick. Or so I hoped. We'd find out once I wrapped some gifts. I'll talk to Amelia and Cordelia tonight, see if we can draw up a list for you. That would be fantastic. Axel kissed my forehead. What did I ever do without you? I'm sure you suffered through life, same as the rest of us. He laughed. I would definitely call it suffering. The front door slammed open, hitting the wall and rattling the cages. What the? I pulled from Axel and whirled around. Alice Mobley stood like a hulking slab of anger in the doorway. You stole my dog. No, no, we didn't. I rushed to Arsenal. 
As much as I didn't like the mangy beast, I scooped him in my arms and held him toward Alice. Last night he was outside. My cousin tried to find you to give him back, but she couldn't. He followed her home. Or he followed Amelia enough that she gave up trying to return him. Same thing. Anger blazed in Ellis's eyes. He yanked the dog from me. Arsenal yipped in fright. Calm down, I said. I will not remain calm. My wife has been murdered and her dog stolen. His gaze narrowed and his lips tightened. He shook a finger at me. I'm reporting your theft to the police. With that, Ellis left the store. I glanced at Axel. Looks like I'll be hearing from Garrick Young about this. Turned out, I was right. Eight. You stole Ellis Mobley's dog? Garrick Young sat on a chair in familiar place. He patted Hugo's head while he fought back a grin. He knew the complaint was hogwash. I knew it was hogwash. But what was he supposed to do? Ignore it? Hugo's eyes rolled back and his tongue lolled to one side. For a teenage dragon, this was heaven. No, I didn't steal the dog. It latched on to Amelia and wouldn't let go. I had no idea Arsenal was even at the house until he ran into my room and played with Hugo. That was this morning. Amelia tried to return the beagle, but Ellis wasn't home. She was going to try again tonight. Garrick tipped up his wide-brimmed fedora, I assumed so he could get a better look at me. So what you're saying is the dog ran away? I laughed. Great way to put it. He gave Hugo one last scratch and rose. Garrick was tall and slim. He was also Cordelia's beau. They got along like sugar and water, a perfect blend. I'll tell Ellis that it was a one-time deal and to keep a tighter rein on his dog. Speaking of reins, Axel's back? I crossed one ankle over the other and leaned against the counter. You noticed. Couldn't help but to when his mom was discovered holding a murder weapon. My heart froze. Garrick, you don't think she did it, do you? His expression darkened. I'm not discussing this with you. Because there's no way she did it. Garrick strode to the door. His cowboy boots struck the wood floors hard. He gripped the knob and paused, his shoulders tense. When the sheriff turned around, the look of anger on his face almost made my heart jump from my chest. Stay out of it, Pepper. I'm not kidding. I know Axel's going to stick his nose in it. It's his mama can't be helped, but you... He pointed a finger at me. Just stay out. She's not your mother. Let me deal with this. Okay, I murmured as he opened the door. I mean it, he warned. Got it, Garrick. I'm staying out of it. Sheesh. I already said I would. He laughed, but scowled at me through the window until he was out of sight. I smiled. If Garrick Young thought a little scare tacticking would stop me from putting together a list of suspects, he was so wrong. I shivered. The wind that had entered when Garrick left was cold. I shot Hugo a look. Temp's dropping, Hugo. Almost time to lock up. The sun was setting early. The winter solstice had arrived and left, and Christmas was almost here. By the time I reached the house, it was dark. Hugo growled at the bushes. What is it, boy? I snapped on the penlight I'd attached to my key ring. A small body bounded from the hedge right on to Hugo. The dragon playfully snarled and quickly tangled with... Arsenal? Oh, crap. I'm in deep trouble. I got both animals up the steps. Hi, Jenny. I said to the guard vine that wound around the top of the porch. I threw open the door. The dragon and beagle tumbled into the living room. Arsenal. Amelia rushed over and pulled the beagle into her arms. What's he doing here? She shot me an accusatory look. I thought Ellis took him back. He did. I pegged my purse and shucked off my jacket. Our friend in mourning, Mr. Mobley, even set Garrick on me. Cordelia munched on a bowl of Christmas nuts. Why'd he do that? 
because Alice assumed I stole his dog. Right. I've got an entire shop filled with animals. Why would I need one more? Arsenal looked at me as if he wanted to say something. I plopped onto the couch. Cat got your tongue, dog? I ain't got nobody's tongue. Maddie slinked by, and I don't appreciate you saying that, because if I really wanted to have his tongue, I'd get Betty to steal it. That's a completely revolting thought, Cordelia said. You're welcome, Maddie shot back. Anyway, I said, regaining control of the conversation. Ellis sent Garrick to interrogate me about the dog, because Ellis accused me of stealing Arsenal. But now he's back. Amelia kissed his furry head. Why? He probably likes it better here than he does over there, Cordelia said. Wouldn't you? Amelia glanced around the room, her eyes bright with wonder. Sometimes I wish I lived in a house as big as the Mobleys. My brows shot up. I waited, holding my breath to see if anything would happen. See, Cordelia and Amelia didn't know it, but they were part genie. Yes, as in wish-fulfilling genie. Several weeks ago, their mothers had confided the secret to me, which meant I was now tasked with taking notes every time either one of my cousins said anything regarding wishes. See, Licky and Mint didn't know if their daughters would inherit the talent, but they were also too chicken to reveal the truth to Cordelia and Amelia. Talk about potential family drama. It was a real pain in my tush as it put me in a difficult place. I promised not to tell my cousins about their heritage, but I also had to spy on them. Yay me. I waited to see if Amelia's wish materialized. It didn't. We remained in Betty's cottage, surrounded by Dr. Doolittle's furry friends. I don't think this little guy wants to return to the Mobleys. Amelia said. But what are we supposed to do with him? I said. Keep him? Why not? She scratched his chin. The dog slumped to the floor and rolled over. Amelia proceeded to rub his belly. See, he likes it here. He hasn't even yipped once. A Christmas miracle, Cordelia said dryly. Hey, y'all, before I forget, we need to come up with a list. I slipped off my shoes a catalog of who went through the tour with us for Axel so he could find the murderer. You know, he could let Garrick do his job every once in a while, Cordelia scowled. So could you? I gasped. Is the person who is often my partner in crime scolding me? Cordelia rolled her eyes. Don't be offended, Amelia said. She's ticked that she hasn't figured out a Christmas present for Garrick. I don't have one for Axel, either. Axel doesn't deserve one, Cordelia said. Amelia and I shot her questioning looks. She hitched a shoulder in total disinterest. What? He doesn't. Not the way he ran off. I've still got to get him something, even if it's a sheet of paper. You could always get him cologne, Amelia said cheerfully. No, I like the way he smells. My cousin stared at me. I'm sure he uses cologne, but I don't know what, and it's absolute perfection. No need to change it. Glad we got that settled, Cordelia said. Garrick could probably use a new leather belt or something. He'd be fine with that. Axel's different, though. I sighed. I know. If I knew what sort of wizard stuff he needed, I could maybe find something for him there, but otherwise... I don't know. Amelia snapped her fingers. I know. How about one of those man boxes? You know, the kind that are themed around stuff. Guys always love survival gear. Maybe there's one based on that. Cordelia's eyes brightened. I've got one better. What if there was an essential wizard survival kit? Or a werewolf one? I suggested. Arsenal flipped over and shook his head. Amelia gave him a friendly scratch. He's got the strangest tag. Axel doesn't wear a tag, I joked. She shot me an annoyed look. 
I know that. I'm talking about the dog. It's sort of a blue jewel thing. Maybe it's a tracker, and that's how Alice found him this morning, Cordelia offered. Maybe, but I've never seen anything like it. I stretched my legs in front of me. It's only a tag, Amelia. Probably something Cookie had specially made. You know, maybe it was the nicest thing she ever did in her life. Amelia and Cordelia laughed. You are going to hell, Pepper Dunn, Amelia said. Probably. But y'all laughed. You can't be too far behind. I smiled at them and remembered about the list. It needed to get slapped together pronto. I'd promised, after all. I clapped my hands. As much as I'd love to hang out and do nothing but chat, we've got work to do. Are y'all willing to help me with the roster of folks who traipse through Cookie's house? Amelia nodded. I will help you, cuz, whatever you need. I met Cordelia's gaze. And you? She shrugged. What the heck, might as well. I grabbed a notepad from a desk, sat back on the couch, and tucked my feet under me. I smoothed the page with my arm. Okay, how many folks were on the roster? Twenty, Amelia said. That's how it works. Twenty in each group, not counting the guides. Let's hear names. Amelia ticked them off her finger. Mr. and Mrs. Gabin, the Izzard family, including their two kids, Paul and Tabitha Odom, the Van Zant family, that's four. Let's see, who else? She shot a look to Cordelia. Cordelia picked up where Amelia left off. She gave a few more names, and by the end, we had 20. I tapped the end of the pen to the notepad. Out of all these folks, who would have wanted Cookie dead? That's easy, Cordelia said. All of them. I laughed. <laughs> Sorry, that's not funny, but it is. You can't mean Cookie made that many people angry, do you? Amelia tickled Arsenal's back. That's exactly what she's saying. The Odoms were the Mobley's neighbors until Cookie started taking over their backyard. Literally taking it over. She used magic to make their property smaller so she could put in a fountain. You're kidding. The gonads on some people astounded me. Nope, not kidding, she said. The Gabins sued the Mobleys for some kind of investment deal that went sour. Then Cookie ticked off Mrs. Van Zant when she accused Edna of ruining her banana pudding at a solstice function. My brows hitched. So, you're not kidding. Nope, Cordelia replied. Cookie Mobley ticked off just about every single person in Magnolia Cove at one time or another. I mean, she strapped a neck brace to her throat and made sure the RV was towed at Christmas. She was a real piece of work. I'm not saying I'm glad she's dead, but she wasn't exactly warm and snuggly. Agreed. I peeled the page from the notepad, folded it, and slid it in my pocket. Thanks for your help. I'll give this to Axel in the morning. The door blew open. Betty stepped in. Her curly hair looked like she'd stuck her finger in a socket. Her eyes were dazed. Her glasses were crooked and barely clutching her face. One strong wind and they'd be blown onto the next street. It got worse. Her square black shoes were on the wrong feet. My grandmother was such a mess I barely noticed the freezing wind scraping across my skin. I really needed to check the weather. Was there a front coming? My cousins and I exchanged frightened glances. We rose at once. What happened? I said. Betty staggered in. She reached for her rocker. I rushed to it and pushed it across the floor. Betty plopped down. The look in her eyes was full of fright. Cordelia shook her. Betty, what is it? Betty's lower lip trembled. I was afraid someone else had died. Panic clawed at me. She had to speak. What could be so terrible that my grandmother was now speechless? Betty, talk to us. She moved like a robot when she patted my hand. It was the candy. My cousins and I exchanged a worried glance. Actually, Amelia looked like she was about to burst into laughter. 
the candy? I said, not understanding. It got away from me. What do you mean? Cordelia said, hitching a brow. Go look. The three of us stepped outside. What's she talking about? Amelia said. I don't see anything. I hugged my arms against the cold and jogged down the steps. I stopped, frozen in place. Uh-oh, y'all. We have a problem. What is it? Cordelia reached my side. I pointed and she glanced up. Holy smokes. What's the big deal? Amelia paused. Good night. Y'all? This is worse than the time Rufus wanted to swallow Magnolia Cove up in that bottomless bag. It was. As far as the eye could see, red and white striped candy covered each and every house. It dripped over the gutters like fingers and shot past the chimneys to the sky. Our neighborhood was a Christmas mess. I fisted my hands to my hips. How in the world are we ever going to clean this up? Amelia patted my shoulder. I don't know, but we better try before what's left of the decorating committee finds Betty. Then all hell will break loose. We're on the decorating committee, I said. She smiled brightly. Oh, yeah. Well, we better get this cleaned up. Grab a mop. I poked the air. I have a better idea. I say we use the bottomless bag to clean it up. Amelia? Amelia swallowed. You want me to risk my job at the vault? Cordelia nodded. If it means keeping Magnolia Cove from being swallowed by candy canes, yes. It was our only choice. The vault or nothing. Amelia gritted her teeth. Let's do this. Nine. Amelia managed to sneak into the vault and obtain the bottomless bag within an hour, which worked perfectly. The roofs are beginning to creak. I stared at the thick, gooey mess of sticky candy dripping off the eaves and chimneys of our neighbors. How did Betty do this? Cordelia said. She's usually so on it with her magic. And she wasn't supposed to decorate other houses, just ours. She stared at the homes. Concern washed over her features. You don't think she's losing it, do you? Amelia held the bag away from her as if it held a wild cat. Losing what? Her mind or her magic? Her mind. Cordelia rolled her eyes. Come on, Amelia, what did you think I meant? Could have gone either way. Amelia shrugged. Okay, what's the plan with the bag? My cousins looked at me. What? The bag was your idea, Amelia said. How are we supposed to use it? I thought y'all might know. Cordelia and Amelia shook their heads. We don't know how to use it, Amelia said. You're the head witch. See what you can do. Okay, well, I should have known this was going to happen. I make a suggestion, and it lands on me to follow through. That was normal, I supposed. Give me the bag. Amelia clutched it to her chest. Do you know what you're doing? No, I'm going to figure it out. My cousins grimaced. I made the suggestion, and as you said, I'm the head witch. Amelia didn't move. I opened and shut my palm. Look, you're going to get in trouble if we don't use the bag and return it to the vault, so hand it over. She did. Sorry, I just got a little worried. But stealing it didn't worry you, Cordelia said. Amelia jutted out a hip. Listen, after the time watch was broken and I stole that, not much bothers me. On Halloween, Amelia had borrowed an incredibly powerful magical object that had proceeded to get broken and thrust us into never-ending Halloween. We eventually got it fixed, but for a while there I was afraid we wouldn't. The bag vibrated in my hands. I clutched it tightly and focused on the gooey candy stuck to the houses. That was the only thing I wanted the bag to suck up, just the candy. The lucky thing was that it looked like all the candy was connected, 
One thick peppermint strand looped from home to home. Theoretically, all I needed to do was open the bag at one end, and hopefully it would suck up the candy, acting like a straw. That was the idea, at least. I held the bag to the house next to ours and slowly opened the mouth. I didn't know how much suction force I would be exposed to, and I didn't want to drop the bag and have it start gulping up the entire town. So I opened it slightly. I held my breath and watched as the foot-thick striped candy shook from the force of the bag. Then, suddenly... It was sucked up as if a tornado lived inside the sack. The bag slurped and jerked, eating and devouring the gooey peppermint exactly as I'd hoped. It chugged and glugged. I followed the line of candy, walking around to the front and smiling as the bag swallowed the mess that Betty had created. I want to hold it, Amelia said. Sure. I handed the bag to her and watched as my cousin grinned widely. This is fun, she said. Cordelia, you try. So that's how it went. My cousins and I laughed with glee as we cleaned up our street. Finally, when the last bit had been sucked up, I turned to our cottage. Last one, I said to Cordelia. No problem, sweet tea witch, she said, smiling. Cordelia stood at the base of the porch. The candy made a large ribbon over the roof. It didn't touch Jenny, the guard vine, but it hung limply. In fact, it looked like Betty had tried to create a bow on top, but had succeeded in creating a droopy, yawning dollop of candy. No, it didn't look anything like a bow. Cordelia splayed her legs and yelled, Come on, candy, let's suck you up. She opened the bag. It gurgled and pulled, but the candy wouldn't budge. It didn't move. It was like the sticky stuff was cemented to our home. Try again, I said. Open it wider, Amelia yelled. Cordelia did as she said. The trees shook from the force. The house rumbled, but the peppermint didn't even shake. The ground beneath me quaked, the air turned frigid, my fingers numbed, but still the candy stubbornly stayed in place. My hair whipped over my mouth. You're going to suck up the town, close the bag. Cordelia struggled, but eventually succeeded in closing the sack. The earth settled, the wind died, but a chill settled into my marrow. Holy crap, what was that? The power of the bottomless bag, Cordelia said. I stalked toward the house. But why didn't it suck it up? It took all the rest. I brushed my fingers over the candy. It was more than simply tacky. Some of it stuck to my fingers. Ew, gross. But still, I don't understand. I know why it didn't come off. Stupid, stupid thing. The three of us turned toward the porch. Standing under the single glowing light was Betty. Her arms were crossed and a deep scowl penetrated her face. Why? Concern filled Amelia's voice. Why didn't the candy come off our house? Did we use the bag wrong? I said. We didn't use it wrong. Cordelia sidled forward. Something's going on. Something's up. Betty? Why didn't it work? It should have. It did on every other home on the block. Because... Betty's voice trembled as if she were filled with fear from head to foot. My powers are broken, girls. They're broken, and I don't know how to fix them. 10. We sat inside, drinking hot cups of cocoa that Betty allowed me to make in her cauldron. Yes, she let me use the cauldron above the ever-burning fire in the hearth. It was quite the treat. The fire was warm, but it never added heat to the house, and it burned nonstop. It was never out. Even standing in front of it, turning the spoon in the cauldron, the flames felt different. Alive, 
as if they had their own consciousness. Yes, I know that was ridiculous, but it was almost as if the fire sensed what I wanted to do and helped me create the cocoa. Y'all are right. I'm probably overthinking this. It started yesterday. Betty sipped her drink. Something snapped inside of me. I know it sounds stupid, but I could feel it deep down in my bones. Something frayed inside me. I don't know what, and I wasn't 100% sure until I worked with the candy. I took it outside to cool, because natural chilling is always best. But the consistency never got right. She paused, sipped her cocoa again, smacked her lips. Pepper, you would have made a great kitchen witch. Kid, you got the stuff. Thank you. The chocolate was delicious. A dash of cinnamon, cream mixed with milk, and dark cocoa powder made for an amazing tangle of flavors on my tongue. Keep going, Cordelia prodded. Betty stared into her cup. It never got right, ever. The candy didn't do what it was supposed to. Then it spread. I tried to keep it to our house, but the stuff grew and opened. Like a gift, it continued to unfurl, until finally it stopped. Out of nowhere, it stopped. But when I attempted to make it disappear, it didn't work. Nothing happened. Her gaze met each of ours. That's when I came in here and saw y'all. I reached over and squeezed her hand. But it's not so bad. It'll be fine. We'll get it cleaned up, don't you think? Betty shrugged. The vacant look in her eyes told me our chances weren't so hot. Which was actually funny, considering how freaking cold it was getting outside. I don't know if you'll be able to fix it. I couldn't. The bottomless bag couldn't. I don't know. But I do know one thing. What's that? I said, smiling encouragingly. This was fine, my face said. It will all be okay. The only thing that worries me is that the candy over our house hasn't stopped expanding. I shot my cousins a frown. It hasn't. Are you sure? Betty grunted. I'm sure, kid. You don't live to be a witch as old as me without knowing these kinds of things. She glanced at the ceiling. That candy is still growing. I'm afraid it won't stop until it swallows this house whole. On that note, we all went to bed. Surely Betty was wrong. The candy would stop. It would have to. Still, my dreams were uneasy. I invited Hugo onto the bed with me. I was so bothered. Normally, the dragon slept on the floor, but Betty's words had rattled me so badly I had no problem hugging his scaly skin tightly against me, though I stopped him when it came to licking my face. When I left the house the next morning with Hugo beside me, I turned to look at the cottage. The candy had wrapped around the frame snugly and was edging up the windows. I pulled out my phone and took a picture so I could compare it when I got home and prove to Betty that she was wrong. It wouldn't grow. It couldn't. I headed over to Axel's first thing. I had the list that he'd want. There were too many names to go over on the phone. Besides, I knew he'd need to see it. I got in my car, stowed Hugo in the back seat, and headed off. Come in, came a familiar yet surprising voice when I knocked on the door. I opened it to find Karen cooking up a fancy breakfast. There were pancakes, danishes, an egg casserole, hash brown casserole, sausages as thick as my thumbs, and a giant pot of coffee. Hugo bounded in, jumped on Axel, and whined until Axel patted his head. The smell of everything was amazing. I am so upset that I already ate breakfast. Axel dropped a sausage in Hugo's mouth. If you called, I could have told you not to eat. I prefer surprises. All right, down boy, he said. Karen dropped a casserole dish of fried apples on the table. Pepper, if you want, Axel can make you feel hungry so that you can eat a second breakfast. I laughed. But then I'd gain a thousand pounds. She tapped her nose. That's where I come in. 
I'll make sure you don't gain an ounce. Seriously, this was too good to be true. You're kidding. Not at all. Karen sailed up to me and steered me to a chair. She pressed me onto it. Axel, do you want me to? He said. Sure. Why not? As long as no one got hurt, there was no reason not to indulge in a second breakfast that wouldn't add an ounce to my waistline. He crossed to me, tapped my forehead, and voila, I was instantly starved. I was so hungry my stomach nodded. If y'all don't hurry up and sit down, I might eat everything on this table. Roger chuckled. You'll have to beat me to it. After about twenty minutes of silence while everyone chowed down, I finally came up for air. So, Roger, I said between chews of a stubby, pork-filled sausage link, how are you able to be here, in Magnolia Cove, I mean? He pushed his glasses up his nose. I'm on a witch visa. I stopped chewing and gaped at Axel. Is there such a thing? Sure is. He filled a glass with orange juice. Why is this the first time I'm hearing about it? Axel tipped his head as if to say, Are you really asking that? Because Magnolia Cove is filled with secrets, Pepper. You discover the answer to one secret, and it leads to ten more you have to unlock. Hmm, seems about true. I wanted to tell Axel about Betty, but I didn't want to burden his parents. They had enough to worry about. We finished breakfast. Karen clapped her hands, and the dishes magically danced to the sink, and the table cleared. Let me help. I rose. Sit down, young lady. Roger and I will get this. Karen winked at her husband, and he joined her to help clean the kitchen. I've got the list, I said to Axel. Let's go downstairs. I followed him to his cellar. Hugo bounced along, sniffing and grunting at the objects of magic that littered the shelves of Axel's workroom. I handed him the list. Your mom seems awfully chipper. Are you still helping her? Magically, I mean. He dragged his gaze from the sheet. What? Yes. I don't think she could handle the stress otherwise. I sank onto a couch. It's working out in your favor. She cooked an awesome breakfast. He shot me a dark look. Yeah, that's why I'm doing it, so I can eat great. His shoulders sank in regret. Sorry, I'm all worked up about this. Garrick's questioned her twice. I'm afraid when he goes for a third, he'll keep her and press charges. She didn't kill Cookie. I know that, you know that. I nudged him with my toe. But... The list? Right. Axel smiled slightly. The list. Lots of names on here. From what Amelia and Cordelia said, just about any of those folks could have done it. Nearly all of them had a problem with Cookie. Axel hitched a brow. Any relatively interesting stories to share? I stretched my legs over the couch cushions. The basement was chilly. I hugged my arms and was beginning to wonder what was wrong with me. Why was everywhere so cold? Apparently, the Odoms used to be the Mobley's neighbors until Cookie started taking over their yard. How? She made it shrink so she could have more fescue, I guess. Axel laughed. What a character. Okay, who else? The Gabins had a sour investment deal with the Mobley's. That's good, he murmured. Money can make people crazy. And Cookie accused Mrs. Van Zandt of ruining her banana pudding. Axel tapped a finger to the sheet. Clearly, that's where we'll start. I frowned. I hope you're joking. I am. We won't start at the banana pudding, but we will start with the ex-neighbors. Hope bubbled in my chest. We? A flash of surprise crossed his face. You're letting me help? No, I misspoke. I was using the royal we. I almost threw a chunk of onyx at him. Problem was, I didn't know how volatile the hunk of rock was. If I threw it, power might lash out at me. I see you're trying to figure out what to throw at me. I laughed. 
our eyes met, and the twinkle in his luscious blue eyes sent a zinger of want straight to my core. I pushed it down away. You caught me. But yes, I definitely want to help. There are things I need you to help with. But much of that has to do with me wanting you to distract my mom. I searched Axel's expression, trying to determine how serious he was. Distract her? He raked his fingers through his hair. She never had a daughter. You're the closest thing, even though we're dating. She'll latch on to you. I stretched my arms over the couch's back and tried to look very smart and totally capable. No problem. I'll be happy to bond with your mom. Just no more couples massages. He laughed. You got it. From a corner, Hugo glanced upstairs and whined. Need to go outside, boy? I rose and hugged my arms around Axel's muscled waist. I bet he'd love a game of catch. Axel squeezed my hands. Then catch it is. We went back upstairs, and Axel, dreamboat that he was, took Hugo outside for a game of catch. Roger and Karen were just finishing cleaning breakfast. Thanks again for that awesome breakfast, I said. You're welcome. Karen smiled and nodded. Roger slid a plate onto a stack in the cupboard. Best breakfast ever. Beats eating in the RV. About that... I wasn't sure exactly how to broach the topic, but I needed all the help I could get, or at least I thought Axel might. Karen hitched a brow. Yes? Is there something you're wondering about? I nibbled my lower lip. It was now or never. Yeah, um, about how you help Roger when he's a werewolf. I was wondering how you do it. Karen and Roger exchanged a look. Roger wiped his hands on a towel and draped it over the counter. Axel said he's building a structure to house himself. Yes, but I don't know. I feel that within me there's a way to make it work. That he can control himself, not me controlling him. I don't want that. All I want is for the beast not to have such a strong hold on him. They didn't say anything. Now I was nervous. Were they not talking to me because I'd said something wrong? Oh, crap. Being nervous always made me talk more. I mean, I'm just wondering. I know I can help him. At least I feel it. It's there, but I don't know. It's never worked. My hands started gesturing wildly as if I wasn't in control. Roger's brows shot up. Axel says it's impossible, but I know you help Roger, Karen. You help him. I can help Axel. I inhaled deeply. Boy, did I need air. I'm just wondering, how do you keep him calm and connect with him all night? Karen's face split into a wide smile. Of course I'll tell you how I help Roger. Why don't you sit down? Eleven. Roger coughed into his fist. I'll go keep Axel company. It's not every day you see a dragon playing catch, you know. I laughed. You go so much fun. Roger excused himself. Karen took me by the hands and led me to the couch. You want to know how I help Roger, how we make the connection? Right. I know you put a sleeping spell on him, but it can't be that easy. We're talking about a werewolf. That isn't an easy being to lull into any kind of sedated state. I pulled my hands from hers and fisted them to my thighs. Axel is convinced that he can't have complete control, but he can. I've reached his mind before, but it never lasts. Karen nodded appreciatively. I know what you're talking about. The reason I can stay connected to Roger is very simple. What's that? Karen glanced at the floor, as if embarrassed. This is going to sound strange, but it's because we have a very deep relationship. Okay, I said slowly, as if tasting the words. You have a deep relationship. We locked gazes, and she stared at me knowingly. Yes, a deep connection, because we're married? Because you're married. 
I repeated, still not getting it. Karen spoke slowly. Because we do things that married people do. Things that married people do. It hit me like a finger of lightning to my spine. Oh, you're saying you're able to keep Roger sedated because you had a wedding night. Karen clapped. Yes, that's it. Oh, well. I was relieved that I finally understood, but since Axel and I hadn't had a wedding night, literally or figuratively, I wasn't sure what to say. Turned out, Karen filled the silence for me. You need the deepest connection that intimacy gives. Until that happens, you may not be able to reach him the way you want. It's nothing to do with you or him, but that's the truth. Whether or not your relationship reaches that point is up to fate. Yeah, I couldn't keep the disappointment from my voice. She squeezed my shoulder. It's okay. Axel's been dealing with his werewolf side for a long time. He knows what must be done. Don't worry about it, Pepper. You have enough on your hands. So do you. I said it without thinking and immediately regretted it. Karen's face crumpled. I took her hand. You didn't do it. Garrick will find the guilty party. She knuckled a tear from under her lash. I know. It's just... Something like this happened before. Oh? I decided playing stupid was my best defense. If I could discover the real story, then I could tell Betty that what she'd heard about Karen was untrue. Karen hadn't pushed another witch over a cliff. She cleared her throat. This was it. I'd find out the story. Yes, a long time ago. The door banged open. <laughs> Axel said, shaking the cold off. It's freezing out there. Must be a cold front moving in. Hugo bounded in. The dragon rushed up and licked my face. I scratched his side. I think the front's already here. I take it the two of you had fun? That was something. Roger beamed. Seeing the dragon in action was marvelous. Karen, we need one of those. Not on your life. She crossed her arms. We've got enough to worry about without having the headache of a dragon getting loose. He hugged her shoulders. It was worth a shot. Axel nodded in my direction. Pepper, you ready? I glanced at my watch. Well, where are we going? The store will open soon. We're not going far, and we shouldn't be gone long. He pulled the list from his pocket. Oh! I bolted from the couch. Okay, let's go. Axel, Hugo, and I piled into Axel's Land Rover. I shoved my hands between my thighs to warm them. It's getting to be that temperature where it's hard to take a breath. Axel fiddled with the knobs. He pressed a hand over the dash. Piping hot air shot from the vents. Thank goodness I sank into a blissful climate. I'll take a sauna over an igloo any day. He smirked. Sauna it is, then. We headed into town. So we're going to the Gabins, is that it? That's right. See what their story is. Sometimes an old grudge never leaves and waits for the right time to expose itself. That was a mouthful, I joked. It sure was. We parked outside a small white cottage with a thatched roof, green shutters buttered up to paned windows, and a door painted a sprightly cherry red. Wow, looks like Christmas here, doesn't it? Sure does. Axel took Hugo's leash. We're taking him with us? Axel studied the house. You bet. Who doesn't talk when they're afraid a dragon's going to barbecue them? I scratched Hugo's head. This guy wouldn't hurt a fly. I know that. You know that. The Gabins don't. Good point. Moments later, we were ringing the bell. A bright-eyed woman in her early fifties answered the door. Her skin was creamy and flawless, her lips a deep shade of red, and her outfit was made of a thick cotton weave, obviously expensive. Yes? Her gaze swept from me to Axel to Hugo. 
Why, I say, I haven't seen a baby dragon in years. You're not selling him, are you? No, I said quickly, a little too quickly. Mrs. Gaben blinked at me. Axel swept in and saved the moment. I'm Axel Rain. I'm a private investigator. I've been hired to look into the Cookie Mobley murder. You don't say. Mrs. Gaben peeked around us, sweeping her head from left to right. Come in. I'd love to hear all about it. I shot Axel a confused look. He shrugged and we stepped in. Thank you for the coffee, Mrs. Gaben. Blanche, she corrected. Everyone calls me Blanche. We sat in the Gabins' living room. A baby grand piano was in one corner. fleur de -lis patterned paper lined the walls, and every wooden surface gleamed from a polished finish. The Gabins were rich, y'all. Blanche, Axel started. You were at the tour of the Mobley's house the night Cookie was murdered. Oh, yes. Blanche touched her throat in that way cultured women do. I don't do it because I'm not cultured, but I've seen it enough times to recognize the dainty feminine gesture of the wealthy and well-informed. My husband and I attend the tours every year, Blanche said. We wouldn't miss it for the world. I understand you used to be the Mobley's neighbors. Axel bit into a shortbread cookie Blanche had served. Great cookie. Aren't they? I always keep them around in case of guests. But yes... We were neighbors. We heard there was some tension, I said. There was. She nodded. Oh, not on our part, but on the Mobleys. That's not how we heard it. I took a bite of shortbread. Buttery goodness dissolved on my tongue. Wow, this is amazing. Axel took the steering wheel. We heard Cookie stole part of your yard. She tried. Blanche scoffed, but she didn't succeed. I tell you, that woman was horrible, but you didn't hear that from me. It's no surprise someone killed her. One spring, I had roses and tulips planted in front of a hedge that bordered our yards. The next day I come out, and you won't believe it, but Cookie had shrunk the hedge and the flowers to half their size, killed most of the roses and the tulips. She did it all for a few extra yards of green, for her Roman fountain, techiest thing I ever saw. But surely what she did couldn't have been all small things. Other people knew about the feud. Axel tossed a cookie to Hugo, who swallowed it with one bite. Blanche studied Axel. I suppose it would have to be more than a simple hedge moving for all of Magnolia Cove to know our dirty laundry. He nodded. Oh, all right. She swatted the air. At one point, I may or may not have thrown a chicken into her yard and screamed that I would see her in Hades. She sniffed and pumped the bottom of her hair. Of course, I didn't use the word Hades. I used that other one. I had to fight to keep from laughing. You threw a chicken in her yard. You would have thrown a lot worse if you'd had to deal with what I did. That woman was incorrigible. One morning I awoke, and all my grass was dead. Dead. Even the trees. Cookie Mobley did whatever was necessary to get what she wanted. If you want to know the truth, I'm surprised she wasn't murdered a long time ago. There, I said it. It wasn't me who killed her, obviously, but I'm not the least bit surprised. Axel's jaw tightened. I had a perfect view of his gorgeous profile. Razor-sharp jaw, straight nose, high cheekbones. He was so handsome. His beauty had such a hold on me that I barely noticed he'd moved the conversation along. Can you think of anyone who might have had a problem with Cookie? You know, to the point where they'd want to throw her over the hedges and not a roast chicken? I never said the chicken was cooked. Blanche smiled. But anyway, I tell you what. The person I'd ask would be the new neighbor's. From what I understand, Cookie was up to her old tricks. Wanted to put a Grecian gazebo in her yard. You'd think she'd use magic to fit it all in, but no. Cookie had to claim her territory the old-fashioned way, with grit and spit. I brushed crumbs from my jacket. The new neighbors, 
What are their names? I believe it's the Barkers. I'm sure if anyone has the goods on Cookie Mobley, it would be them. We thanked Blanche Gaben and left. As soon as I snuggled into the front seat, I glanced at my watch. Almost time to open. Axel put the truck in reverse and backed out of the drive. Why don't you call Betty and see if she'll fill in for a few minutes? I get the feeling we'll need to talk to the Barkers. Why? I didn't do too much to help you with Blanche. He tipped his head toward me. You're not giving yourself any credit. You were great. If it hadn't been for Hugo, I don't think we would have gotten in at all. Ah, so it's my dragon you want me for, among other things. I smiled. I don't know. Something weird is going on with Betty. What? Says her power's broken. He steered us through the streets. What happened? I explained about the candy. Axel listened quietly, his eyes searching as he steered us in what I had thought was the direction of Bubbling Cauldron, but turned out we ended up outside Betty's house. What are we doing here? I said. He killed the engine. We're going to talk to your grandmother, see if what she says is true. I gazed up at the headliner. You're kidding, right? Do you really think Betty's power is broken? I'm thinking maybe she just needed a good night's sleep. He nodded toward the cottage. Have you looked at the candy this morning? Yeah, I mean, I glanced at it. Why? Axel pointed. Was it like that? I stared out the window. My gaze snagged on the striped peppermint goo. It hugged the house as if it wanted to squeeze the very life from it. Red and white ribbon drooped and sagged, weighing down the boards. A distinct rumble burped from the structure. What was that? Axel unsnapped his seatbelt. Unless I'm wrong, and I am sometimes very, very wrong. It sounds like the ribbon is swallowing the house. Like if you gave the candy the opportunity, it would take over like a fungus until nothing's left. I swallowed a knot of nerves. I slowly dragged my gaze from the candy to Axel. Lines of worry were etched so deeply into his face it startled me. So, do you think Betty's powers are broken? Axel nodded. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Twelve. When we got inside, Betty was hard at work by the fire. It won't do what I want, she murmured. It's not working. None of it is working. Arsenal the Beagle shot out from behind her and toppled roly-poly into Hugo. The two animals tangled into a mess of playful snarls and yelps. He's still here? Axel said. I shrugged. The dog keeps coming back. What can I say? He likes it better here than at his house. Betty? Axel said. Her mumbling reminded me of a mad woman. You know, the kind you see in movies, with dark stringy hair covering their faces. Oh, and the woman is always barefoot and wearing a drab, stained dress. Yep, that's what Betty was like. Minus the crazy hair, bare feet, and dress, that was. It just won't work. Axel shot me a worried look before gently guiding Betty away from the fire. I saw the candy. Has it eaten the house yet? She worried her hands like Lady Macbeth trying to out the spot. Not yet, but a couple of days and it will. He settled Betty into her rocker. What's going on? Betty stared at her hands in disbelief. I don't know. If I knew that, I'd have this here thing fixed in no time, but I can't. First Christmas, I won't be able to do anything. It's a disaster. Axel squeezed her arms. No, we can figure this out. Tell me everything you remember. Turned out it wasn't much. It was basically the same story that she told my cousins and me. There was a pop and her power broke. Not much else to it. Axel patted his thigh and rose. Let's try some basic stuff. Basic spells and see where you're at. It's no use, Betty moaned. I've lost my touch. Who was this woman? 
This wasn't the Betty Crapel I met my first day in town. Minutes after I'd been found holding a bloody knife, Betty threatened the existing sheriff if he laid a single fingernail on me. Where was the woman who greeted my late-night dates with a shotgun strapped across her legs? This was not that woman. This woman was a dried-up corn husk of that woman. She was the brown stalk of a cotton blossom. That's who this woman was. This was not Betty Crapel. I planted my feet wide, bent over, and glared in her beady eyes. You've got to get it together. What in hex bells is going on here? Where's your gumption, your spitfire? The Betty Crapel I know wouldn't lie down and die when a car ran over her. The Betty Crapel I know would fight. You're a fighter. Time to start acting like it. Betty's lower lip trembled. I think I scared the willies out of her if you want to know the truth. She yanked her glasses from her face and rubbed her eyes. You're right, Pepper. A faint smile danced over her lips. I'll give it a try. Great. Axel led her to the fire. Using the power of the hearth, I want you to do something small. He snapped a dried herb from a bundle over the mantel. Light this. Betty pinched her lips and narrowed her eyes. It looked like she was trying to give herself an aneurysm more than working magic. This should have been easy for her. Plenty of times I'd watched as fire ignited on the tip of her finger so she could light her pipe. Betty pressed one side of her nose closed. A curlicue of magic zipped from the open nostril and wound around the stick. A thick layer of ice coiled around the herb. Betty thrust it toward us. See? See this? I'm broken. My power is broken. I told y'all. It did indeed appear that her magic wasn't right. I grimaced. What's wrong with it? Axel tapped a fist to his mouth. Let me look at you. If you must, she grumbled. Axel led her away from the fire. He closed his eyes and raised his palms. Power lit his hands. He swept them over Betty, looking more martial artist than wizard. Heck, either way, he looked good to me. Axel moved his palms down Betty, pausing at certain points along her body, her fingertips, her heart, her stomach. Then he continued on. He kept his eyes closed, allowing his hands to do the work. After a couple of minutes, his lids fluttered open. Betty, you have a problem. She looked like she wanted to spit nails. Dagnabbit, I've been telling y'all I have a problem. What is it? Axel rested his muscular hands seductively on his hips. I don't think he meant to be seductive, but there wasn't much he did that wasn't. You've been spelled. Betty shook an angry fist. I knew it. Someone's hexed me. Axel twitched his head. Not hexed. This isn't a hex. It's more than that. It's a curse, then. If I discover who cursed me, I'm going to curse their butt. It's not a curse, either. Then what incarnation is it? Axel rubbed his jaw in thought. It's a simple tethering spell. There's nothing simple about my magic being broken. If nails could have spewed from her mouth so that my grandmother was spitting them, I'm sure they would have. Boy, was she ticked. Axel stepped around her. But it is a tethering spell. Someone tethered your magic to themselves. I don't know what set off the magic, but there had to have been an incident. Betty threw up her hands. What do we do now? The only thing we can do. Discover who did this to you. That'll help us find the answer. I studied my grandmother. She seemed perfectly fine except for her power being off. But how do we discover who did that? Axel pointed to the fire. Is this thing working right? She scratched her chin. Believe so. Nobody would dare mess with the fire or else they'd be burned toast. What do you mean about the fire? I knew the fire never burned out, but I never bothered to think more about it than that it was a fire it burned in the house. What more was there to know? This fire, Betty pointed to it, has been in our family for centuries. 
I yanked my ear to make sure there wasn't something in it obstructing my hearing. I'm sorry, what? Centuries? She nodded. Yes, this fire is very important. Within it lies the heart of your great-great-great-great-grandfather. There might be more. It's easy to lose count with all those greats. It's hard to say. My stomach lurched. Vomit crept up the back of my throat. Did you say heart? You don't mean his heart, do you? Not really a heart, like a beating organ. That's not what you mean, right? No, you couldn't mean that. Not like a human heart. Not possible. Boy, I was seriously getting nervous these days. Rambling was becoming second nature to me. Betty and Axel exchanged a look. Axel tilted his head slightly, as if to say he would handle this. I know this is strange, Pepper. I know it makes no sense, but what Betty's saying is right. Betty removed her glasses. It added a hint of dramatic flair to the moment. The reason why this fire never burns out is because it houses the heart of your ancestor. When I die, the heart fire will become yours. But before that happens, Christmas in Magnolia Cove depends on this flame. And right now I'm unable to be its vessel. I groaned. Please don't tell me any more, really. You don't have to. My stomach twisted. This was going to be news I didn't want to hear. I knew it would. I wouldn't want to know any part of this. Betty gripped my shoulders with hands of iron. I'm sorry to tell you this, Pepper, but since my magic is broken, it's up to you to keep Christmas in Magnolia Cove going. Without you, there will be no snow, no cheer, and most of all, no Christmas wishes. Christmas won't happen. I shot her a dark look. You're being dramatic. Axel's jaw flexed. I'm afraid she's not. Pepper, everything in Magnolia Cove, including Christmas, depends on Betty being able to harness that fire. If she can't, we'll have a lot worse things on our hands than a candy ribbon that wants to devour this house. Without that fire, Christmas wishes could go wrong. I swallowed an egg in my throat. So it's true. Christmas depends on me. Arsenal yipped at my feet, as if to say it did. Great, as if I didn't have enough to do. Thirteen. I'm sorry, y'all, but I don't have time to save Christmas. I jutted out my hip. I have a store to run, a murder to help solve. What are y'all about? Standing in front of the hearth fire and cooing at it? I'm sure whatever I need to do, it's incredibly easy, and anybody else can do it. I'm busy. Obviously, I was convinced it didn't have to be me. This might be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life, Axel said. I shot him a look that said, really? Betty grabbed Axel's arm. But it can wait, Pepper. It can wait. There's no need to rush. I can look around, see if anyone else might fit the bill. I don't want to tax you. Go to work, sell some animals. I glared at her suspiciously. I think you're stalling, but I don't know why. No, no, she said quickly. I'm not stalling. If there are other things that are more pressing, go do them. Christmas or Magnolia Cove won't collapse in a few hours, I don't think. I rolled my eyes. Now you're guilting me. She waddled up to me and smooshed my cheeks in her palms. Would I guilt you, kid? Yes. She released me from her iron grip. I might, but not this time. Go do stuff, live a little, sell some animals, like I said. I studied her, looking for any crack in her facade, any weakness that suggested she meant otherwise. I saw none. If you're sure, I'm sure. I nodded to Axel. Don't we also want to talk to the Mobley's new neighbors, the Barkers? Axel raked his fingers through his hair and sighed. I want to, but Betty can't watch Familiar Place, not the way she is. Betty backed away. Y'all don't want me in there. I'll probably sell someone a peacock when they need a goldfish. Definitely a problem. As if on cue, 
The front door swung open. My aunts, Mint and Licky, stepped inside. Did we hear someone say that you need help at familiar place? My jaw dropped. Were you eavesdropping? Mint brushed her luscious, wavy hair from her shoulders. Of course we were. We saw the disaster of the candy outside and decided to listen in. Licky smiled proudly. Pepper, we'll be happy to help. The two of us can work at familiar place today, just as long as you need us. You probably won't be that busy this morning. People are sleeping in. Kids are out of school. People are last-minute shopping, Betty grumbled. The place will be packed. Licky took my hands and squeezed them gently. We can help. Trust us. Didn't we make the potion that saved half the town from the Thanksgiving pies gone wrong? That was true. Had it only been a month ago that the town had been dosed with a giving spell that nearly killed them? My, how time did fly. But Licky was right. If it hadn't been for my aunts, things could have gone terribly, terribly wrong then. Maybe they could handle the animals, but then again, maybe not. We used to help Uncle Donovan, Mint said. He showed us how to match folks. We weren't as talented as him, of course, but we were pretty good. I glanced at Betty. I wasn't sure if my face held hope or fear. Probably a mixture of both. My grandmother nodded. They used to help Donovan, it's true. I exhaled a deep shot of air. That at least made me feel better. If Donovan trusted my aunt, surely they could do the job. After all, it would only be for a few hours, right? Surely it would only be that long. What was the worst that could happen? Okay. I pulled the key from my purse and pressed it into Mint's palm. If you need anything, and I mean anything, call me. It's no problem to drop whatever I'm doing to help. Or if anyone asks for me directly, just tell them to come back. Or call me, okay? Mint patted my cheek as if I was a cute but terribly stupid puppy. It'll be fine. Trust us, Pepper. It will all be okay. If you're sure, if you want to back out, do so now. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. This was their last chance. Mint dangled the key. We'll be fine. Do whatever it is you need. We better hurry, Mint. It's time to open. Licky blew me a kiss, and with that, my aunts disappeared in a puff of smoke. My stomach coiled into a cobra. I put on my biggest smile and turned to Axel and Betty. Okay, what do we do first? Turned out first thing was to speak to the Barkers. We have time to teach you how to work the fire. I don't understand why it has to be me. Did it sound like I was complaining? I was. All this witchy responsibility took some getting used to. It was one thing to be the big, familiar matcher in town, quite another to now be in charge of Christmas. No pressure, right? On another subject, it seemed Mrs. Barker was a stay-at-home mom with three kids under five. Poor woman. She looked more frazzled than a college student the first day of sorority rush. Yes, a child climbed up her leg. Mrs. Barker yanked the kid off and dangled the toddler by the arm before gently setting her down. Yes, she repeated. I couldn't speak because another child suddenly appeared over her shoulder. A little girl with a tiara tucked into her blonde curls and sticky red hands crawled up Mrs. Barker's head. What can I do for you? Axel and I watched as a third child, a boy, peered out from between Mrs. Barker's legs. It's the kids, isn't it? She grabbed the little girl who was in the midst of planting her sticky hands in Mrs. Barker's hair. Mrs. Barker placed her gently on the floor. They just learned an appearing spell. I told my husband it was too early, but he didn't listen. I think I was scarred. You have children crawling all over you. Mrs. Barker laughed. So, now that we have that out of the way, how can I help you? Axel stepped up. I'm Axel Rain, a private investigator looking into the Cookie Mobley murder. I was wondering if we could ask you a few questions. Mrs. Barker opened the door wide. Sure, come on in. 
Brittany Barker turned out to be a hostess unfazed by her children. At one point or another, I was pretty sure the kids had scurried across every possible surface during the conversation, even the ceiling. Polly, get down right now or I'll tell your father. I craned my neck to see Polly clamber over the exposed beams of the cottage. Right now, young lady, one, two. Before Brittany had a chance to say three, Polly was on the floor playing with her toys. I swear I'm going to kill her dad when he gets home. They're too young for that kind of spelling. Brittany shook her head. Now, what do you need to know about the Mobleys, other than Cookie was the devil herself? I spit out the mouthful of iced tea Brittany had served us. I hacked into the pit of my elbow. Sorry, sorry. Brittany shoved the end of her blonde ponytail from her shoulder. Honesty is rare these days when it comes to people I know. But life's too short, and some folks are too frustrating. Cookie was one of those. So you had run-ins with her? Axel said. Oh, more than one. She would call us and say the kids were too loud, that she could hear them through the walls, yelling and playing. That's what they were doing. Her stupid little dog howled all day long, but I never complained about that. Not once. But she wouldn't give us a break. Even last Christmas, it was early in the morning, the kids were opening presents, and someone's knocking on our door. It's freaking Cookie Mobley with her black sleep mask shoved onto her forehead, whining that she can't get her beauty rest because of our kids. On Christmas. Who does that? Brittany bit into a chocolate chip cookie. Only the devil does that, I think. Where were you the night of the murder? Axel said. Here, with my husband, who was teaching the appearing spell to the kids. We didn't sign our house up for the tours because... Well, look at it. Toys and paper littered the rug. A toy box in the corner looked like it was trying to vomit out an entire troop of Barbies. No, this house never would have made the Christmas, I mean, holiday tour cut. So no, I didn't have any fond feelings for Cookie, but neither did anyone else. Her husband did, I said quickly. Brittany hitched a brow. Really? Do you know something I don't? Um, well, I shot Axel a pitiful look. He sat back and grinned. Well, do you know something? I rolled my eyes. No, I don't know anything y'all don't. I'm just assuming is all. Never assume anything. Like that your husband won't teach your preschoolers the appearing spell when they're way too young. Brittany peeled a youngster from her leg and pushed the little boy back into the center of the living room. But anyway, she said, Cookie and Ellis used to fight all the time. Like I said, nobody liked Cookie, not even her husband. Axel leaned in. What did they fight about? Brittany chewed another bite of Cookie. I don't know. I guess what anybody fights about, bills, money. But they had plenty of money, I said. Brittany poured a glass of tea. Not from what I understand. One time, I was outside with the kids, who for once were playing quietly. That's when Ellis followed Cookie outside. She was watering the flowers. He waved a sheet of paper in her face and said something like, See, we could use that money now. Where is it? Axel scratched his chin. Where's what? The money? She shrugged. I don't know. They saw me outside, gave each other dirty looks, and took the conversation back in. I didn't find out. Axel rose. Is there anything else you can tell us? Brittany tapped her chin. Not that I can think of. But if I come up with something, I'll let you know. We left, heading back to Axel's rover. Funny how we've all spoken to the women, I said. It will be good to talk to the men. Axel nodded. I'll work on that. Want to work on it together? His gaze slid over to me. What are you suggesting? I paused, confused. Was that a trick question? That we round up the men and talk to them? Oh. Why? What'd you think I meant? Oh, nothing. 
that we work on together things, things we do together. I punched his shoulder gently. I hope you're not being funny. Why would I be funny? I'm not a funny guy. I smiled. My gaze shifted, and I caught my reflection in the rearview mirror. My honey and crimson hair swirled around my face. Brown eyes peeked out from under my bangs, and a smattering of freckles splashed across my nose. I could feel Axel watching me. Why are you staring at me? Oh, I don't know. Maybe because you're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. Stop. Go on, you mean. I giggled. <laughs> yes, go on. He shrugged. No, that's really it. I was thinking how gorgeous you are and how stupid I've been. I squeezed his bicep. You're being too hard on yourself. You're back and trying to fix things. That's all that matters. He shifted as if trying to avoid a hot fire. Yep, trying to fix things. But anyway, his voice changed in tone, which made me think things were about to get very serious. We need to work on you. As much as I want to talk to the husbands, right now we've got to get you to the house and in front of Betty. There are things she must teach you about the fire. I cocked a brow. Right. If I'm going to save Christmas? Axel's lips curled into a delicious smile. That's right. If you're going to save Christmas. We arrived at the cottage. I did my best to ignore the oozing ribbon candy. I wondered what folks around town were saying. Betty Craples lost her touch. Or Christmas ate the Craples. Things along those lines. I entered and found Betty busy in the kitchen whisking eggs. I nearly fell to the floor. Betty hardly ever used the kitchen, and when she did, she certainly didn't do things by hand. What are you doing? What does it look like? I'm cooking. I can't use my magic, so I have to use my regular people skills. For your sake, I hope it works. I stared at the eggs. Me too. I don't need salmonella poisoning. Her chin stiffened. I've never poisoned anyone. Yet. I rolled my eyes. I wasn't sure if that was a threat or an actual hope. Either way, I didn't have time to debate the intricacies of Betty's meaning. Come on, Axel's here. The two of y'all are supposed to help me with this fire. She placed the bowl in the fridge. Is that going to be okay? You don't have to eat it if you're worried, she grumbled. What's it going to be? Red velvet cake. My favorite. I licked my lips. Come on, let's work with Axel. We'd just reached the living room. Axel tussled with Hugo and Arsenal. The three of them looked to be having a great time. I hated to spoil it. Turned out, it wasn't me who did. The front door slammed open. Mint and Licky appeared, their faces white as paper. My heart catapulted into my throat. What is it? The animals. Mint said. It was going so well, and then they... And then they... Panic fueled my thundering heartbeat. What, then, what happened? We were playing with them, Licky said. And then they all got loose. My jaw dropped. All of them? Almost all, Mint admitted. They're running around Magnolia Cove, and we can't catch them. Oh, Lord. As if this day could get any worse. I yanked my jacket from a peg. What are we waiting for? Let's go. Fourteen. Animals scampered down Bubbling Cauldron. Cats meowed that they were finally free. Puppies barked that they could now sniff all the butts they wanted. And birds screeched that it was now possible to poop on heads. In short, it was a disaster. I wanted to tug my hair out one strand at a time as I watched kittens tumble, puppies cavort, and birds dive through town. Stop, y'all! Will all of y'all stop? But none of them listened. In fact, I think I heard a few jeers coming from the critters. I planted my fists on my waist. When I get my hands on y'all, I'm going to take your treats away for a week. A week! Even that didn't stop them. 
I gave Axel a look full of panic. What do we do? He grimaced. I could try a Pied Piper spell, but I've never worked one before. You mean like they'll follow us back to the store? That kind of Pied Piper? Axel nodded. Exactly. You can do it, Pepper. I know you can. I started to close my eyes when sharp barking filled the air. The sound was full, as if the dog's lungs were bellows. The howl the dog released was deep and guttural. I peered over Axel's shoulder to see Arsenal zipping down the road. Within no time, the dog was snapping at kittens, corralling puppies, and barking stinging reprimands to the birds. The animals dropped their heads as if they'd been scolded something fierce, which was funny since I couldn't understand a word Arsenal yelped. As if the dog had a magic bullet up his rear end, he herded the gaggle of animals to the front door of familiar place. I raced to it and held it wide. Within seconds, each and every creature was back. Axel helped the kittens into the cage, while I placed the puppies in the shop window bin. Even the birds came willingly. They roosted back on their perches without one word of complaint. Arsenal sat in the doorway, tail sweeping the floor. His tongue lolled to one side. I patted his head. How'd you do it, boy? The dog stared at me blankly. I wish you could speak. You've probably got the mysteries of the universe locked in your head. As proud as I was of Arsenal, I was pretty ticked at the other critters. Never, not once, had they pulled a stunt like that on me. But the first time I give Mint and Licky a chance to sell them, they up and revolt? What gave? I crossed my arms, jutted out a hip, and glared eyes of fire at the creatures. They meowed and yipped. I cleared my throat so loud I'm pretty sure it was heard on the other side of town. Which one of y'all wants to tell me what happened? We got out. A kitten mewed. I can see that. What happened? The ladies let us. An African gray parrot squawked. I slowly rubbed my lips together. I could feel the tension rising in my body and anger pulsing in my veins. I'm sorry. What did you say? The witches let us out, a puppy yelped. They let us. Axel squeezed my shoulder. I'm sure it's the chaos magic in them. I'm sure it wasn't on purpose. Probably not. I grumbled. No point in being angry. Axel smiled. The corners of his eyes crinkled. When that happened, nothing else mattered. Not my anger at my aunts or anything else. They can't help it. I wove my fingers through my hair. I know. It's just annoying. I slapped my thigh. How much business did they run off? He shrugged. People will return. You didn't lose anything here. I rested my head on his shoulder. If you say so, I do. A slow smile of relief formed on my lips. I think we owe the day to Arsenal. I glanced at the dog. He sat, wagging his tail. I bent down and gave him a well-deserved scratch behind the ears. Not sure why you don't talk, dog. But if you could, I wish you'd tell me what you want. You deserve it. Whatever it is, I'll be glad to get it for you. It's the least I can do. The glint from his collar caught my gaze. Amelia was right. This is pretty. It was a bright baby blue and sparkled like a diamond. Not your everyday tag. A pair of cowboy booted feet filled the frame. I glanced up to see Garrick Young scowling at me. He tipped his hat. Heard there was a ruckus here. Just some animals loose, thanks to Licky and Mint. I've got them back now. He glanced at Arsenal. Is that the Mobley's dog? I swallowed. It is. Axel stepped up. He keeps coming back to her house. You gonna stop a dog from wondering where a dog will wander? Garrick shook his head. Not today, I won't. How's the investigation going? I chirped. You know, the cookie Mobley one? I know which one, Garrick scowled. It's going as well as it's going. I heard rumors that you'll be using prison wraiths, Axel said. Garrick's scowl deepened. 
Alice Mobley used to be a federal witch judge. That means Cookie's murder comes with certain perks. One of those is that a prison wraith can take whoever is deemed to be guilty straight to prison. Are the wraiths meeting about it? Axel said. Garrick's jaw tensed. I don't know. What they do is a mystery to me, but I'm sure they're up to something. Neither man spoke, but the weight of their silence filled the shop. It was thick, reminding me of a cloud descending to earth. Axel and Garrick stared at each other for a full minute before Axel spoke. I hope they decide on the right person. I wasn't planning on allowing them to arrest an innocent, Garrick countered. You don't have a say in it. They bring their own justice. More silence. Finally, Garrick shuffled back. I'll do what I can. There are still more questions to ask, more things to discover. I know, Axel said. Garrick opened his mouth to say something, but then shut it. He dipped his head to me. Pepper, Axel, I'll see both of y'all around. Stay out of trouble. Don't count on it, Axel murmured when Garrick was out of earshot. What gives, I said. Prison wraiths are ghost-like entities, but they're born from evil smudges of magic, not human. They're something else, power distilled from the suffering of others. Sometimes, but not always, they arise from the prison cave to take the guilty party, bypassing Garrick. They bypass him? Is that legal? Very. Axel's jaw tensed. They are the legal system down there. They run it, so whatever they do is law. I rubbed his shoulder. Just because they're coming doesn't mean they'll find Karen guilty and take her. Darkness clouded Axel's features. He gave me a deep look full of sorrow and pain. He quickly recovered, smiling bitterly. Let's hope they don't find her guilty. Why? I mean, other than the obvious point that she's innocent, of course. Why? He hitched a brow. Because if the wraiths find my mom guilty, they'll drag her to the prison, and there'll be no way to free her. I finished up the day at Familiar Place and was able to salvage a few sails. One puppy and two birds left the premises. No thanks to Licky and Mint. I know, I know, it was all my fault. I probably deserved to have my animals scattered into the street, since I'd allowed my ants to watch them in the first place. Funny thing, though, neither one of my ants had called to make sure I'd gotten the animals back under lock and key. Go figure. By the time I arrived back at the house, it was supper time. Amelia and Cordelia had arrived, and the four of us sat around a home-cooked meal of chicken and dumplings. What's wrong with these dumplings? Amelia said. They're all goopy. Watch your language, Betty snapped. I worked all afternoon on those. Cordelia raised her fork. Thick clumps of whitish dough plopped onto the plate. Not your most appetizing meal. Betty rose and grabbed both my cousin's plates. You don't like it. You don't have to eat it. She waddled off to the kitchen. What's wrong with her? Cordelia muttered. Her powers are wonky, I whispered. She's been spelled. Cordelia and Amelia's eyebrows shot to the ceiling. Fear filled Amelia's voice. She has. Yes. And now Pepper has to work with the everlasting fire to make sure Christmas stays intact. Betty waddled back into the room. I frowned. So, I guess you didn't find anybody else who can do whatever needs to be done? Nope. I squinted at her. Did you even try? Nope. Great. Is that why it's getting so cold outside? Cordelia said. Probably one of the reasons, Betty said. Unless you can be the conduit for the Christmas magic, Pepper... Everything I've touched will go wrong. Like, do you mean the snowman might come to life? Amelia sounded excited about that. Let's hope not. That would be worse than the hillbilly giants running through town. Betty scowled. 
And let me remind you, the last time the giants showed up, our town almost got trampled. She wasn't kidding. When the entire town got messed up during Halloween, the hillbilly giants that live just outside town almost destroyed us. Not because we're bad people, but because I wasn't able to keep a promise. Ugh, it was such a mess. Anyway, I figured if a snowman came to life, there'd be two scenarios. Sweet and wonderful Frosty, or the evil Stay Puffed from Ghostbusters. With our luck, we'd end up with Stay Puffed. I sighed. I didn't want Christmas to be ruined. Betty and my family would blame me if that happened, since clearly I was the only person who could save it. I had my doubts, but what other choice did I have? None. I had to do what Betty wanted. Since I don't want Christmas to fall apart, what do I need to do? I said. We need Axel here, since I can't help you. The doorbell rang. I clicked my tongue. Right on time. I opened the door and found Mint and Licky standing on the porch. Oh, I said flatly. It's y'all. Mint reached for me. Pepper, we're so sorry about what happened. Did everything turn out okay? Licky said. We've been so worried. Mint said. Is that why you didn't call? I scowled at them so hard I was surprised I didn't singe their eyebrows. Mint fidgeted. No, that isn't why. We've been busy. There was an important phone call. I fisted a hand to my hip. I was still holding the doorknob and hadn't allowed my aunts to enter yet. Yes, I was barricading them from the house, almost as much as I was bricking them out of my life. Oh, what sort of important phone call? I wasn't buying it for a second. Mint's gaze darted into the house. She met my gaze and lowered her voice. One that involved ghosts of Christmas past. What are you talking about? It was a bunch of baloney. I knew it. Two men, Licky hissed. They glared at me. Oh, I realized what they meant. Cordelia and Amelia's fathers. My aunts had been talking to them. Great news. And are we having any visitors for Christmas? I whispered. No, Mint screeched. Absolutely not. I rolled my eyes. Then why bother calling them? We didn't. Licky snapped. They called us. With that, Mint and Licky shot each other a look that said they wouldn't be telling me any more than that. My aunts could be so annoying at times. Okay, well, thanks to Cookie Mobley's dog, Arsenal, the animals all went back inside. What did he say to them? I heard Amelia shout from the dining table. I turned around. He doesn't talk, at least not to me. I can't hear him. Arsenal and Hugo, newly minted best friends, toppled into the living room, growling playfully at each other. I smiled. I hoped their happiness wouldn't be cut short by the evil Ellis Mobley. Just kidding. I didn't know if he was evil, though I suspected it was a possibility. An SUV rumbled to a stop in front of the house. Axel hopped out and practically raced up the steps. Evening, ladies, he said to Mint and Licky. Mint eyed Axel in a way that almost made me want to fight her. My aunts could look. I didn't blame him. Axel didn't have the nickname Mr. Sexy for no reason. Mint clicked her tongue. Well, since we don't want to make the rooster feel like he's stuck in too much of a hen house, we'll leave. Sounds good, I said cheerfully. Honestly, I was done talking to them for the day or night, maybe for the week. Axel wrapped an arm around my waist. You ready? As I'll ever be. I waved goodbye to my aunts and closed the door. Betty had cleared the rest of dinner from the table. Amelia, Cordelia, the fewer people in this room, the better. We've got serious magic to perform. Amelia huffed. I'm insulted. It's not like we're our moms. Besides, what if we need to know how to do this sometime? It's always better to have more than one person as backup. Betty plucked a wiry hair from under her chin. Just what we need. My grandmother eyed my cousins as if she expected them to steal the china off the table. Fine, 
The two of you can stay, but no sounds, not one word. Fine by me, Amelia said. I'm not sure if I want to stay, Cordelia said. Amelia gaped at her. Fine, I'll stay. With the hair pinched between her fingers, Betty crossed to me. Pepper, I need something of yours, preferably an annoying hair. I stared at the white strand. It reminded me of dental floss. I don't have any of those. And if I did, dear Lord, I wasn't going to mention it in front of Axel. Find one, Betty said. I sighed and plucked a hair from my scalp. The glossy golden line curled at the end. Come to the fire. I followed her over. Axel stood close by. I wasn't sure of his role in this, but I knew it would be revealed soon enough. Betty tossed her hair in. The fire roared like a lion enveloping the entire hearth. She turned to me. With a glint of mischief in her eyes, my grandmother said, Now, throw yours. I took a deep breath and tossed the hair into the fire. Here went nothing. Fifteen. The flames roared as if alive. Tendrils whipped and lashed as if reaching for me. I shrank back. Don't be frightened, Betty said. Speak for yourself, I said. This thing's gone haywire. The fire reminded me of an octopus searching madly for something. Hopefully that something wasn't me. Scorching heat roared in my face. I jerked away. One of the aimlessly searching tentacles coiled around my arm. I screamed. Ah! It won't harm you, Betty called. Axel wrapped his arms around my shoulders. Stay calm. It won't hurt you. I twisted and fought. What the heck were they talking about? It wasn't going to hurt me. It was a fire, Dagnabbit. A raging inferno, heck bent on coiling around me and snuffing the life from my body. I wasn't even thirty years old yet. I hadn't crossed that milestone. The milestone when my body parts started failing. When I started falling apart, when gray hair started sprouting from my head. Wait a minute. Was I sure I even wanted to turn thirty? Yes, absolutely, I was 100% certain that was a milestone to be achieved. As all these thoughts filled my brain, I yanked my arm. But as I pulled back, the fire tugged me forward. Panic clawed at my throat. What does it want? A face pushed up from the flames. It reminded me of a Christmas carol when Jacob Marley's face appears in the doorknob. It does appear in the doorknob, right? You think a lot of strange things when faced with certain death. That's how I felt that my death was inches away staring at me from the flames. The mouth opened. In a grating, grumbling voice, the fire spoke. Yes, girl, it spoke. Who is this? I swear the entire house shook. From behind me, Arsenal whimpered. Or maybe that was Amelia. It was probably Amelia. This is your granddaughter. Betty stepped forward. You need to bond with her. And why would I do that? Boy, was this a cranky old man or what? I'd met some cranksters in my day, but this guy did not like to be disturbed, for real. Because my magic is broken, we need you to bond with her to fix the things I've done. The face peered at me. The tendril pulled me closer until my nose was inches from it. You have the magic? Was that a trick question? I have some. Bah, some. I swear the fire spat. Some isn't enough to control me, to house me, to wield me. Uh, I guess so. I sounded pathetic. The words crawled from my throat in a quivering whisper. The fire released me. I rubbed my arm. The face dissolved into the flames. Bring me a worthy granddaughter. Take this one back to where you found her. What the heck? Who did this guy think he was? If there was one thing that ticked me off, it was a person insulting my capabilities. When I first arrived in Magnolia Cove, I wouldn't have cared. I would have said, that's fine by me. Get me the heck out of this scary, witchy place. 
but that wasn't me anymore. Now I had some confidence. I wasn't the most capable person when it came to using my powers, but I could work some magic, push bad people away, do other stuff. But the fact that this ancient fire seemed to think it knew best really got my panties in a wad. I was just one bite of banana pudding away from having an all-out hissy going on conniption fit. I was about to be wide open, and I don't mean wide open in the sense that I'm a three-year-old running wild. No, I mean wide open in the sense that I was open to losing it on great-great-great-or-whatever-granddaddy stuck in a stupid old fire. Excuse me, I bellowed. The face snapped, too. A faint hint of a smile curled on his flaming lips. He was going to find out what Pepper Dunn was made of. What exactly do you mean? Are you saying I'm not worthy? You guess you have the magic. You must know. You must own it. Or else my power will destroy you. Oh, well, was that all? Listen, buddy, I can handle whatever you've got. I leaned in until my nose was nearly touching his. I'm a head witch. A head witch with little confidence. His gaze swept to Betty. I've never seen such a thing in all my life. I've got confidence, sir, I argued. I've got confidence up to the ceiling. Prove it. Was that a challenge? I thrust out my wrists. Lash your little fire tentacles onto me. I can handle whatever you've got. I'm made of steel. He cackled. When you should be made of putty. I blinked. Sorry, what? The fire swooshed and churned, tightening into a coil. You must be made of putty. You must be pliable. Even steel under too much pressure will crack and break. I shrugged. Okay, I'll be putty then. The fire kicked up from the coals. I lurched back. It crested at the ceiling and shot down, stopping inches from my face. Are you ready then, Pepper Dunn, to take on the everlasting fire? Once we are joined, you can leave, but I will always be a part of you. You're not going to be weird and say things in my head, are you? Because I don't need to wonder if I'm schizophrenic or anything like that. Silence! The fire roared. Okay, I whimpered. Wait. I wasn't afraid of him. If Betty could handle the flames, so could I. I cleared my throat. Okay, I'm ready. Let's begin. No, let's end, he said. Why do I even bother? I raked my fingers through my hair in frustration. You just say the opposite of everything I do. Whatever, let's end. No idea what that means, but I'm ready to go for it. In a flash... The fire coiled around me, squeezing me like a cobra. I sucked in air. The fire constricted. It wasn't hot. It wasn't cold. It simply was. A finger of flame rose. It whipped back, reminding me of a head snapping up. In one fluid movement, flowing like mercury, the finger lashed out and pierced my chest. I sucked a mouthful of air and bowed back. Whereas the fire didn't hurt, this did. Like, intensely. It felt like a needle had been rammed directly into my chest and was pumping me full of white, hot flames. There was no going back. I understood exactly what the fire had meant when it said we were ending instead of beginning. There was no start to the pain or the heat. We were at the end. I felt like I was ending. The fire spun me. I could see Axel and my family. They looked on, fear and suspicion filling their faces, except for Betty, of course. She simply looked proud. Now we are joined, the fire said. You can access my power. It is the power of centuries. Stupid question I knew, but I needed an answer. How do I use you? I cannot answer that question. It is for you to learn. Great. Was this thing kidding? 
I'm going to pierce your heart with my flame of power, but I'm not going to instruct you on how to use said flame. Brilliant. Do you feel me? It was an odd question, and I inwardly chuckled because of how stupid it was. Of course I felt it. I thought I was going to die from pain. However, the magic within the flame connected me to the magical world in a way I'd never experienced. It was like I was a single shining star. Sprouting from my hands and feet were thin, web-like strings that connected me to the rest of the magical world. I could analyze magic differently, deconstruct it, reimagine it in a way that was mind-blowing. It was like looking at a pointless painting. I could see every individual dot and understand the construct in a deeper, more meaningful way. That's what he meant by the ending. I didn't see beginnings. I only witnessed endings, the very pinnacle or last piece of a puzzle shifting into place. Magic made sense in a new way, like a brilliantly shining star, exploding from my chest and igniting me with information that could explain the very moment time began. As quickly as it all started, or ended, rather, the flood of information stopped. I was dropped to the ground. I landed on my rump with a thud that zipped up my spine and made my jaw ache. Axel's strong arms wove around me. Are you okay? He hauled me to my feet. Ah, sore, I croaked, rubbing my rear. Very sore. My fingertips brushed his skin. His flesh felt different under the pads of my fingers. It felt alive, as if I was touching every cell individually and not the whole of him. I rocked back. Even that small movement was magnified. My head swam as my body pitched. Betty rested a hand on my shoulder. Slow down. All of this takes time to get used to. The effects of the fire will wear off in a few minutes. For now, go slowly. I don't understand any of this. The surprise quickly turned to anger. Why didn't you tell me what would happen? That the fire would lift me up and poke my heart? Betty shoved her corncob pipe between her lips and lit it with a match. Because you never would have done it otherwise, now would you? You go around telling folks they're going to be wrapped up in flames and poked by a fire that has a heart in its center, and they think you're crazy. You are crazy, Amelia said from the other side of the room. But, Pepper, I have to tell you, that looked really cool. Very amazing. I wish I could have done it. A hopeful smile flashed across her face. Can I? No, Betty snapped. Two hearts is the most the fire can be in at two times. I wrung out my ear. The fire is in me? Is that what you're saying? You sure are quick, Betty said. Axel squeezed my shoulder. It felt like I was being juiced. Not that he was doing it hard, but I was so raw I felt like my nerve endings were exposed. The fire that lives in the hearth is old magic. When your grandfather died, a spell was created that placed his heart, his life force, within this very fire. Shock slapped me across the face. Axel? You knew all this? Only what Betty and Donovan had shared with me. Not everyone knows, Betty said. I didn't know. Amelia raised her hand. That's because you'd tell everybody, Cordelia said. Would not, Cordelia glared at her. Okay, I might, Amelia admitted. But only because it's really cool and not because I would be trying to sabotage anything. Anyway, I said, directing the conversation back. So the fire literally contains a dead man's heart? Yep, Betty said proudly. Your grandfather's. I protect it. The heart has been in the family for generations, as I've said. Its power is strong. Now it's in you. You must wield this power and hone it in order to keep Christmas stable. I shook my head. I don't understand, 
If it's so magical, why does it need me? It needs a host to direct the power through. Usually that's me. But since my magic's broken, and until we find the solution, you're the conduit. Okay, I said slowly. But I still don't understand. What's so special about the heart, other than the fact that it's a dead ancestor's? Because, Betty said slowly, the heart in this hearth is what makes Magnolia Cove magical. The prophecy pools, the conjuring caverns, even the prison beneath the town, none of it would exist without this heart. If anything ever happened to it, Magnolia Cove would cease to exist. 16. What? This fire is the reason our town exists? Yep, Betty said. This fire has gone through many hands, but it has always remained with our family. It's not only the heart of this home, it's the heart of the town. Betty pulled the pipe from her mouth and chewed her bottom lip. I don't want more on you than necessary, kids. Trust me, I don't. But a powerful witch must be in control of the fire at all times. Everything's now riding on you. No pressure. What do I do? Run and hide under a bridge and never come out? What if something happened and I lost the power or it got stolen? You don't have to do anything, Betty said. Just be. Be, and the power will live inside you. Okay, I'll just be. So, what about the rest of it? Like the candy on the house, can I fix that? Betty glanced at Axel. He stood, arms crossed, with his thumb tracing his chin. The candy? I don't know. It was Betty's spell. We've got one heart and a house that might be swallowed by peppermint. We need a way to stabilize the cottage, at the very least. And the cold, Amelia said. It's getting colder every day out there. If we don't hurry, we'll end up freezing like popsicles. I crossed to the door and opened it. A frigid blast of air cut straight through me. She's right, it's getting worse. But since I've got the power of the heart or whatever, will that right itself? Betty frowned. It should. It should work that way. I say we give it a few minutes and see if it changes. And if it doesn't, I said, then we might have a problem, Betty admitted. Axel threaded his fingers through his hair. My mom is great at elemental magic. She might be able to help. That's if she doesn't get arrested, Amelia said. Cordelia kicked her. What? Amelia's gaze flickered around the room until it landed on Axel. Her face crimsoned. Oh, sorry. That is another problem we have. Axel glanced at Betty. Garrick said the prison wraiths might make the arrest. For the first time since I'd met her, Betty paled. She quickly righted herself and glanced at me. Okay, kid. For the first few days, you'll feel different, and you will be more powerful. But after that, everything will sort of slough off. You'll go back to normal. Why's that? It's your body acclimating to the new power. Completely normal. Don't forget, you are the conduit for the heart to create Magnolia Cove. Use your power wisely. Being connected to the heart will give you a boost but the connection mainly exists to keep our town the way it is. Magical. A warm bubble of happiness filled me. Of all her granddaughters, Betty had trusted me with the heart. Of course, that could be because the heart was a crusty old man, and out of the three of us, I was the only one who wouldn't kick him in the face. I mean, Cordelia probably would have already. So, that's it? I said. Betty shrugged. Pretty much. The fire knows things and may be able to help you if you get stuck on certain problems. All you have to do is ask, and it will help. I scoffed. Right, that's if I want my head chopped off. I glanced at Axel. Should we go talk to your mother? He held a jacket for me to slip into. As always, the man was one step ahead. Let's go. When we reached Axel's house, his mom had dinner on the table. 
the four of us sat and enjoyed a simple meal of spaghetti and meatballs. The real meal is in a couple of days, Karen said. Tomorrow, I've got to start preparing. She turned to me. What are you doing tomorrow, Pepper? I forked a meatball. I'll be open half the day at the store. Her face lit up under a million-watt smile. Well, then, you must come with me to the Christmas market in town. I hear Magnolia Cove has the most wonderful Christmas market. I quirked a brow. Will wonders never cease. I didn't know anything about that. Axel swiped a napkin down his mouth. We have a Christmas market. Which was great, because I still didn't have a present for him. Well... Karen said slowly, I tell you what, why don't we walk around tomorrow afternoon and have a great time of it? Sounds good. I chewed a big beefy bite of meatball. I almost moaned from the savory flavor. So, Axel and I were wondering something. She quirked a brow. When a good time is to get married, I can consult my tarot cards. Axel coughed. I was pretty sure I turned purple. No, he said, recovering. The temperature keeps dropping. It's about 20 degrees out there. When I've checked the weather, the temp's not supposed to be that low. Ah, she said. You think something magical is going on? We do, I admitted. At first, we thought it was connected to Betty Crapel's power, which is officially broken, but we don't know why. But now we think it's a separate event. Can you help us fix it, Mom? Even though his voice wasn't pleading, Axel's eyes were. He was a powerful wizard, but even some things were beyond him, like the weather. I'll be happy to. She leaned over and squeezed Roger's shoulder. Care to help with this? I could use all I can get. Roger beamed. No one's better than your mother when it comes to atmospheric spelling. No one. She's better at it than most wizards. Thanks, Dad, Axel said, his voice teasing. Aw, oh, son, you know you're a fantastic wizard. No one's taking that from you. Something dark flashed across Axel's face. Was there something I didn't know about him? Probably there was an entire world I didn't know about Axel, but this seemed to be something more, some sort of secret. Axel clapped his hands. Mom, that was great. Now, who's ready for dessert? A little while later, Axel drove me home. He'd taken a detour at the prophecy pools. We sat in the idling rover, watching the sparkling waters. So, how do you feel? He turned toward me. Now that you've got the heart fire in you. I glanced at my fingers. It's strange. I almost feel as if I could do anything. Bend the glass in the window. My jaw dropped. I don't know if I could do that. You can. Just believe. I rolled my eyes. I'll try, but only because you're asking. Just don't shatter it. Mending glass isn't my specialty. I laughed at the curling smile on his face. I pressed my fingertips to the frigid surface. We really are going to be frozen unless we do something about this weather. People won't know how to act. He chuckled. It is the South. Even a hint of cold and folks go into hibernation. I winked at him. Yet there are still people who wear flip-flops, no matter the weather. He laughed. That is true. It was. It could be 30 degrees and you'd see people in shorts and flip-flops. You're avoiding the task? He gently prodded. I sighed. Okay, okay, bend glass, bend a spoon, pretend I'm Neo in the Matrix and jump into one of those agent guys. I never said that part. I tipped my head back and laughed. Our gazes cemented, and I felt the weight of his presence like a boulder pressing on my chest. I swallowed a knot in my throat and focused on the window. I touched the pads of my fingers to the smooth surface. I closed my eyes and thought about it bending, pulling toward me. A low rumble filled the car. My fingers snapped back. I gasped as my eyelids fluttered open. Axel whistled. Impressive. The glass had bowed inward, exactly as Axel had asked for it. It wasn't too deep, not enough to shatter. It had worked. 
That is so cool. I couldn't hide the elation from my voice. Wow, do you think I could make a tree bend? I wouldn't push it. Axel tipped his head toward me. See if you can press your finger through it. You're kidding. I shifted closer to him. Suddenly, the cab filled with the heady aroma of leather, coffee, and pine. I wanted to swim in Axel's scent. I am definitely not kidding. He blew warm air into his cupped hands and rubbed them. Press your finger through, but you have to keep your eyes open. No fair. I love doing magic with my eyes closed. You'll do better if they're open. I scoffed. Says you. But I smiled. Axel was all business. Your finger. I rolled my eyes but did as he said, gently pressing my finger into the hard surface. It's not working. That's because you don't believe. You have to see your finger do it. What if my finger gets stuck and the glass ends up cutting it off? Way to see the positive. I punched his shoulder lightly. In one sweeping motion, Axel cupped my face and dragged my lips against his. The kiss was deep, making me tingle all the way to my toes. I lost myself. I swear I heard him in my head. You can do it, Pepper. But I'm so worried. Get over it. When he released me, Axel pointed me toward the glass. Go for it. Apparently all I needed was a good smack in the right direction. Without overanalyzing it, I poked my finger through the solid sheet. Oh, dear Lord, I'm doing it. It felt like I was moving through brick or stone. It was solid, but gave with enough pressure. Before something bad happened, I pulled my finger out. See? You could do it. Axel smiled widely. Now fix the glass. I managed that easily. When it was done, I sank back and sighed. If only I could work this sort of magic without the fire burning brightly inside me. You can. You know that. I groaned and sank onto the seat. Not this discussion again. You're a head witch. The only thing that limits you is your mind. I know, I know. Great. If you know so much, we can head back to your house. I didn't say I knew everything. I grumbled. But there is something I'd like to know. Axel put the SUV into drive. And that is? What would you like for Christmas? He shook his head. Nothing. Don't bother getting me anything. I have to get you something. He shrugged. Why? I didn't get you anything. I mean, I just returned, Pepper. We're back, but we need to go slow, figure things out so that I don't screw it up again. You're not getting me anything for Christmas? The look of surprise on his face shocked me. No. Am I supposed to? What? Axel wasn't getting me anything for Christmas? How could he not give me a present? Why wouldn't he get me a present? What was wrong with him? Well, I wasn't going to let his stupidity stop me. I would get him a present. I would get him the best present ever, and then he would feel terrible for not getting me anything. And he should feel terrible, because after all he'd put me through, I deserved something awesome, like diamonds. Okay, maybe not diamonds, but still, something awesome. I decided to cover my tracks with my infinite smartness. Oh, no, you don't have to get me anything. I don't want anything. That's great. Now I don't have to worry about getting you anything. Perfect. You know, since I hadn't bought you one. I thought so, too. He sighed. It's good to just relax into us, not worry about all that other commercial stuff, don't you think? Sure, I think it's great. Let's just focus on the holiday, on spending it together, and not worry about all that other stuff. He stretched his arm and pulled me toward him. I wanted to bite his nose and not in a coy way. I wanted to sink my teeth into his flesh like a werewolf. But I didn't. I smiled and grinned and decided I would get him the best Christmas present ever just to show him what the holiday means to me. We reached the cottage and said our goodnights. I gave him a quick kiss. I didn't exactly want him to know I was ticked, but I also wanted him to know I was ticked. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? When you're mad and want the other person to know, but you also don't want them to know? Anyway, that's what I did. 
I waved as he drove off and tried not to think about my bruised ego too much. The best way to get over hurt is to just go ahead and shove it aside, I always think. So, that's what I did. I was about to climb the porch steps when a horrible creaking sound came from above. I peered into the dark sky in time to see a dripping candy ribbon crash in front of me. The house rumbled and creaked. The front door flew open. Betty, Cordelia, and Amelia rushed outside. What's going on? Another line of ribbon slopped to the ground like a slug. The ribbon, Betty yelled. It's breaking and taking the house with it. I shoved up my sleeves and narrowed my gaze. Not if I can help it, it's not. 17. If we don't do something fast, the house will be in trouble, Amelia said. The heart, Betty croaked. It can't be moved without magic. I flashed her a look of fear. Do you think the house will crush it? She worried her bottom lip. I don't think it will destroy the heart, no, but it could hurt it. Betty yanked my arms and pulled me down to eye level. Pepper, I can't do anything to stop this, not me. But you, you may be our only hope. I swallowed a knot the size of Kansas. Once again, no pressure. No pressure to save Magnolia Cove. No pressure to save Christmas. Heck, why doesn't someone pop out and say, It's time to save the world, Pepper. It's time to save the world, Pepper, Betty said. I rolled my eyes. Quit raiding my mind or being melodramatic. Okay, Betty admitted, but you've got to hurry. I can't stop it even though I created it. I glanced at Cordelia. My cousin strode forward. I'll help. Amelia stepped over a pile of gooey candy. Me too. What else are sweet tea witches for? I extended my hands. My cousins clasped mine. In order to do this, I would have to tap into the power of the fire. There was no way around it. The peppermint mess had been a spell Betty created. I couldn't wipe out the ribbon with the bottomless bag, so I had to find another way. The other way was straight through the heart. I searched and poked, prodded, and felt deep within me. Quietly burning like a pilot light lay the flame. I fueled it, forcing it to flame bright. The power unfolded like a flower. Since my hands were locked in my cousin's, I couldn't break free to wield magic from my palms. Instead, I did something completely strange, yet second nature. I thrust out my chest, basically aiming my heart at the house. The ribbon's response sent an earth-shattering quake snaking to my feet. The ribbon recoiled as if it had been touched with white-hot flames. It lashed into the sky as if searching for a foothold. It reared and bucked. It didn't want to do what I wanted, but I wasn't going to let it stay. Go. Vanish. The red and white gooey ribbon whipped up, lifting high. The sound was hideous, creaking and crackling on an epic scale. I gave it one more burst of power and the ribbon disappeared in a flash of light. I exhaled. My hands slipped from Cordelia and Amelia's. My knees shook. So much power. So much absolute raw power existed in the ancient fire. It was good that much of magic didn't hang around for a long time in someone's body. What you could do with it was mind-boggling, and I hadn't even tapped into it fully. Pepper! Amelia flung her arms around me. That was awesome. You did great. Wow! Yeah, Cordelia high-fived me. So amazing. I'm really impressed. Betty came up last. She wrapped me in a hug. I'm proud of you, kid. Time you started smoking a pipe. Wait, what? Why would you say that? She released me. I swear a tear tried to squeeze from her eye. She knuckled it away when she thought I wasn't looking. All the eldest crapo women smoke a pipe. 
helps with the magic. That's because you smoke wacky tobacco, Amelia said. Betty glared at her. I do no such thing. I smoke regular witch tobacco, that's all. She gave them the evil eye for a few more seconds before turning to me. Come on, kid. Let's go inside and get you some hot cocoa. Sugar always helps after you work powerful magic. We went inside. I couldn't help but glance at the fire as I made my way into the kitchen. It roared heartily, and I swore the image of a pair of smiling lips emerged from the flames. The next afternoon, Karen met me at familiar place. Arsenal had followed me to the shop, which I took as a compliment, even though Amelia was the person officially looking after him. Ready to do some shopping? Karen beamed. Absolutely. If you don't mind us having a doggy tag along. Her gaze flickered to Arsenal. Is that Cookie's dog? Yep. The dog's been staying with us these past few days. Alice Mobley took him home once, but he returned. I guess he likes it better at our house. She leaned over conspiratorially. Who could blame him? We walked down Bubbling Cauldron toward the temporary shops that had been set up. I couldn't help but smile at the red and white striped tent tops. Something about Christmas just made me cheery. Maybe it was because everyone else was smiling. But I think it was simply that Christmas had a power of its own. One that made my heart happy. The tents had been placed in front of the snowmen and creatures. A line of folks wove from the wishing hat. With pen and paper in hand, they were hoping to have their Christmas wishes granted. It was, after all, only a couple of days away. Snow fell from the sky, adding to the ambiance. It was chilly, though the sun was keeping much of the bite from the cold. What are you shopping for? I said to Karen. Something else for Roger. You? I eyed a tent selling small dragon sculptures. I need something for Axel. I haven't gotten him anything. Always difficult to buy for him. He never needs anything. And if he wants it, well, he's a wizard. He can have whatever it is his heart desires. She linked her arm through mine. I know firsthand that all his heart desires is you. Hate rose in my cheeks. It was embarrassing talking about your boyfriend to your boyfriend's mom. I decided to change the subject. What about the weather? Have you had a chance to decipher it? She slid her tongue out. It's a spell, for sure. I know that much. It's complicated. Lots of inner workings, sort of like a clock. A spell? I glanced around suspiciously. Who would cast a spell that would make it frigid? At night, the temperature is really dropping. She closed her eyes. It's almost as if the person who cast the spell needs something to happen in order for it to stop. I'll have to keep concentrating on it. Oh, look at those wizard bands. We came to a kiosk that had rows of tooled leather cuffs. What are these? Karen said. The leather worker, a thin man with dry skin and bright blue eyes, cackled. All kinds of wizard bands here. Ones that focus power, others that protect against evil. He leaned over as if sharing a deep secret. I've also got some that will help you connect with animals. Matching pairs. My eyebrows shot up. Connect with animals? The man grinned. That's what they do. Would the bands help Axel and I connect? I know it was probably a lost cause trying to stay tied to him when he was a werewolf, but I wasn't a quitter, no sir. How does it work? You need two sets. The tinker retrieved two sets of cuffs. Images of the moon and sun had been burned into them. One for you and one for the creature. Do you think it would work on any animal, even a feral one? He winked. Those work the best. I tried not to smile, not to let him know I was too interested. Didn't want to be taken advantage of, you know. How much? We haggled on the price, and in the end we found a happy medium. 
I'll take them, I said. I made my purchase, and Karen smiled. You know, having boys was wonderful. I wouldn't trade it for anything, but to have a girl would have been my dream. There's simply something special about girl time. Shopping, laughing, all of it. All Karen had ever wanted was daughters, and she ended up with two werewolf boys. I snaked an arm through hers and smiled. I never had a mother. She died when I was born. Karen's eyes shone brightly. Then we're two of a pair, I would think. Me too. Our nice moment was broken when Ellis Mobley's voice pierced the air. And keep your kids out of my trees. They're bending the branches. I glanced over to see Brittany Barker, children in tow, being accosted by Ellis. Your brats are ruining my yard. Mrs. Barker thrust a finger in his face. Ellis Mobley, you are a nasty person. I'm surprised when Cookie was killed that you didn't get it too. Everyone gasped like literally the entire crowd. I mean, it was one thing to think it, but another to say it. And don't think the whole town wasn't thinking it. You are a horrible man, picking on children at Christmas. Well, I haven't made my wish yet. She raised a slip of paper. But you can guess what it's going to be. She shot Ellis a look full of poison darts. With her finger, Mrs. Barker scribbled a volume of text onto a strip of paper. She held it in her fingers and blew a kiss. The paper fluttered into the sky, sailing past the line of folks waiting to drop their wishes. The sheet rose higher and higher until it dropped straight down and landed in the hat. I won't tell you what I wished for, Mrs. Barker threatened. All I will say is that I pray it comes true. With that, she stormed off, dragging a zigzagging line of children behind her. Well, that was something, I said. Sure was, Karen said. Now, let me take a look at those cuffs. I held them out. Do you think they'll help Axel and me connect? She traced her fingers over the leather. The symbols for animals and speak are on there, as well as the sun and moon. That's good, since he's a moon animal. It's possible. The man you bought them from is a well-known leather tooler with symbols. He's excellent. Her words filled me with hope. I hugged the bands and placed them in my purse. A scream split the air. It came from the other side of the Christmas market. My eyes flared when I realized what it was. A dark shadow traced its way over the tents. It looked like an inky black spot on the bright red stripes. Panic scrambled up my throat as I realized exactly what I was watching. The thing was a prison wraith, and it was headed straight for us. Eighteen. The black thing was no more than a shadow. It zipped from surface to surface, darker than the inkiest of blacks. It was shaped human-like, if that human happened to be wearing a cape. I could make out the definite outline of a head and shoulders, but the rest of it resembled a blot. The creature wanted to suck my very soul. I don't know how I knew that. It wasn't like anyone was saying, Look, a prison wraith, run for your life. But an incredibly cold feeling, like I was encased in a popsicle, spread over my skin. Of course, that could have been the dropping temperatures as well. When I stared at the shadow, a shard of ice pierced my heart. That's when I knew that inside the wraith, there was nothing but dark dread. The very heart of the creature itself was a lump of stone that no true human emotion could penetrate. Looking on it was like staring into death, a cold, dark place void of love and hope. As hopelessness filled me, the shadow slinked toward us. I was frozen, cemented to the ground. I couldn't move. I couldn't even blink. All I mustered was the ability to watch as the blot swept up to us and placed itself at Karen's feet. 
It wanted her. This was what we'd been fearing, that the Wraith would take her without Garrick finding the real killer. The shadow peeled up from the ground and stretched. It was like looking at a two-dimensional drawing. There was no depth to it. Only the blackness existed. And the cold kept on getting colder. The thing unfolded its body like wings. It was going to take Karen. Once she was gone, there was no bringing her back. The shock, the absolute terror of witnessing such a horrific being in my town, finally pushed me from my trance. This stupid prison wraith couldn't have Axel's mom. Who was it kidding? There was no way in all of creation that I would let this happen. But did I have the power to stop it? The fire still burned bright inside me. The power coiled and turned. It was mine for wielding. I pushed Karen aside. No, I seemed to hear her yell. She was like a dream, a figment in the back of my mind. Once I stepped in the wraith's path, everything changed. My heart was being pulled from me. The thing wanted to drag me down to the depths of the prison by yanking me by the heart. My ribcage felt like it would explode. The pressure clouded my mind. I was underwater. I was drowning. I had to get my head on straight. Something in me snapped. I don't know if it was the heart fire making contact with such a lifeless being. I don't know if it was me finally waking up. I don't know if it was the wraith trying to exert more dominion. All I knew was that it felt like my heart cracked open and released a dragon's breath full of magic straight into the creature. The shadow stumbled. It righted itself. A violent hiss escaped its body, for lack of a better word, even though it seemed more inky blob than defined shape. The creature stopped, seemed to regard me in a way that suggested I'd ticked it off. Yay me. The creature darkened, as if it could pull on the evil in the air. Not that the thing was evil, it was more like a buzzard, simply doing what was in its nature to do. Buzzards dispose of the dead... The prison wraith took the guilty to the caverns. It was only doing a job. That single thought shifted me. I was only doing a job as well. I was protecting Karen from a creature that had been sent unjustly to fetch her. At Christmas, of all times. For goodness sake, were these prison thingies not southerners? That was simply bad manners to ruin someone's holiday. This sucker didn't even ask if she was guilty. In my heart, I knew a wraith couldn't be argued with. It couldn't be spoken to logically. This thing had a job to do, and it was going to do it. Well, I had a job as well. I reared back and tapped into the heart power. Magic spewed into the wraith, sending it crashing to the ground. I knew people were watching, their stares burned into me, but I had to send this thing back to prison. I opened my mouth and screamed. A well of fire spewed from my chest, wrapping around the creature and lifting it into the air. The wraith struggled. Its body pushed and widened as it fought. You will get the heck out of here, I yelled. You will get on out of here and not come back. I didn't know if it would work, but it was worth a shot. The coil of magic shot out, launching the wraith across town back to where it had come from. The burst of power I felt suddenly overcame me. My head felt light. My body felt like a dried husk. A heavy husk. I couldn't keep upright. I crumpled to my knees. Karen's arms flew around me. Pepper? Are you okay? Pepper. I think I said yes. Some words stumbled from my lips, but I didn't know what they were. They weren't a part of me. I was floating on a sea. The world around me seemed far away. So very far. A face snapped into view. A thin, angry face that instantly revived me. 
Alice Mobley frowned deeply. You just obstructed justice for the first and only time, Miss Dunn. That wraith was here to carry out the law. It's illegal to stand between it and the person it's capturing. Sudden and surprising rage filled me from toes to fingers. I rose, my hands clenched, my jaw tight. And how do you know, Ellis Mobley, that the wraith wasn't here to nab you? Panic shone in his eyes. His jaw dropped and Ellis's gaze darted back and forth. Why, how dare you? How dare you stand here and insinuate that I'm the person who killed my wife, you, you... He glanced at Arsenal. You dog snatcher. That was it. I was a breath away from landing a sucker punch right to this guy's chin. How dare he? First of all, you don't know who's guilty of murdering your wife, but I can tell you it isn't this woman. I pointed at Karen. Secondly, if your little doggy wanted to live with you, I'm sure he would. I'm sure he would have gone home with you the other night and stayed. Stayed. But he didn't. Arsenal followed us home because apparently the dog knows when he's welcome and when he's not. But if you want to take him, go ahead. Be my guest. Take this little dog and see if he stays at your house. I folded my arms and sank onto one hip. I gave Ellis Mobley the smuggest smile I could muster. Because I guarantee that within a few nights, Arsenal will be back. He'll be at my house, sitting in my lap, eating treats from my hand. The air was sucked from the Christmas market. All eyes were on me. If this had been high school, a ring would have formed and folks would have been shouting, Fight! 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 But as it was the civilized world and Christmas, no one did that. It was too bad. I was kind of hoping they would. Alice's face turned the color of snow, snow he was standing on, no less. He snatched Arsenal from the ground and raised his hand as if to swap me away. Thank you, Miss Dunn, but I will be taking my dog and leaving. The sheriff will be hearing about this little occurrence today. Good. I shouted quickly. Great! Bring him on! Be sure to watch your dog, Ellis! Ellis didn't bother to turn around. He kept right on walking until he vanished from sight. I shot Karen a wide smile. So, you want to keep shopping? I don't think any more prison raids will be coming for you. I blew the tips of my fingers. At least, not today. Karen and I shopped until we dropped. As soon as I stepped inside the house, Amelia accosted me. Oh, my God, is it true? I dropped my bags by the hearth and plopped onto the couch. Is what true? Cordelia entered from the kitchen. The fact that you faced down a prison wraith and won? I yanked off my boots and let them fall with a thud to the floor. It is, but I couldn't have done it without the fire. My cousins exchanged a glance. I'm serious. I couldn't have done it without it. You should have seen the thing, black as night and soulless. Amelia's eyes widened with fright. She gulped. Soulless? Soulless. It probably steals souls on its days away from the prison. It doesn't steal souls. Betty appeared and set the table. They're horrible, that's true, but they don't steal souls. Anyway, Amelia sat across from me. The whole town's talking about it. They should be talking about why it's so freaking cold only in Magnolia Cove and not the rest of the state. Cordelia grabbed a log and laid it on the fire. It's even cold in here. Temperature's dropping, Betty said. I rubbed my aching feet. Karen said the cold is a spell. Betty waddled up. What kind of spell? I don't know, but it's something. I paused. You don't think it's related to your powers being all wonky, do you? Betty stroked her chin. Hard to say. Who cares about the temperature? Amelia leaned over, her eyes wide with wonder. I want to know more about the wraith. There's not much to tell. The fire helped me send it back, that's all. It was coming for Karen, which reminds me, we need to get it together.
If it came for her once, it'll come back. I can't protect her forever. Oh, and Ellis Mobley took Arsenal back. He also said he was going to call Garrick on me, so if we're going to help Karen, we need to hurry. Betty broke a handful of dried herbs from the stalks about the hearth. Karen is a nature witch, is that right? I shrugged. I really don't know. I don't know why I didn't think of it before. She tossed the herbs into the flames. The fire burned bright blue. Even if she's not a nature witch, she might be an elemental witch. Cordelia pulled her long blonde hair over one shoulder and started braiding it. What's that have to do with anything? Well, one nature or elemental witch would recognize a spell placed on the atmosphere, a spell more than likely cast by another elemental witch. Who's the other elemental witch? Amelia hugged a pillow to her chest. Betty's eyes twinkled with secret knowledge. Can't you guess? No, I said. Just tell us. The only other elemental witch I know of was Cookie Mobley. The room stilled. My cousins and I exchanged loaded looks. Cookie Mobley? I finally said. Betty nodded. That's right. Cookie was an elemental witch. Her powers worked with the elements. She couldn't control them, but she could weave her power through the weather, let's say, or through water if she had to. So you think the cold was caused by Cookie? Amelia said. No, I said, suddenly realizing what Betty meant. The drop wasn't caused by Cookie, but by her death. Bingo, Betty said which means there might be a way to fix it in Cookie's house. The four of us continued to stare at each other. I yanked on my boots. What are we waiting for? Let's get over there. 19. I'm going into Ellis Mobley's house, and I need your help. The phone was perched at my ear, and even though the wind howled outside the car, Axel's booming voice came through loud and clear. I'm sorry. I think I heard you wrong. It sounded like you said you were about to break and enter Ellis Mobley's house. That's exactly what I said. I think he's out. Betty called the house and no one answered. And what exactly makes you think this is a good idea? Betty said... Cookie Mobley was an elemental witch or something. Your mom said the cold weather we're experiencing is a spell. Cookie Mobley might have cast the spell or, and this is what I think, the spell was cast when she died. Like it's a warning? Or a clue, I said proudly. Just think about it. What if the cold is a symbol of who murdered her? We could get your mom off the hook for this much faster. I called you earlier, he said. Sorry, the phone didn't ring. It's okay. I just wanted to thank you for saving her from the prison wraith. But I haven't, Axel, that's the thing. The prison wraith will be coming back. It'll have to. It didn't get what it wanted. Your mom. We need to get inside that house. I don't know what I'm looking for, but you do. You know what it is we need. The temperatures aren't going to warm up until we break this thing. By that time, we might all be dead from cold. I doubt that. We can always move to the Caribbean. You know what I mean. I do, he sighed. There's no way I'm going to talk you out of this, is there? No, nope, it's all been decided. You can at least get arrested with me if Garrick shows up. Ah, the best way to spend the holidays. Stuck in a jail cell, playing harmonica. Oh, great. You already know how to play it. Perfect. He chuckled. I'll be there in ten minutes. I almost danced with joy. But Pepper. Yes? No one else goes in except you and me. If there are dark spells on the house, spells that only a wizard can break, I can't be distracted by anyone else. Fine. My cousins will keep watch, along with Betty. Betty? Great. 
If anything happens in there to you, I'll be castrated by a short woman who smokes a pipe, just what I always wanted. I laughed. Let's pray it doesn't come to that. Hurry. Why? We're already here. I hung up to him protesting about the fact that we were outside the house. Oh, well, it couldn't be helped. As much as Amelia and Cordelia protested, I knew they were glad to be on the outside of the home and not inside. Who wanted to hang out inside a house where someone had just been violently murdered? I guess I needed to raise my hand to that one. Axel arrived a few minutes later. He didn't exactly look happy, but he wasn't scowling either, so I figured the situation was a win for me. Do an alarm spell if anyone approaches. Axel instructed Amelia and Cordelia. Focus it on Pepper. It'll be easier to contact her since she's your blood relative. Confusion cut across Amelia's face. Have we ever done an alarm spell before? Good grief, of course we have, Cordelia said. It's simple. Sometimes it's called an alert spell. Oh, okay, Amelia said. Just checking. Cordelia rolled her eyes. Y'all go on. We'll warn you if someone's approaching. Axel and I headed around back. He held the doorknob with one hand and pressed the other flat against the door itself. Let's see if this baby will open up. Click. I smiled. Looks like you've got it. That was the easy part. His gaze swept to the top of the door. The hard part is knowing if he has a witch security system. I grimaced. I hope not. He pulled a pouch from his pocket and sprinkled some powder across the threshold. Axel slowly opened the door, dropping more powder as he went. There. He pointed to a small glowing symbol. It was a six-pointed star inside a circle. It sat directly where someone's unsuspecting foot might step. Avoid that, Axel said. For someone who claims to be so innocent, it sure does seem like he's hiding something. I stepped inside. Axel swept a hand across his chest, and the door closed. Oh, I love it when you work magic. He hitched a brow. I'll have to do it more often. The house was dark and still. So still, eerily still. Axel opened his palm and an orb of light burned in the center. Shadows flickered on the walls. I shivered. The whole house was creepy. Strange, right? It had been bright and cheery only a few nights ago, but now I was so creeped out it felt like slime coated my skin. Where should we go? I whispered. The basement. Seriously? You sure Cookie wasn't working magic in her bedroom? Axel chuckled. The best magic is always worked in a basement. Figures. A slight tinkling sound came from the hallway. A moment later, Arsenal bounded up to us. He jumped on Axel's legs. Hey there, boy. Axel gave his ears a good scratch. The dog finished greeting him and then sniffed my hand. Hey, little guy. How's mean old Ellis treating you? No answer. I frowned. Still doesn't talk, Axel said. Nope, not one word. I tapped my foot as I considered the dog's plight. Is that normal? I mean, really? Is it normal that an animal doesn't talk? Maybe he's mute, or possibly deaf. He's not deaf. He heard us enter. Axel pressed both hands against a door that probably led to the dungeon, I mean, basement. Yes, you can speak to animals, but remember one of the first ones you met here, the cat, Sprinkles? She didn't talk. She was traumatized. Arsenal's cold, wet nose pressed against my palm, encouraging me to pet him. This guy isn't traumatized. He simply doesn't talk. Axel tilted his ear toward the door. Like I said, maybe he's mute, or maybe he doesn't have anything interesting to say. He paused and then murmured, Now, oh, what sort of spell is on this? Hopefully one you can't break. Very funny. I'm going to remind you that you're the one who wanted to come. We need to search for clues on the weather spell we're under. Cookie Mobley has all the answers. I rolled my eyes. I never said she had all the answers. You pretty much did. 
I scratched Arsenal behind the ears. I bet this little guy has plenty of interesting things to say. Do you know who killed Cookie? The dog looked at me, and I swear in his eyes there was something. The truth of what had happened to Cookie lay deep in those dark irises. If only it would come out. Axel turned the knob and the door cracked open. We have access. Great. To a creepy, scary basement that might eat me. Axel smiled smugly. Don't worry. I'm a powerful wizard, and I'll protect you. I giggled and swatted him playfully. Come on. Let's go down there and save Christmas. Yes, Mrs. Claus. The basement, it turned out, was like every other basement I'd ever been in, even those that weren't magical. It was full of junk and power tools. Why would the Mobleys need a saw? I lifted it and studied the jagged teeth. They're a witch and wizard. They don't need this kind of stuff. Axel shrugged. Could be nostalgic. Nostalgic? Of what? Better days? He frowned. Okay, you got me there. I'm going to agree with you. Why would the Mobleys, who come from a powerful witch family that is so well-connected Mr. Mobley can have prison wraiths drag his wife's killer to the caverns, use power tools? Very strange. I dropped the saw on the table. Have you found anything? Only this. I crossed to where Axel stood by a ring of candles. What's this? A ring of candles. I see that, but there isn't anything in it. No chalk markings or anything. Like, you know, when you see witchcraft performed on TV, there's always drawings in chalk ringed by candles. Axel dropped to his knees and pressed his fingers against the floor. There were markings here. My eyes flared. There were? Let's see what it was. He positioned a hand over the poured concrete floor and muttered words I didn't recognize. The air shifted and hummed as if the room were alive. It took a few seconds, but white markings pushed up from the floor like flowers desperate for sunshine. A series of lines and circles came into view. Hmm. Interesting. What? I peered over his shoulder, trying to figure out what was so neat, but for the life of me couldn't decipher it. These lines here, he said, pointing to a crop of markings, are protection spells. The other ones are spells meant to shield something. I stared at the drawing. I don't understand. We're looking for weather spells. Is that what this is? Not at all. Axel rose. But it looks like whoever created it needed protection, and the fact that it was placed in this home meant they wanted to be safe here. I tucked a loose strand of hair behind an ear. You're saying what? I'm not following. His blue eyes were almost black in the dim light. A dark flash of concern marred Axel's beautiful face. I'm saying that whoever built this spell did so because they were possibly worried about a threat stemming from inside the house. I squinted at the writing again. You mean Cookie could have been worried about Alice? Possibly. He swept his fingers over a line. This mark means protection. The one over there means close by or near, suggesting the home. That's the nearest structure. But that still doesn't help with the weather. We have a real issue with the cold. He squeezed my shoulder. Don't worry. It's not as if we're freezing solid from simply being outside yet. Come on. Looks like we have time to check her bedroom. Okay. Axel snapped his fingers. The markings disappeared. And I followed him back up the stairs. We found Cookie's bedroom easily enough. Holy smokes. Holy smokes is about right, Axel murmured. Cookie's dressing room was amazing. It looked like a witch shop had exploded inside it. Talismans hung from pegs, corked bottles lined shelves, different sized mortars and pestles lined a work table. I whistled. Wow, she really worked some magic. That she did. There isn't a protection spell against the room. Come on in. 
I peered at the vials full of different colored liquids. What exactly are we looking for? This is like searching for a needle in a cotton field. We're looking for a stone. That narrows it down. Axel picked through the shelves. Sorry, I can't be more specific, but this stone will be charged with magic. Care to explain? He spoke while he searched. In order to forge magic on the scale that affects the weather, the spell must be tied to an object, most likely something natural. A stone is the most obvious choice. I closed a wooden box filled with nail clippings. Gross. Why? Because a stone is an earth element. The weather is air. They're opposites. I thought water would be the opposite of earth. No, it seems natural, but it isn't. He moved objects and slid bottles out of the way as he explained it. For a weather-shifting spell, the caster would need to ground the energy of the magic somehow. Fire is too unstable to use as a grounding. That's another option. But fire is what you would use to ground if you were working a water spell. Fire and water. Earth and air. That's the matching. So a stone or another earth element is what would tie or bind the spell. That's what we're looking for. The tie. I sifted through a bottle of dried bat swings, another of frog's eyes, and some misty-looking concoction I had no interest in uncorking and sniffing. Probably frog's farts or something hideous like that. What's it look like? I said. You'll know it because the magic should be strong in it. It might hum or buzz. It could simply appear magically strong. You've really narrowed it down. A scowl flashed across his face. Sorry, if magic wasn't exact science, things would be different. But it isn't. It's part improvisation, personal philosophy, and some science. He grinned mischievously. But magic often brings a wild card element to things. So let's look then. If I find something I wonder about, I'll show it to you. We worked in silence for what felt like hours, scouring through Cookie's magic room. Arsenal lay by the door, thumping his tail in happiness every time I glanced over. I haven't found anything, I said. Me neither. I don't know that we've got anything here. But the weather! Worry bubbled in my chest. Maybe it has nothing to do with Cookie. Axel said. But Betty's powers are also broken. Don't you think it's weird that her powers messed up at the same time as the weather? I do. He hesitated. I just think we need to keep looking. My gaze flickered around the room. Let's go to the spot where she died. He tipped his head. His dark shoulder-length hair fell into his face. The spot she died. Want to work some necromancy? I rolled my eyes. You have to have a body to work necromancy. No, I'm not trying to raise the dead. Way to be morbid, Axel. He took my arm. Come on, let's check it out. We reached the spot in the kitchen. Arsenal tagged along, padding quietly beside us. Here. I pointed to a spot in the pantry. That's where she was. That's where the blood was. Your mom was holding the knife. And here is a door. That leads to the basement. I frowned. I didn't notice it that night. Axel knelt and placed a hand over the spot. He closed his eyes. I can still sense the blood. There was a lot of it. His gaze flickered to me. What is it you want to find out? I... I don't know. I just thought that maybe if we could touch the spot, that maybe we'd know more about the spell. In one quick motion, Axel took my hand and plastered it to the floor. A flash of light crossed my brain, and I was gone. I wasn't in the house anymore. I was standing alone on a dark plain. Cookie Mobley was standing in front of me. 20. The plain was like nothing I'd ever seen before. The sky was black, the ground the same. 
The place was temperatureless, void of atmosphere and even air, if I had to guess. I knew how I'd gotten here. The heart fire, the newness of it, and the raw power had brought me to this knuckle or joint in time and space. There was no here, there was no there. I was, in fact, everywhere. Boy, Dr. Seuss didn't have anything on my rhyming abilities. Cookie, I whispered. She was a vision. She was herself, obviously, a woman in her fifties, but she seemed to glow from the inside out. You want to know about the spell, she stated the fact. I crossed slowly to her. After all, Cookie Mobley hadn't exactly been the nicest person on the planet. I didn't know what she might do to me here on this plane of existence. As I grew closer, the shine in her became brighter. It was her soul. I was staring at Cookie Mobley's soul, and she shone. What do you know? Maybe Cookie hadn't been so evil after all. Maybe. Yes, I said. The weather outside, it's dropping, getting colder. Betty's powers are broken. Hmm, she quirked a brow. And the connection. I don't know. Then you're not a very good witch. That pretty much went without saying. Of course I wasn't a very good witch. I hadn't been doing this crap for very long. Wait. What was I talking about? I'd saved the house from the evil candy ribbon. The burning fire in my chest helped, of course, but I'd done it. I'd also scared a prison wraith back to prison. That was pretty cool. Now I stood in front of a very dead Cookie Mobley. Even cooler. How do I stop it? How do I stop the cold? She smiled widely. It was a gentle, kind smile. Shocking. You have to find the stone. I stopped myself from rolling my eyes. That much I've guessed. But where is it? In the easiest place in the world. If it's so easy, why can't I find it? You've already found it. My blood pooled at my feet. What? You've already found it, she repeated, sounding annoyed. My mind raced back to the room. Was it the bottle filled with all the misty stuff? No. Another rock? The black onyx one? No. My jaw tightened. Then I haven't. I don't know what it is. Cookie's chest rose as if she'd inhaled deeply. I always knew that stone would be the death of me. I assumed it. You found the protection spells? I nodded. They were wiped clean that night. When I wasn't looking, they were swiped away as if with a cloth. That was the same night he stopped talking. The same night I was murdered. Break the spell. My head reeled. I don't understand. The night who stopped talking? Find the stone and you'll know it all. I fisted my hand. Why can't you just tell me? I'm here. You're here. You have a chance, Cookie. A moment to tell me who murdered you and how to break this curse. A curse that you cast. I sucked air. You cast this on us. It didn't start until you were murdered. Oh, my God. I'd been so stupid. I raked my fingers through my hair in frustration. She smiled. But you didn't cast these spells to harm us. You did it to help us. You want us to know who murdered you. That's the key. Connect both of those and we'll know who did it. She still smiled. Am I right? Cookie didn't answer. I had to stop myself from shaking her so hard the answer popped out of her mouth. The cold wind blows everywhere but your heart. She spoke slowly as if she wanted me to remember. I focused very hard. If you want to break the spell, use your heart. She stepped closer to me. You are strong, Pepper Dunn. So strong. We weren't friends in life, and I doubt we'll be friends in death. I've helped you as much as I can. Remember, the cold wind blows everywhere but your heart. I repeated it, but didn't understand. 
Please, can't you tell me more? Isn't there more you can say, more that will help me? She shook her head. You've already stayed as long as you can. There's so much more to do. If you remain here too long, you'll never want to leave. Here, there's no pain, no longing, but also no life. You're standing in the midst of death. She placed a finger over her lips. Shh. Death listens. Don't let it hear you. Your power is very tempting to it. I reached for her. Can't you tell me more? She shook her head. Cookie extended a finger. It's time for you to wake up, Pepper. Wake up? There's something you must see. She glanced up into the inky sky. The alarm bell is blaring. I was so confused. I don't understand. She pressed the pad of her finger to the center of my forehead. The alarm bell is blaring. Wake up, Pepper. Wake up. I did, with a gasp. I was on the floor, staring up at Axel's concerned face. We've got to go, he said. All around us, Cordelia's alarm bell was blaring. The alarm? I knew what that meant. Ellis Mobley was on his way. He would find us inside. Worse, he would find me on his pantry floor exactly where Cookie had been murdered. I shook myself off and rose. It was exactly as Cookie had said. The alarm was blaring. It was time to go. 21. Axel dragged me from the floor and toward the back door. Are you okay? I'm fine, fine. I don't know what happened. I rubbed my head. I saw Cookie. He did a double take. We'll talk about it when we're safe. You mean when we've averted Ellis? He flashed me a delicious smile before shoving open the back door. You got it. We spilled onto the backyard. Arsenal had come with us. Of course he had. Trying to avoid this dog was like trying to avoid living my life. Pretty much an impossibility. Moonlight pooled over the lawn. The ground looked white and crisp. I shivered. My teeth chattered. Yes, it's getting worse. The cold, that was. My face burned from the wind. There was no way anyone would be able to last outside for longer than a few minutes at this rate. We needed to get into Axel's car and get away. Axel jerked to a stop. I toppled into his elbow. Ugh! I rubbed my stomach. What is it? Ellis? Axel said. I glanced at what Axel was staring at. A figure stood, facing away. From our vantage point, it looked exactly like Ellis Mobley. Mr. Mobley? I said weakly. The cold was quickly zapping my strength. Had to get inside. Listen, we can explain. Ellis didn't respond. I leaned into Axel's ear. Maybe he can't hear us. Axel lifted a hand. No, it's something else. We crept slowly toward him. Mr. Mobley, I repeated, but no answer. Moonlight washed over him. Ellis wore a thick coat, pants, and a fur hat. He stood with one leg splayed forward like he had been walking but had stopped. I waited for him to turn around, but he didn't. I closed in. Pepper, Axel growled. Wait. I frowned. Why? I stepped around Ellis until I came face to face with him. I gasped. Oh, dear Lord. I extended my hand, but Axel swept in and clutched me to him. Don't touch him. Just leave him. Why? It might be catching. I recoiled and fell back into Axel's embrace. Tears stung my eyes as I gazed at Ellis Mobley. He was frozen. From head to toe, Ellis Mobley stood with a thick coat of ice covering him. Even his clothes sparkled with the glittery stuff. But what happened? I said. Two possibilities, Axel whispered in my ear. One, it was natural. I really didn't want to hear number two, I really didn't. But I had no choice. Either that, he continued, or someone murdered him. I knew I hadn't wanted to hear number two. 
time to call the cops. By the time Garrick Young arrived, my fingers hurt from the cold. Axel held me close to him. His body heat warmed me everywhere except my toes. Luckily, there was a spell for that. Smoke billowed from Garrick's mouth. So Ellis was out here frozen? Axel nodded. Found him like that. His gaze swept over us. And what were y'all doing out here? Going for a walk, Axel said flatly. In this weather? I nodded. Good for the lungs. Uh-huh. Garrick walked around Ellis. Did you see anyone else out here? Anyone who could have come up behind him and done this? No, Axel said. Garrick nodded. Think he'll thaw out and remember what happened? Wait. But he's frozen. Like, frozen so hard, he's dead. Garrick considered my statement. Maybe. Maybe not. We won't know for sure until we get him someplace warm, like the station. See what's really going on. A team of police officers appeared in vaporous columns of smoke. They surrounded Ellis. Garrick placed a hand on his hip. I'll call y'all if I need anything. He glanced at the sky. Stay warm. A freeze is coming. The police disappeared in plumes of smoke. I tugged on Axel. I didn't see anyone, did you? No. I glanced around nervously, but all that greeted me was a white snowscape of glittering ice. Let's get out of here. Find Cordelia and Amelia, see what set off the alarm. We found my cousins nearby and went home. It was too cold to talk outside. Besides, I was still in minor shock after my conversation with Cookie Mobley. Arsenal came with us, of course. Such a sweet dog. Too bad he didn't talk. Couldn't talk. When we reached the house, Betty whipped up hot cocoa for all of us. Everyone but Axel took some, though he did have a packet of jelly beans in his pocket, so I plopped a few in mine. I sat near the fire, and Arsenal slouched over my feet. When we were all settled, I turned to Cordelia. What made you sound the alarm? I thought I saw Ellis heading toward the house. She shook out her mane of golden hair. I know I did. He parked on the street and then went around back. I don't know why he did that. It seemed weird. I figured he'd just go straight in his house. He didn't park in the garage, Axel said. He didn't phrase it as a question. Strange. Did you see anyone else? I sipped my cocoa. Mmm, it had a hint of peppermint from the jelly beans. Delicious. No one else, Amelia said. At least I didn't. Me neither, Cordelia said. Axel stroked his chin. He leaned against the wall. So either Ellis froze from his walk to the back, which seems unlikely, or he was spelled by someone that nobody saw. Right, Amelia said energetically. I like it. Sounds like a brilliant theory. Cordelia rolled her eyes. Betty stirred her cocoa with a finger. Pepper, what happened to you in there? I blinked. Now how could Betty know something happened? What makes you think anything did? She tapped her nose. Grandmother's intuition, or witch's intuition, both, probably. I cleared my throat because I didn't want them to think I was crazy since nothing like that had ever happened to me before. But as everyone was waiting and staring at me expectantly, it didn't look like I was going to get out of this any time soon. I had a vision. What? Amelia said. A vision? I've got to hear this, Cordelia chimed. About time, Betty said. All good head witches have visions. My gaze snapped to her. It's one thing to talk to animals. I didn't sign up for visions as well. She shrugged as if I had no choice in the matter. If you asked me, there was always a choice. Besides, I didn't attribute that ability to anything other than the fact that I had more power thanks to the heart fire, and that would vanish in a few days anyway. So there you go. No more visions after that. Tell us the vision. Betty said. I sighed. We were at the spot where Cookie had been murdered. Axel placed my hand on the floor. 
and suddenly I was someplace that was covered in black. It was black all around. There wasn't a sky or ground, just darkness. And Cookie, she was there. You know what? She was actually nice, so it made me think that maybe she hadn't been that bad in life. Betty shot me a look that said, Oh, you naive girl. Anyway, I asked her about the cold. I glanced at the windows. A sheet of ice covered the pane. In the silence, I could hear the house shudder against the freezing temperatures. The cold would rip the house apart if we didn't stop it. First, the windows would crack, then the wood would splinter. I shuddered. Cookie said, the cold and your powers, Betty, are connected. She hinted that they're supposed to be a clue to her death. She also said, he stopped talking the night she was murdered. Who? Amelia said. I fingered a lock of hair. I don't know. She also said, the stone that the cold was connected to was right in front of me, and if I wanted to break the cold, I had to use my heart. Then she made me leave, said I couldn't stay there forever. Betty tapped her mouth. So, the cold spell and my powers are connected to a certain stone. Sounds like the stone is what the killer was after. That's what I was thinking. Axel glanced at me. And she said the stone's right in front of you? She said I'd already found it. I said, maybe not right in front of me, but I went over some things in her spell room and she denied it was any of them. Axel frowned. But how are the cold and Betty's powers connected? Maybe they're only connected in the way that Cookie wanted us to know she was murdered. All our gazes swept to Amelia, who shrugged. It makes sense. If Cookie had been poisoned or some other form of death, and no one had suspected she'd been murdered, then the weather and Betty's power breaking still would have happened, right? I nodded. Right? Because Betty's powers don't go wonky, Amelia explained. So that in itself means something is wrong. And the weather? Any of us can control it, but we can't stop this cold. So maybe it's that simple. Maybe it was just that both were simply supposed to let us know that Cookie had been killed. Axel stroked his chin. Sounds simple enough to be brilliant. Cookie didn't say that, I argued. She also didn't tell you how to stop it or who killed her, Cordelia pointed out. Not exactly helpful. Okay, I admitted. So we've got two murders. Cookie, and now Alice, a cryptic message from Cookie, and very little help. We don't know that Alice was actually murdered, Axel said. He was found in his backyard. Who would have had access to him? The neighbors, for one, Amelia said. I took another sip of cocoa. There's no way Brittany Barker froze Alice. Why not, Betty said. The memory came to me quick as lightning. Well, for one... Wait. He did threaten her in front of her children today. Axel rubbed his chin. And she's the one who told us that it seemed that Ellis and Cookie were having money problems. What if she was lying? Cordelia said. What if she only told you that in order to throw you off the scent? What do we actually know about this woman anyway? I chewed the inside of my mouth. She did say her husband taught her children how to magically appear. Her young children? Betty said. That could be dangerous. They could appear anywhere, possibly somewhere miles away. Maybe it's not the mother you need to look at. Maybe it's the father. A knock came from the door. We threw each other confused looks. Who could that be? Betty waddled to the door and threw it open. Garrick Young stood on the porch. Miss Crapel? Sheriff Young. Her gaze zipped from his head to his toes. To what do we owe this honor? Garrick stepped inside. Brr, cold out there. You can thank Cookie Mobley for that. She threw a spell on this town that plunges us into frigid temps. Have no idea how long it's going to last, so we need free reign to do whatever we have to in order to save Christmas. Garrick opened his mouth and shut it. When he opened it again, he said... Fine by me, but that's not why I'm here. Axel, 
Axel quirked a brow. Yes? Looks like Ellis Mobley was spelled. I need you to come down and free him from the case of ice he's trapped in. Axel pushed away from the wall. I'm following you. I grabbed my coat and threw it over my shoulders. Not without me, you're not. 22. Garrick and his men had placed Ellis, who looked more like an ice sculpture than a human, in the very center of the station. Under the harsh fluorescent lights, the statue looked sickly and unearthly, as if someone had sucked all the life from Ellis and spit out what remained, a bluish chunk of flesh. Yes, I know it's gross. It was pretty gross to gaze at, too. Garrick crossed his arms. What it looks like is that, instead of killing him, someone sprinkled old Ellis with a freezing spell. I've seen freezing spells before, and they usually kill. Garrick pointed to a wizard with unusually large ears. But Warren over there is telling me he hears a heartbeat. I do, Warren with the big ears said. The better to hear you with, my dear. I giggled. Everyone glanced at me. I coughed into my hand. Sorry, just had a weird thought. Garrick dragged his gaze from me and back to Ellis. Like I said, I've seen lots of freezing spells, and the one thing they usually do, he knocked on the ice with his fist, is kill a person. But apparently good old Ellis isn't dead. Is he in a coma? I said. Axel nodded. Sort of. More like hibernation, if I had to guess. The ice glittered under the light. I studied the immobile Ellis. But why would someone do that? Garrick, you said yourself freeze spells were meant to freeze a person, not put them to sleep. Garrick scratched the stubble on his cheek. Could be weak magic. Could be a warning to Ellis. He grinned. We won't know which until we wake him up. He pointed to Axel. That's where you come in. You and Betty are about the only folks I figure know how to work a reversal spell, the likes of what I need. And Betty has mentioned to me every time I've run into her in the past few days, her power is off so she can't help. That leaves you, Rain. Axel scratched his head. It's been a while since I've worked the reversal spell. Garrick patted him on the back. I know you can do it. There's a lot riding on this. I know I don't have to go into details about it. There was. I'm sure it had gotten around town that Karen had been singled out by the prison wraith, only to be sent back to the caverns by me. If Axel could wake Ellis, and Ellis fingered someone else, that meant Karen should be off the hook. Should be. If it came down to it, I'd fight tooth and nail to make sure that's the way it went. Axel pressed his hands to the ice. He closed his eyes. He's alive. I don't know why I didn't sense it earlier when we found him. I should have. Could have gotten him out sooner. Well, when you run around people's houses and find them outside frozen in ice, you're probably a little distracted. My eyes flared at Garrick Young. The knowing smirk carved on his face said it all. He knew. He knew what we'd been doing but hadn't said anything about it. Axel chuckled. You're right, old friend. I was distracted. He opened his eyes and relaxed his hands. Unfortunately, the easy part was sensing him inside. The hard part is going to be breaking him out. Why's that? I said. Protection spell. I frowned. Why would there be a protection spell on the ice? What's being protected? Ellis, Axel said. Whoever encased him wanted to make sure Ellis was alive. Now, is he supposed to remain stuck for a thousand years like Sleeping Beauty? I have no idea, but what I do know is that it's going to be tricky to work around. You can do it, Garrick said confidently. Axel studied the ice. He walked around it, stopped, came back the opposite way. Finally, he raked his dark hair from his face. With his blue eyes burning brightly, he crossed to me. You're going to help me with this, Pepper. How? With the fire. The what? I don't have any matches on me. I opened my purse. Wait, let me look. Maybe I stuck a lighter in here or something. Axel rested his hands on my shoulders. That's not what I'm talking about. 
The kind of fire, I mean, is the one still burning in you. Oh, the heart fire. I laughed. Silly me, how could I forget that? I stared at Alice, wondering if I would burn him up if I used the power improperly. I glanced nervously at Axel. You're going to help me, right? His lips curled into a smile. I'll be right beside you. Okay, then, I'll help. Axel took my hand and led me to Ellis. Place your palms on his back and just think warm thoughts. I slumped. You're kidding. Warm thoughts? He grinned. Exactly. Think about keeping him warm. About warming him up. And just focus on those coals burning inside of you. What are you going to be doing? I will be directing your power through him, making sure the heat is at the appropriate level, and we're actually breaking through but not hurting him. Okay. He nodded. You ready? No, I would never be ready for this. I guess so. Axel glanced over his shoulder. The rest of you need to stand back. Not sure how this is going to go. At the worst, we'll explode. That wasn't good. Maybe I should back out. Axel, go, he commanded. The sharpness in his tone took me by surprise. I felt like he'd cracked a whip above my head. I dug deep and summoned the fire quickly. Heat roasted from under my palms, dissipating over the ice. I watched Axel. His hands were placed on Ellis's shoulders. Normally, I would expect his hands to glow, but they didn't. Instead, strange symbols peered out from beneath his palms. Circles and triangles, stars and markings I'd never seen filtered out from him. It was strange. I'd seen him cast fire and light from his palms, but never riding. It was pretty cool. Axel's eyes were shut tightly. Sweat sprinkled his brow. I realized sweat trickled down my spine, pooling at the apex of my tush. This was the easiest magic I'd ever worked, y'all. Not kidding. Seriously, I was simply the conduit for the fire. Axel was the one doing all the work. Then it started to happen. The ice dripped onto the floor. Rivulets ran over the tile. Pieces of Ellis's clothing cut through the encasement. He was slowly melting. Ease up, Pepper. Axel said it without even looking at me. I did. I slowed the fire as the melting picked up speed. Within a minute or two, most of Ellis was free. The white sheen on his face was quickly replaced with a more healthy color. I focused on drying his clothes. Who wanted to wake up wearing sopping wet clothing? If the ice hadn't killed Ellis, the pneumonia that would set in might... The police station door opened. Karen and Roger swept in. They took one look at Axel and appeared relieved. They whispered to each other and Karen clutched Roger's shirt. Alice slowly came to. I pulled my hands away, figuring I'd done my part. I walked over to greet Axel's parents. How are y'all? I said. Pepper, we were so worried. Karen grabbed my hands. We knew Axel wasn't home, and I was terrified he'd gone out in this weather. She spied Ellis as the last of the ice dripped away. From the looks of it, I had reason to be worried. Someone attacked him, I said. Oh, no. She clutched me tighter. You've got to be so careful, especially after what you did today, protecting me. You can't do that, Pepper. Roger's mouth turned down. Karen's right. We're grateful to you for stopping the prison wraith, but doing that sort of thing can be dangerous. Alice? Garrick's voice sliced through our conversation. How are you? Do you remember anything? Alice rubbed his head and moaned. Oh, what an ache. It feels like I ate a huge scoop of ice cream. Freeze headache, Axel said. That can happen after what you've just experienced. Take it slowly. Alice blinked. His gaze bobbed around the room, eventually settling on Garrick. What am I doing here? You were found behind your house, frozen solid. Garrick pointed to the puddle on the floor. Luckily, 
You'd been spelled with protection so you didn't die. Garrick said it lightly, but with a hint of accusation. I mean, why would anyone freeze Ellis Mobley, who was second in nastiness to Cookie Mobley, and throw a protection spell on him? It didn't make sense. If someone had killed Cookie, it only made sense that they would kill Ellis, too. At least that's what I would do. If I was a killer, I mean. I would make sure Ellis was dead. No spell of protection within a familiar's blink of an eye. Why would I want him protected if I wanted him dead? Unless, of course, it was a warning. That at least made more sense than freezing him and accidentally saving his life in the process. Garrick handed Ellis a cup of coffee. What do you remember? The last memories you had. Ellis took the coffee and thanked Garrick. Shocker. This was a man who threatened children and me and my family over his dog. His dog? Listen, buddy, if the dog liked you, it would have stayed with you. I remember, Ellis croaked. Forgive me, my voice is raw. The effects of the spell, Axel explained. It can take a few hours to recover from freezing magic. His gaze flickered to Garrick. You might want to give him a few minutes before you ask him questions. His memory might grow stronger the farther away from the freeze he is. Ellis extended a hand in protest. No, no. I can remember. I had a ride home. It was so cold I went around back to make sure I'd covered the water spigots. Don't want them freezing, you know. I got back there and someone surprised me. Ellis took a long sip of coffee. He shivered. A person surprised me, and the next thing I know I'm here, standing with you in a police station. He quirked a brow to Garrick. You say I was frozen, huh? Someone worked a freezer on me, did they? Probably the same person who's tinkered with our weather. Actually, the person who tinkered with our weather was your late wife, I said. Alice scowled. And how would you know that? Great. He had me there. How stupid of me to open my mouth. What was I going to say? I broke into your house and placed my hand where she died. That's when I had the vision and she told me. Nope, that wasn't going to happen. I went with the best bluff I had. Are you kidding? This weather spell has her magical handprints all over it. It's obvious. Hmm, was all the response I got from Alice. Well, at least he didn't deny it. Do you know who did it? Ellis, Garrick prodded. The person who froze you? Ellis pressed his fingers to his forehead. There was a figure. His gaze swept over the room. It was... It was... There! He pointed his finger in Karen and Roger's direction. It was her. I remember that hair. All that long hair. It was the last thing I saw before I ended up here. Ellis stiffened. He kept his finger locked on Karen. She's the one who did it. The one who froze me. She killed Cookie, too. He turned to Garrick. I demand you arrest her. Right now, Sheriff Young. On charges of murder and attempted murder. 23. I at least have to question her, Axel. Garrick, Axel, and I stood in Garrick's office. Axel had his massive arms crossed while Garrick sat behind his desk, feet propped on the wood. She already told you she was outside looking for me. You know as well as I, hardly anyone's outside. Garrick lifted a sapphire paperweight and turned it in his hand. It doesn't look good. She was looking for Axel, I argued. She told me that herself. Besides, I pointed at Garrick. You told Ellis it was strange. Someone had placed a protection spell on him along with the freeze spell. You know what I think. What's that? Garrick said. I think you believe that Ellis spelled himself. Garrick stopped tilting the paperweight and glanced at me. Now why would I think that? The tone you took with Ellis hinted at it. I slapped my thigh in frustration. You've got Mr. Horrible Personality out there accusing a visitor in town of murder and attempted murder. It doesn't make sense. 
Everyone knows Karen was found over Cookie's body, he said. So what? She decides to threaten Ellis by freezing him halfway? Threaten him how? The prison wraiths already came after her once. If she was smart, she'd be fleeing this place, not waiting around and trusting justice to prevail. Because what justice is there? Wraiths that decide who goes to jail when, without even a trial? That isn't justice. You know that as well as I do, Garrick. I took a breath. There's something suspicious about Ellis Mobley. Everyone knows it's always the closest kin that kills a loved one, so why isn't he in jail? He didn't have a motive, Pepper, Garrick said darkly. Money. That's what the neighbor woman, Brittany Barker, said. She heard them arguing about money. Garrick shook his head. Why am I discussing this with you? You're not a police officer. This isn't your case. It's not even your business. But she has excellent points, Axel said. My mom didn't do it. She's being railroaded by Ellis. He still has pull with the prison system. He could have told the wraiths to go after her. You and I know once they sink their claws in the guilty, the case is shut. It's never reopened. Axel pressed his fists onto Garrick's desk. They'll come after her again. If they take my mom, there's no telling what they will do to me and then to this town. She's innocent, Garrick. Are you threatening me, Rain? Axel's jaw clenched. Nope, just stating fact. Fact. My mom is innocent, but an easy target because she's visiting a new witch in town, Garrick. New witches aren't always welcome, especially when their sons are werewolves. Garrick studied Axel for a long moment before pulling his legs from the desk. I'll keep her for show. How's that? If it's really only for show. But my suggestion would be to talk to Ellis, put some pressure on him. It's like Pepper said, why would someone freeze him with a protection spell? Garrick yanked his hat off and raked his fingers through his hair. I don't know, but I plan to find out. We left the police station. I was exhausted and annoyed that we had fewer answers than when we'd started. Axel steered the rover toward my house. Ellis has it in for my mom. It sure seems like it. I patted his shoulder. They won't convict her of this. For one thing, I'm not convinced Ellis is innocent. Even if he didn't kill Cookie, there's something deeply suspicious about him being frozen. I turned to him. Cookie said I had seen the stone. Axel, it must be back in that house. We've got to get it. I nibbled my bottom lip. Of course, I don't know what I'm going to do when I find it, but I'll figure that out. Can't be too hard. Axel sighed. He pressed back into the seat. So I've got a question totally off topic. Yes? What are you doing Christmas night? I blanched. Not getting a present from you, I almost said. But I bit my tongue nearly hard enough to draw blood, so I wouldn't say that. I don't know why. Well, we can head over to the wishing hat and see if it granted your wish. I smiled so wide my face hurt. Sounds about perfect. I'd love to. Great. He quirked a brow. It's a date. But before then, we've got to sneak back into Ellis's house and go through Cookie's magical room again. His expression darkened. No. Why not? Axel, I know it's there. I know that stone has to be there somewhere. We just have to look harder. We almost got caught tonight. Besides, with the freezing, Ellis is going to be on high alert. No way. Fine, I said, but that isn't what I meant. I was getting back in that house, one way or another. The next morning I awoke to Amelia standing over my bed. Wake up, sleepyhead. I wiped sleep from my eyes. Why? What is it? It's Christmas Eve. It's a great day. We've got so much to do. I sat up, groggy and bleary-eyed. I could have slept for a thousand more years. Seriously, easily a thousand. I yawned and stretched. What do we have to do? 
First of all, we have to bake for Christmas and get the evening dinner ready. Then tonight, there's the town singing Christmas carols. It's so much fun. Everyone gets together and we sing and it's joyous. We love it. Okay. Let me get myself together. Turned out, Christmas Eve luncheon was a big deal in the Crapel household. Betty chopped and baked, sliced and diced, while the rest of us took orders. She slid a cutting board full of diced celery into a pan. How's the heart fire treating you? I swiped a line of sweat from my forehead. Fine. I guess I don't understand what the big deal is. I don't know why the fire has to have a vessel in order for the town to stay magical. Betty stirred the pot full of hissing chopped veggies. The point is, the fire needs a conduit. That, I told you, if there isn't a conduit, it doesn't have the focus it needs. She frowned. Why? Is there something wrong? It's just... I don't understand why I'm given this big surge in power. What's the point of it? Betty stifled a smile. I pointed a spoon at her. What? What is it? It's nothing. It's not nothing. Whatever it is, you need to tell me. She glanced over her shoulder. Where are you cousins? Doing decorating things. You would think I'd be more worried about my power, wouldn't you? She said. I glanced at the thickening ice on the windows. I would think you'd be more concerned with us becoming the Arctic Circle. She shrugged. I'm worried about it, but I know that we'll get it fixed and soon. She stirred the pan. I'm not worried about my powers or this town because if they don't return, the town will be safe. I turned away from the bowl of mashed potatoes and glared at her. What do you mean? And you'd better not tell me it's because the fire's going to stay inside me. That better not be what you're saying. She grinned devilishly. My voice rose. Betty, I'm serious. I'm not ready for this sort of responsibility. I'm still learning how to use my magic. I can't have the added weight of the heart fire. You've been doing just fine. She threw a dash of salt into the pan. Just fine. You'll discover that as a head witch, things are easier. Axel, me, we have to use potions and chants, but not you. Yeah, I know, I know all this. What are you saying? Betty lowered her voice. I'm saying... The heart fire only enters strong witches. Whether you like it or not, you're a strong witch, Pepper. She returned to stirring before adding, time to get used to it. Well, I will get used to it, I suppose. It was the only rebuttal, though limp and shabby, I could think of. After that, the conversation stalled, but her words about the fire filled my head. The heart fire had to have someone as a conduit in order to work. I thought about what Axel had said about the weather spell, how it was difficult magic. I wondered something similar. Betty. Hmm. She sipped a spoonful of vegetables. Yes. The weather spell is strong magic. But that would mean the spell that's screwing up your powers would be the same way, right? A big, powerful spell. Right, she said. I'm only thinking. I have no idea if this is right or even close to it, but I'm wondering. Axel said that spell would be housed in a stone because it would need to be grounded. Cookie herself admitted it would need to be in one. Yes, that makes sense, kid. What if that stone was like the heart stone and needed to be attached to someone in order to work? Because it's so strong, is that a possibility? She shrugged. I suppose so. I picked up a hazelnut from a bowl and popped it in my mouth. It made sense. Cookie said I had seen the stone and I've been convinced it's in the house. I was going back there tonight because I knew I needed one more chance to find it, but now I'm thinking I was wrong. Betty tapped the spoon on the pan. What do you mean? I pressed my fingers to the sides of my nose. She said I'd seen the stone before. If that stone is connected to another creature because it needs a conduit, then I have. She also said the night she died is the night he stopped talking. 
Ellis talks. He talks a lot and manages to say most of the wrong things, so I don't think the stone is tied to him. There's no way. Betty waddled over to the fridge and pulled out a carton of milk. Magic that works with the elements is incredibly strong. Since the spell took hold after her death, we know it isn't Cookie who's grounding it. Right. I pointed at Betty. That's exactly right. I know it isn't Ellis because he talks and he's already suspicious. For goodness sake, I'm convinced he placed a freezing spell on himself to make Karen look even more guilty. I smiled at Betty. So, who was the other man in Cookie's life? She scratched her chin. You got me there, kid. If my magic was at 100%, I'd probably have an answer for you, but since I don't, I'm dry, all out of answers. The one being Cookie loved is Arsenal. The dog? Think about it. He doesn't speak. I've thought it was strange since he first showed up at the house. It seems like he should be able to unless he's mute which is totally a possibility. But then, there's that strange collar he has. I'd never seen anything like it. Neither had Amelia. It's blue and hums. Betty gasped. It's a stone. Exactly. It's the stone grounding both spells, the one screwing with your magic and the one keeping us in a deep freeze. All we have to do is get the collar off him and Arsenal may be able to tell us how to break both spells. Betty clapped her hands with glee. She swayed her hips, and for a second I thought she was going to break into a jig. No such luck. Come on, kid, let's get that dog. We hustled from the kitchen to the living room, where Amelia and Cordelia were putting the last of the ornaments on the tree. Amelia. Oh, she dropped a glass bulb. Before it could hit the floor, Cordelia nodded to it. The bulb floated back up into Amelia's hand. Thanks, cuz. Call it an early Christmas gift, Cordelia said. Amelia, I repeated, trying to rein in her attention. Yes? Where's Arsenal? Her face crumpled. He's gone. My stomach plummeted. Gone? She nodded. Yep, when I woke up this morning, he'd left. The dog's gone. I don't know where. I fisted my hands. I know where. One way or another, Ellis got that dog. I gritted my teeth. We've only got one choice. If we want to save Christmas, we're going to have to steal that dog. 24. There was no way I'd be able to break into Ellis's house during the day. I'd have to wait until nighttime and hope the cold-hearted man joined the rest of the town at the caroling event. Ellis has arsenal, and that dog is wearing the stone that will break the cold spell. I was on the phone with Axel. I was pretty sure I sounded like a mad woman because as soon as he answered, I skipped hello and went straight into spewing the facts. Merry Christmas Eve to you, he said sleepily. Are you asleep? Late night. I was working extra protection spells on my mother to keep her safe from the prison wraiths. What a good son he was. And he was mine, all mine. Well, maybe not all mine. I didn't need to get all weird as if I owned him. Okay, it's good you did that. But we've got to get Arsenal back from Ellis. That dog is wearing the stone around his neck. I heard a shuffle. It sounded like Axel was getting out of bed. You're sure? Positive. Cookie said I'd seen the stone before, and then I thought about it and figured the stone would need to be connected to someone or something in order to work such powerful magic. The stone on Arsenal's collar is magical. I can tell. It's the dog. We need him. And he's with Ellis? Has to be. He's not here. Let me get dressed and call Garrick. He might be able to help. I exhaled a shot of air. Oh, let's hope so. That could save us. Literally, Axel said, from freezing to death, it's sub-zero outside. I shivered. Better hurry. We hung up. I trotted downstairs to finish helping with the decorations. The house was trimmed by hand within a couple of hours, and it smelled like absolute heaven. If I died right then, I would have drifted off with the best smells on earth filtering into my nose. I took Hugo on a very short walk after. 
It was so cold, neither of us could stand to be outside for too long. By the time we returned, the windows were completely covered in ice, and poor Jenny the guard vine hung limply around the porch. I patted her buds. We'll get this figured out soon enough, Jenny. Don't worry. Hugo and I went back inside. The fire was roaring, and the food was about ready for the Christmas Eve meal. The sun was also beginning to set, and I had yet to hear from Axel. What are we going to do about the caroling? I said. It's colder than a witch's... Well, you know, it's colder than that outside. I hear they're going to build a big bonfire, Amelia said. That should help some, Cordelia said. Betty's phone pinged. She shuffled over to it and glanced at the message. The mayor says the fire isn't staying lit. It's the cold. That's no good, I said. We need everyone out there, because I need to make sure Ellis is not in his house so I can steal Arsenal. I'll be right back. I returned to my room and called Axel. What's going on with the dog hunt? It's a no-go, Axel said. I haven't been able to reach Garrick. I'm guessing he's too busy with the investigation. And nibbled my bottom lip. We need to get everyone together so we can get Arsenal away from Ellis. The bonfire won't light. And there won't be any caroling. If Ellis thinks Arsenal is as important as you think, he won't let the dog out of his sight. But everyone goes to the caroling, right? Right. It's the Magnolia Cove and witch tradition. They'll be there. If the mayor can't keep the fire lit, I can try to help. But I don't know how much I'll be able to add. He's pretty powerful. I tap my temple. There had to be a way. If there was a will, there's a way. It hit me like a bolt of lightning. <gasps> I've got it. What? Just meet us down there, okay? Meet us at the caroling bonfire. I hung up before he could utter even an inch of protest. I ran downstairs. I know exactly how we can get a bonfire going for the caroling tonight. How? Betty said. Yeah, how? Amelia added. I pointed to the fireplace. We take the heart. All three women gasped. Absolutely not, Betty said. We have no choice, I argued. Betty planted herself in front of the fire, blocking me from it. The heart is the most sacred fire in this town. We can't use it to keep a few people's toes warm and toasty for some caroling. We have to. I said, we have to use this fire for the town. The caroling isn't about us. It was actually about me dividing Ellis from Arsenal. That's what it was about. What if something happens to it? Amelia said. Then we wouldn't have a town. We wouldn't have Magnolia Cove. It's safe here, Betty said. But we're not safe, I argued. Cordelia. I turned my focus on her. I needed someone on my side. What do you think, cousin? We're not safe from the cold. We need to keep the townspeople safe. The fire can do that. She shrugged. How will you transport it? In my hands, I said. Betty gasped. You're going to simply carry the heart fire through town? Of course. Listen, the heart fire is our key to getting out of this mess. I know it is. Do any of you trust me? Silence surrounded me. I need someone to trust me here. I wouldn't do it if I didn't believe in what we had to do. The town needs the heart fire, not just us. Betty glared at me. This isn't tradition, kid. I'm not exactly a traditional witch. Don't forget, I only just discovered what I am. She's got a point, Cordelia said. Since Pepper hasn't studied magic the way we did, she thinks about it differently, comes up with solutions we wouldn't think of. Those solutions aren't always right, Betty snapped. You might be putting us at risk by taking the heart. We're already at risk. I need Ellis to be part of the caroling. I need Arsenal because that dog is wearing the stone that could stop all of this. Please, I begged. Betty's lips stiffened. She moved away from the hearth and pointed to it. Why don't you ask the heart yourself? See what it wants to do. I folded my arms. Is that a joke? She shook her head. Absolutely not. Ask. 
I raised my chin and strode up to the fire. I cleared my throat. Hmm. Mr. Hartfire, would you please let me carry you into town so we can save Magnolia Cove? The face appeared in the flames. No. I nearly tumbled into it. No? Is that it? That's your answer? Yes. He said in a deep, throaty, incredibly masculine voice. No, I will not go. Think, Pepper. Fine. If you don't go, you can stay here. And then the freezing cold will ruin Magnolia Cove. We'll all freeze to death, and so will you. Shards of ice will eventually take you, and there won't be anyone left to be your conduit so that you can blaze freely. You will die. Alone. I added alone just to be spiteful. Suddenly the fire perked up. I will go. Take me. Take me right now, and I will heat the town. I smiled. My pleasure. Twenty-five. The entire town ringed the heart fire. The blaze was hot, keeping the nasty cold at bay. Folks were overjoyed to be able to stand in front of the town Christmas tree and sing carols. The heart fire, for what it was worth, seemed to enjoy it as well. Where's Ellis? Axel stood beside me. He just belted out, Oh, Holy Night, beautifully, and we were waiting for the next song to start up. I don't know. He's got to be here. I searched the crowd. There. Sure enough, Ellis Mobley stood at an outer ring, looking angry and spiteful as ever. Wonder if he's got the dog, Axel said. Why don't we go over and see? If not, you keep him talking while I search out Arsenal. He nodded stiffly. Sounds like a plan. You okay? Just cold. We made our way over as the town sang Away in the Manger. By the time we reached Ellis, the song was halfway over. I don't see the dog, I said. Ellis spied us. He opened his mouth and I pushed Axel toward him. Keep Ellis busy. No, Pepper. Axel protested, but I'd already walked away from the crowd, figuring that Arsenal was back at the house. I glanced over my shoulder. Axel had stayed behind and diverted Ellis's attention. Good boyfriend. I stalked into the darkness. Whimpering caught my attention. Hey there, little guy. What are you doing here? Leashed to a pole sat Arsenal. His tail swept the snow when he saw me. Let's get you out of that. I untied the leash and patted his head. My fingers moved down his collar until I found the stone. The blue blazed like a diamond. So this is it, the stone that's caused so much chaos. What's so important about it? I snapped it off the collar and rose. Not so fast. I whipped around. Ellis! Ellis Mobley's mouth split into a sinister grin. Just what do you think you're doing? What had happened to Axel? He was supposed to keep Ellis busy. You think your little friend could keep me? when the prison wraiths are on their way to take his mother. What? He sneered. I see you found the stone. I could never find it. Cookie had spelled it so that I wouldn't be able to see where she'd hidden it. But in your hands, I can see it quite clearly. I gripped it tightly. You can't have it. I need the stone to break the weather spell Cookie cast on us. He threw his head back and cackled. You think that stone will simply break a weather curse? Is that what you think? Well, I did until you said that. He shook his head and tisked. That stone is so much more than that. It can change the weather anywhere. With it, I will be rich. Rich. Can you imagine this stone in the hands of the government? They will pay handsomely for it. But Cookie, he spat, Cookie would never give it to me. She hid it. Finally, I couldn't take it any more. So the night of the house showing, you sneaked to the basement, erased the protection spell, and then snuck up to the pantry while everyone was on the hunt. You murdered your wife, I finished. Oh, I did. I've never been a powerful wizard. 
Hence the power tools, I realized. So you erased Cookie's protection spell when she was busy and the house was full of people. It was a coincidence that the Karen woman showed up. It was perfect, really. A scream split the air. I jerked back. Alice sneered. Like I said, the prison wraiths are here for Karen. Once they take her, it will all be over. I'll be free to do what I want. You will be dead, frozen to death, of course, along with Arsenal. Can't have him telling anyone, now can we? I glanced at Arsenal. A single word popped in my head. Wraiths. Yes, the dog had finally spoken. It didn't seem that he was afraid of the wraiths. It seemed to be a different message, one meant for me and only me. I focused on the bit of heart flaming inside me. Prison wraiths, I screamed. Here, here stands the guilty. Alice scoffed. You think you can call them? You think you can make the wraiths come when I've already set them on the guilty party? Well, I actually didn't know, but I hoped so. It wasn't until a shadow smeared the sky that I was certain. I would say yes. The smug smile on Ellis's face vanished. He glanced behind him. What? No. No, it can't be. Ellis turned as the black cloud fell toward him. No, it isn't me. It's the woman, I told you. The prison wraith spoke. It was screeching and hard sounding. We hear. We saw your heart. You are guilty. No, Alice screamed. No. But it was too late. The shadowy prison wraith wrapped itself around Alice and sucked him into the darkness. I held my breath. Being that close to the wraith made me feel like I was touching death. It was a horrible feeling, full of hopelessness and loss. I bowed back as Axel lit the darkness. He was like a beacon of light slicing through the black. Pepper. He wrapped his arms around me. What happened? Ellis admitted he killed Cookie. I called the wraith to him, and it took him away. Your mom? He brushed a loose strand of hair from my cheek. Fine. She's fine. I thought it would take her, but then it left. He smiled weakly. To come here? Yes. We hugged each other. I lost myself in him, but then remembered. The stone. I have it. He took it from me. This is it? Wow. Do you know how to break it? My gaze drifted out to the heart fire and the scattered townsfolk surrounding it. I nodded. Yes. I know exactly how to break the spell. 26. I threw the stone into the heart fire. It cracked open and kicked the cold temperatures out on their butt before anyone in Magnolia Cove ended up freezing to death. You could say I saved Christmas, but it wasn't me. It was the heart fire. Cookie had given me the right clue all along. Use the heart, she'd said, and she'd been right. By the time I awoke Christmas morning, the cold had retreated, Ellis was in prison, and Karen was safe. All in all, I deemed it a perfect holiday. I tromped downstairs with Hugo at my heels. Merry Christmas, I announced. My cousins and grandmother were already sitting by the fire, sipping hot cocoa and coffee. I poured myself coffee from the pot and settled down with them. Hugo curled at my feet and Maddie padded down the stairs. Merry Christmas, she said. Merry Christmas, we shot back. I smacked my lips. Who's ready to open presents? Before we do that, Betty said, I wanted to tell you how very proud I am. I swiped away a slash of bangs that had covered one eye. You are? I am. We all are. You found the killer and broke the spell Cookie had placed on the town. I grinned widely. Are you so proud of me that you'd like to take the piece of heart fire back? She cackled. If I must, then I'll do it. Yes, you must. The heart fire isn't mine. This is yours to keep safe. I shook my head. I'm not ready for so much responsibility. 
Betty rose and placed a hand on my forehead. Exhale and release the fire. Magic stirred in my core. On an exhale, I felt the fire shoot from me. I blinked my eyes open in time to watch the fire settle back with its other half in the hearth. Well, that was nice, I said. Glad to be rid of it. And I'm glad your powers aren't broken anymore. I wrapped my arms around her. We can't do with a broken Betty Crapel. Thank you. She knuckled a tear from her eye. Now, Amelia said energetically, let's open presents. We spent an hour opening gifts and eating breakfast. The rest of the day was for playing with the new magical things we received. From Betty and my cousins, I received my first potion-making kit. It had everything I would need to make the perfect potion. Thanks, I said. You're going to need that, Cordelia said. Why? Oh, because the first of the year is always a big deal when it comes to potions. Amelia smoothed her spiky hair. You know how regular people make New Year's resolutions? Well, here we make New Year's potions. Sorry? It's a competition, Betty said. The person who makes the best and most creative potion gets a prize. Cool, I said, inspecting the box to see what it contained. Thanks. Amelia clapped her hands. Who's going to the wishing snowman tonight? I am. I said, are you? Of course, I made a wish, Amelia said. I want to see if it's granted. I caught Betty's glance. Amelia made a wish. Would that wish cause her possibly latent genie powers to come forward? There was no way to know except to watch and see. I spent the rest of the day working on my potion-making kit and relaxing. By the time I met up with Axel that evening, I was ready to give him his gift. Axel, Roger, and Karen arrived for a true Christmas feast that Betty had put together with magic, thankfully. Not that I minded cooking, but sometimes I just wanted to relax. Karen gave me a huge hug. It's been wonderful meeting you. Same here. I gave her a squeeze. Her eyes shone. For the first time, I realized they were Axel's eyes. My son is lucky to have such a brave young woman beside him. You saved me. Thank you. It was nothing. I mean, what was I supposed to say? It means the world to us. She gave me another hug and we sat down to eat. Since the temperature had finally shifted to bearable, Axel and I took a walk after dinner to help the food move through our systems better. It's a beautiful Christmas evening, I said. Not as beautiful as you. He said, I nudged him with my shoulder. You're so sweet. Has nothing to do with it. I speak the truth, woman. I laughed. Thanks. We walked in silence for a few minutes. Listen, I know you said you weren't getting me anything, but I got you a gift. You shouldn't have. I handed him the cuffs wrapped in bright red paper. Yeah, well, just because you think it's stupid for us to exchange gifts doesn't mean I do. Thank you. Axel smiled. You didn't have to. I know. Anyway, open it. He unwrapped the package and revealed the arm cuffs. The symbols to connect with animals. I smirked. I got a pair, too. To see if we can connect when you're a werewolf. Pepper, he warned. Then Axel changed. His face cracked into a smile, and love bloomed in my heart. I love them. Thank you. He kissed me lightly. You're welcome. I hope they work. Axel stowed them in his pocket. Me too. Come on, isn't it almost time for the wishes to be revealed? I started to walk toward the park. Not quite. I've got something for you. I whirled around. Are you kidding? He shook his head. You're the one who said no presents. He rocked back on his heels. Did you really think I wasn't going to get you anything? Yes. If I didn't get you, my girlfriend, something for Christmas, I would have expected you to break up with me. I almost did. I snapped. Stopped. Not really, but I was pretty ticked. He laughed. I know. It was so funny. He must have seen the dark look on my face because his face sobered. 
Pepper, did you really think I wasn't going to get you anything? Yes, I whimpered. You were wrong. He hooked a finger under my chin and tipped my face to meet his. So very wrong. I felt something slip into my palm. I glanced down and saw a velvet box. Open it. The lid top sprang back. Inside lay a gold locket. What's this? Axel pulled it out and secured it behind my neck. It's a charm locket, meant for protection. It's been in my family for years. I fingered the gold. And you're giving it to me? His lips brushed mine. You need protecting. Pretty sure tonight proves it. It was gorgeous, and I loved it. I threw my arms around Axel's neck and kissed him. It's beautiful. Thank you. His arms tightened around me. You're welcome. We stared at each other for a moment, and then he released his hold and threaded his fingers through mine. Come on, let's go check out the wishing snowman. I followed him to the center of town, where it appeared that half the population had shown up. We wove through the crowd until we found our families. You ready? I said to Amelia and Cordelia. I didn't wish for anything. Cordelia said. Garrick Young walked up behind her and hugged my cousin close. You got just about everything you need, huh? Cordelia hugged him back. I sure do. Well, I wished for something, Amelia said. Cordelia hitched a brow. What's that? Not telling, Amelia said happily. Not saying one thing. The snowman's black top hat quivered. It lit up, sparkling as if covered by stars. A pop sounded, and a hundred slips of paper sailed up into the sky and slowly fluttered down. They zipped and zoomed through the crowd, stopping when the slip found its recipient and waiting while the person slowly took the paper. More and more papers clipped through the sky, and my heart started to sink as I realized my wish wouldn't be granted. Oh, my gosh! Amelia yelled. It's been granted. My wish. It's been granted. Right then, a slip of paper whizzed by me. It stopped and fluttered back. The paper hovered by my face. Take it, Axel nudged. It's yours. My hands trembled. I plucked the sheet from the air and opened it. Your wish has been granted. Those were the only words written. What did you wish for? Axel said. You can tell me now, since it's been granted. I opened my mouth to explain when a car came to a stop off to the side. Two men stepped out. One was tall and bald, the other tall with a mound of gray hair. They walked up to Amelia and Cordelia. Amelia's eyes widened when she saw them. My wish, it's already been granted. Huh? Cordelia said. The men stopped. The bald one spoke first. Amelia? Cordelia? Yes, Cordelia said suspiciously. Girls, he said, tears pricking his eyes. We're your fathers. We've come to see you. Dad, Amelia yelled happily. What? Cordelia's head snapped to Amelia. Is this what you wished for? Yep, Amelia was so proud. Our dads are here. We can finally get to know them. Girls, the gray-haired one said. How about a hug? From out of nowhere, Mint and Licky appeared. My gaze swept from my aunts to my cousins and then to their genie fathers. The genie power in my cousins might turn to chaos like their mother's magic. It looked like trouble was brewing in Magnolia Cove once again. I turned to Axel. This should be interesting. This has been Southern Magic Christmas, Sweet Tea Witch Mysteries, Book 8, written by Amy Boyles, narrated by Hollis McCarthy. Copyright 2018 by Ladybug Books, LLC. Production Copyright 2023 by Ladybug Books, LLC. Edited by Sean Toole.